section thirty six of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued robert burns seventeen fifty nine seventeen ninety six after a century and more of classicism we noted with interest the work of three men gray goldsmith and cowper whose poetry like the chorus of awakening birds suggests the dawn of another day two other poets of the same age suggest the sunrise the first is the ploughman burns who speaks straight from the heart to the primitive emotions of the race the second is the mystic blake who only half understands his own thoughts and whose words stir a sensitive nature as music does or the moon in mid-heaven rousing in the soul those vague desires and aspirations which ordinarily sleep and which can never be expressed because they have no names blake lived his shy mystic spiritual life in the crowded city and his messages to the few who can understand burns lived his sad toilsome erring life in the open air with the sun and the rain and his songs touch all the world the latter's poetry so far as it has a philosophy rests upon two principles which the classic school never understood that common people are at heart romantic and lovers of the ideal and that simple human emotions furnish the elements of true poetry largely because he follows these two principles burns is probably the greatest songwriter of the world his poetic creed may be summed up in one of his own stanzas give me a spark on nature's fire that's a the learning i desire then though i trudge through dub and mire at plow or cart my muse though hamely in attire may touch the heart life note fitz green halleck's poem to a rose from near alloway kirk eighteen twenty two is a good appreciation of burns and his poetry it might be well to read this poem before the sad story of burns life End of note. burns life is a life of fragments as carlyle called it and the different fragments are as unlike as the noble cotter's saturday night and the rant and riot of the jolly beggars the details of this sad and disjointed life were better perhaps forgotten we call attention only to the facts which help us to understand the man and his poetry burns was born in a clay cottage at alloway scotland in the bleak winter of seventeen fifty nine his father was an excellent type of the scotch peasant of those days a poor honest god-fearing man who toiled from dawn till dark to wrest a living for his family from the stubborn soil his tall figure was bent with unceasing labor his hair was thin and gray and in his eyes was the careworn hunted look of a peasant driven by poverty and unpaid rents from one poor farm to another the family often fasted of necessity and lived in solitude to avoid the temptation of spending their hard-earned money the children went barefoot and bareheaded in all weathers and shared the parents toil and their anxiety over the rents at thirteen bobby the eldest was doing a peasant's full day's labor at sixteen he was chief laborer on his father's farm and he describes the life as the cheerless gloom of a hermit and the unceasing moil of a galley slave in seventeen eighty four the father after a lifetime of toil was saved from a debtor's prison by consumption and death to rescue something from the wreck of the home and to win a poor chance of bread for the family the two older boys set up a claim for arrears of wages that had never been paid with the small sum allowed them they buried their father took another farm mosquil in Mauchlin, and began again the long struggle with poverty such in outline is burns own story of his early life taken mostly from his letters there is another and more pleasing side to the picture of which we have glimpses in his poems and in his commonplace book 
here we see the boy at school for like most scotch peasants his father gave his boys the best education he possibly could we see him following the plough not like a slave but like a free man crooning over an old scotch song and making a better one to match the melody we see him stop the plough to listen to what the wind is saying or turn aside lest he disturb the birds at their singing and nest-making at supper we see the family about the table happy notwithstanding their scant fare each child with a spoon in one hand and a book in the other we hear betty davidson reciting from her great store some heroic ballad that fired the young hearts to enthusiasm and made them forget the day's toil and in the cotter's saturday night we have a glimpse of scotch peasant life that makes us almost reverence these heroic men and women who kept their faith and their self-respect in the face of poverty and whose hearts under their rough exteriors were tender and true as steel a most unfortunate change in burns life began when he left the farm at seventeen and went to kirkoswald to study surveying the town was the haunt of smugglers rough-living hard-drinking men and burns speedily found his way into those scenes of riot and roaring dissipation which were his bane ever afterwards for a little while he studied diligently but one day while taking the altitude of the sun he saw a pretty girl in the neighboring garden and love put trigonometry to flight soon he gave up his work and wandered back to the farm and poverty again when twenty-seven years of age burns first attracted literary attention and in the same moment sprang to the first place in scottish letters in despair over his poverty and personal habits he resolved to emigrate to jamaica and gathered together a few of his early poems hoping to sell them for enough to pay the expenses of his journey the result was the famous kilmarnock edition of burns published in seventeen eighty six for which he was offered twenty pounds it is said that he even bought his ticket and on the night before the ship sailed wrote his farewell to scotland beginning the gloomy night is gathering fast which he intended to be his last song on scottish soil in the morning he changed his mind led partly by some dim foreshadowing of the result of his literary adventure for the little book took all scotland by storm not only scholars and literary men but even ploughboys and maidservants says a contemporary eagerly spent their hard-earned shillings for the new book instead of going to jamaica the young poet hurried to edinburgh to arrange for another edition of his work his journey was a constant ovation and in the capital he was welcomed and feasted by the best of scottish society this unexpected triumph lasted only one winter burns fondness for taverns and riotous living shocked his cultured entertainers and when he returned to edinburgh next winter after a pleasure jaunt through the highlands he received scant attention he left the city in anger and disappointment and went back to the soil where he was more at home the last few years of burns life are a sad tragedy and we pass over them hurriedly he bought the farm ellisland Dumfrieshire and married the faithful jean armour in seventeen eighty eight that he could write of her i see her in the dewy flowers i see her sweet and fair i hear her in the tuneful birds i hear her charm the air there's not a bonny flower that springs by fountain shaw or green there's not a bonny bird that sings but minds me o my jean is enough for us to remember the next year he was appointed excise man i e collector of liquor revenues and the small salary with the return from his poems would have been sufficient to keep his family in modest comfort had he but kept away from taverns for a few years his life of alternate toil and dissipation was occasionally illumined by his splendid lyric genius and he produced many songs bonny doon my love's like a red red rose all lang syne highland mary and the soul-stirring scots what high 
composed while galloping over the moor in a storm which have made the name of burns known wherever the english language is spoken and honored wherever scotchmen gather together he died miserably in seventeen ninety six when only thirty seven years old his last letter was an appeal to a friend for money to stave off the bailiff and one of his last poems a tribute to jesse lures a kind lassie who helped to care for him in his illness this last exquisite lyric o wert thou in the cauld blast set to mendelssohn's music is one of our best-known songs though its history is seldom suspected by those who sing it the poetry of burns the publication of the kilmarnock burns with the title poems chiefly in the scottish dialect seventeen eighty six marks an epoch in the history of english literature like the publication of spencer's shepherd's calendar after a century of cold and formal poetry relieved only by the romanticism of gray and cowper these fresh inspired songs went straight to the heart like the music of returning birds in springtime it was a little volume but a great book and we think of marlowe's line infinite riches in a little room in connection with it such poems as the cotter's saturday night to a mouse to mountain daisy man was made to mourn the twa dogs addressed to the devil and halloween suggest that the whole spirit of the romantic revival is embodied in this obscure ploughman love humor pathos the response to nature all the poetic qualities that touch the human heart are here and the heart was touched as it had not been since the days of elizabeth if the reader will note again the six characteristics of the romantic movement and then read six poems of burns he will see at once how perfectly this one man expresses the new idea or take a single suggestion a fond kiss and then we sever a farewell and then forever deep in heart-wrung tears i'll pledge thee warring sighs and groans i'll wage thee who shall say that fortune grieves him while the star of hope she leaves him me nay chief a twinkle lights me dark despair around benights me i'll ne'er blame my partial fancy nothing could resist my nancy but to see her was to love her love but her and love for ever had we never loved sae kindly had we never loved sae blindly never met or never parted we had ne'er been broken-hearted the essence of a thousand love tales is in that one little song because he embodies the new spirit of romanticism critics give him a high place in the history of our literature and because his songs go straight to the heart he is the poet of common men songs for music of burns many songs for music little need be said they have found their way into the hearts of a whole people and there they speak for themselves they range from the exquisite o oh, wert thou in the cauld blast to the tremendous appeal to scottish patriotism in scots wi he wi wallace bled which carlyle said should be sung with the throat of the whirlwind many of these songs were composed in his best days when following the plough or resting after his work while the music of some old scotch song was ringing in his head it is largely because he thought of music while he composed that so many of his poems have the singing quality suggesting a melody as we read them among his poems of nature to a mouse and to a mountain daisy are unquestionably the best suggesting the poetical possibilities that daily pass unnoticed under our feet these two poems are as near as burns ever comes to appreciating nature for its own sake the majority of his poems like winter and ye banks and braes o bonny doon regard nature in the same way that gray regarded it as a background for the play of human emotions of his poems of emotion there is an immense number it is a curious fact that the world is always laughing and crying at the same moment and we can hardly read a page of burns without finding this natural juxtaposition of smiles and tears 
it is noteworthy also that all strong emotions when expressed naturally lend themselves to poetry and burns more than any other writer has an astonishing faculty of describing his own emotions with vividness and simplicity so that they appeal instantly to our own one cannot read i love my jean for instance without being in love with some idealized woman or to marry in heaven without sharing the personal grief of one who has loved and lost miscellaneous poems besides the songs of nature and of human emotion burns has given us a large number of poems for which no general title can be given noteworthy among these are a man's a man for all that which voices the new romantic estimate of humanity the vision from which we get a strong impression of burns early ideals the epistle to a young friend from which rather than from his satires we learn burns personal views of religion and honor the address to the unco good which is the poet's plea for mercy in judgment and a bard's epitaph which as a summary of his own life might well be written at the end of his poems halloween a picture of rustic merrymaking and the trois dogs a contrast between the rich and poor are generally classed among the poet's best works but one unfamiliar with the scotch dialect will find them rather difficult of burns longer poems the two best worth reading are the cotter's saturday night and tam o shanter the one giving the most perfect picture we possess of a noble poverty the other being the most lively and the least objectionable of his humorous works it would be difficult to find elsewhere such a combination of the gruesome and the ridiculous as is packed up in tam o' shanter with the exception of these two the longer poems add little to the author's fame or to our own enjoyment it is better for the beginner to read burns exquisite songs and gladly to recognize his place in the hearts of a people and forget the rest since they only sadden us and obscure the poet's better nature End of section thirty six section thirty seven of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued william blake seventeen fifty seven eighteen twenty seven piping down the valleys wild piping songs of pleasant glee on a cloud i saw a child and he laughing said to me pipe a song about a lamb so i piped with merry cheer piper pipe that song again so i piped he wept to hear piper sit thee down and write in a book that all may read so he vanished from my sight and i plucked a hollow reed and i made a rural pin and i stained the water clear and i wrote my happy songs every child may joy to hear note introduction songs of innocence End of note of all the romantic poets of the eighteenth century blake is the most independent and the most original in his earliest work written when he was scarcely more than a child he seems to go back to the elizabethan songwriters for his models but for the greater part of his life he was the poet of inspiration alone following no man's lead and obeying no voice but that which he heard in his own mystic soul though the most extraordinary literary genius of his age he had practically no influence upon it indeed we hardly yet understand this poet of pure fancy this mystic this transcendental madman who remained to the end of his busy life an incomprehensible child life blake the son of a london tradesman was a strange imaginative child whose soul was more at home with brooks and flowers and fairies than with the crowd of the city streets beyond learning to read and write he received education but he began at ten years to copy prints and to write verses 
he also began a long course of art study which resulted in his publishing his own books adorned with marginal engravings colored by hand an unusual setting worthy of the strong artistic sense that shows itself in many of his early verses as a child he had visions of god and the angels looking in at his window and as a man he thought he received visits from the souls of the great dead moses virgil homer dante milton majestic shadows gray but luminous he calls them he seems never to have asked himself the question how far these visions were pure illusions but believed and trusted them implicitly to him all nature was a vast spiritual symbolism wherein he saw elves fairies devils angels all looking at him in friendship or enmity through the eyes of flowers and stars with the blue sky spread over with wings and the mild sun that mounts and sings with trees and fields full of fairy elves and little devils who fight for themselves with angels planted in hawthorn bowers and god himself in the passing hours and this curious pantheistic conception of nature was not a matter of creed but the very essence of blake's life strangely enough he made no attempt to found a new religious cult but followed his own way singing cheerfully working patiently in the face of discouragement and failure that writers of far less genius were exalted to favor while he remained poor and obscure does not seem to have troubled him in the least for over forty years he labored diligently at book engraving guided in his art by michelangelo but inventing his own curious designs at which we still wonder the illustrations for young's night thoughts for blair's grave and the inventions to the book of job show the peculiarity of blake's mind quite as clearly as his poems while he worked at his trade he flung off for he never seemed to compose disjointed visions and incomprehensible rhapsodies with an occasional little gem that still sets our hearts to singing ah sunflower weary of time who countest the steps of the sun seeking after that sweet golden clime where the traveller's journey is done where the youth pined away with desire and the pale virgin shrouded in snow rise from their graves and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go that is a curious flower to find growing in the london street but it suggests blake's own life which was outwardly busy and quiet but inwardly full of adventure and excitement his last huge prophetic works like jerusalem and milton eighteen o four were dictated to him he declares by supernatural means and even against his own will they are only half intelligible but here and there one sees flashes of the same poetic beauty that marks his little poems critics generally dismiss blake with the word madman but that is only an evasion at best he is the writer of exquisite lyrics at worst he is mad only north northwest like hamlet and the puzzle is to find the method in his madness the most amazing thing about him is the perfectly sane and cheerful way in which he moved through poverty and obscurity flinging out exquisite poems or senseless rhapsodies as a child might play with gems or straws or sunbeams indifferently he was a gentle kindly most unworldly little man with extraordinary eyes which seem even in the lifeless portraits to reflect some unusual hypnotic power he died obscurely smiling at a vision of paradise in eighteen twenty seven that was nearly a century ago yet he still remains one of the most incomprehensible figures in our literature works of blake the poetical sketches published in seventeen eighty three is a collection of blake's earliest poetry much of it written in boyhood 
it contains much crude and incoherent work but also a few lyrics of striking originality two later and better known volumes are songs of innocence and songs of experience reflecting two widely different views of the human soul as in all his works there is an abundance of apparently worthless stuff in these songs but in the language of miners it is all pay dirt it shows gleams of golden grains that await our sifting and now and then we find a nugget unexpectedly my lord was like a flower upon the brows of lusty may ah life as frail as flower my lord was like a star in highest heaven drawn down to earth by spells and wickedness my lord was like the opening eye of day but he is darkened like the summer moon clouded fallen like the stately tree cut down the breath of heaven dwelt among his leaves on account of the chaotic character of most of blake's work it is well to begin our reading with a short book of selections containing the best songs of these three little volumes swinburne calls blake the only poet of supreme and simple poetic genius of the eighteenth century the one man of that age fit on all accounts to rank with the old great masters Note swinburne's william blake end of note the praise is doubtless extravagant and the criticism somewhat intemperate but when we have read the evening star memory night love to the muses spring summer the tiger the lamb the clod and the pebble we may possibly share swinburne's enthusiasm certainly in these three volumes we have some of the most perfect and the most original songs in our language of blake's longer poems his titanic prophecies and apocalyptic splendors it is impossible to write justly in such a brief work as this outwardly they suggest a huge chaff pile and the scattered grains of wheat hardly warrant the labor of winnowing the curious reader will get an idea of blake's amazing mysticism by dipping into any of the works of his middle life Urizen, gates of paradise marriage of heaven and hell america the french revolution or the vision of the daughters of albion his latest works like jerusalem and milton are too obscure to have any literary value to read any of these works casually is to call the author a madman to study them remembering blake's songs and his genius is to quote softly his own answer to the child who asked about the land of dreams oh what land is the land of dreams what are its mountains and what are its streams oh father i saw my mother there among the lilies by waters fair dear child i also by pleasant streams have wandered all night in the land of dreams but though calm and warm the waters wide i could not get to the other side minor poets of the revival we have chosen the five preceding poets gray goldsmith cowper burns and blake as the most typical and the most interesting of the writers who proclaimed the dawn of romanticism in the eighteenth century with them we associate a group of minor writers whose works were immensely popular in their own day the ordinary reader will pass them by but to the student they are all significant as expressions of very different phases of the romantic revival james thompson seventeen hundred seventeen forty eight thompson belongs among the pioneers of romanticism like gray and goldsmith he wavered between pseudo-classic and the new romantic ideals and for this reason if for no other his early work is interesting like the uncertainty of a child who hesitates whether to creep safely on all fours or risk a fall by walking he is worthy to be remembered for three poems rule britannia which is still one of the national songs of england the castle of indolence and the seasons 
the dreamy and romantic castle 1748 occupied by enchanter indolence and his willing captives in the land of drowsyhead is purely spenserian in its imagery and is written in the spenserian stanza the seasons seventeen twenty six seventeen thirty written in blank verse describes the sights and sounds of the changing year and the poet's own feelings in the presence of nature these two poems though rather dull to a modern reader were significant of the early romantic revival in three ways they abandoned the prevailing heroic couplet they went back to the elizabethans instead of to pope for their models and they called attention to the long-neglected life of nature as a subject for poetry william collins seventeen twenty one seventeen fifty nine collins the friend and disciple of thompson was of a delicate nervous temperament like cowper and over him also brooded the awful shadow of insanity his first work oriental eclogues seventeen forty two is romantic in feeling but is written in the prevailing mechanical couplets all his later work is romantic in both thought and expression his ode on the popular superstitions of the highlands 1750 is an interesting event in the romantic revival for it introduced a new world of witches pygmies fairies and medieval kings for the imagination to play in collins best-known poems are the odes to simplicity to fear to the passions the little unnamed lyric beginning how sleep the brave and the exquisite ode to evening in reading the latter one is scarcely aware that the lines are so delicately balanced that they have no need of rhyme to accentuate their melody End of section thirty seven Section 38 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 continued. George Crabbe, 1754 1832. Crabbe is an interesting combination of realism and romanticism, his work of depicting common life being at times vaguely suggestive of Fielding's novels the village seventeen eighty three a poem without a rival as a picture of the working men of his age is sometimes like fielding in its coarse vigor and again like dryden in its precise versification the poem was not successful at first and crabbe abandoned his literary dreams for over twenty years he settled down as a clergyman in a county parish observing keenly the common life around him then he published more poems exactly like the village which immediately brought him fame and money they brought him also the friendship of walter scott who like others regarded crabbe as one of the first poets of the age these later poems the parish register eighteen o seven the borough eighteen ten tales in verse eighteen twelve and tales of the hall eighteen nineteen are in the same strain they are written in couplets they are reflections of nature and of country life they contain much that is sordid and dull but are nevertheless real pictures of real men and women just as crabbe saw them and as such they are still interesting goldsmith and burns had idealized the poor and we admire them for their sympathy and insight it remained for crabbe to show that in wretched fishing villages in the lives of hard-working men and women children laborers smugglers paupers all sorts and conditions of common men there is abundant romantic without exaggerating or idealizing their vices and virtues james macpherson seventeen thirty six seventeen ninety six in macpherson we have an unusual figure who catered to the new romantic interest in the old epic heroes and won immense though momentary fame by a series of literary forgeries macpherson was a scotch schoolmaster an educated man but evidently not over tender of conscience whose imagination had been stirred by certain old poems which he may have heard in gaelic among the highlanders 
in seventeen sixty he published his fragments of ancient poetry collected in the highlands and alleged that his work was but a translation of gaelic manuscripts whether the work of itself would have attracted attention is doubtful but the fact that an abundance of literary material might be awaiting discovery led to an interest such as now attends the opening of an egyptian tomb and a subscription was promptly raised in edinburgh to send macpherson through the highlands to collect more manuscripts the result was the epic fingal seventeen sixty two that lank and lamentable counterfeit of poetry as swinburne calls it which the author professed to have translated from the gaelic of the poet ossian its success was astonishing and macpherson followed it up with temora seventeen sixty three another epic in the same strain in both these works macpherson succeeds in giving an air of primal grandeur to his heroes the characters are big and shadowy the imagery is at times magnificent the language is a kind of chanting bombastic prose now fingal arose in his might and thrice he reared his voice cromla answered around and the sons of the desert stood still they bent their red faces to earth ashamed at the presence of fingal he came like a cloud of rain in the days of the sun when slow it rolls on the hill and fields expect the shower swaran beheld the terrible king of morven and stopped in the midst of his course dark he leaned on his spear rolling his red eyes around silent and tall he seemed as an oak on the banks of lubar which had its branches blasted of old by the lightning of heaven his thousands pour around the hero and the darkness of battle gathers on the hill Note, there are several omissions from the text in this fragment from fingal End of note. the publication of this gloomy imaginative work produced a literary storm a few critics led by dr johnson demanded to see the original manuscripts and when macpherson refused to produce them note several fragments of gaelic poetry attributed to ossian or oisin are now known to have existed at that time in the highlands macpherson used these as a basis for his epic but most of the details were furnished by his own imagination the alleged text of ossian was published in eighteen o seven some eleven years after macpherson's death it only added another mystery to the forgery for while it embodied a few old and probably genuine fragments the bulk of it seems to be macpherson's work translated back into gaelic End of note. the ossianic poems were branded as a forgery nevertheless they had enormous success macpherson was honored as a literary explorer he was given an official position carrying a salary for life and at his death in seventeen ninety six he was buried in westminster abbey blake burns and indeed most of the poets of the age were influenced by this sham poetry even the scholarly gray was deceived and delighted with ossian and men as far apart as goethe and napoleon praised it immoderately thomas chatterton seventeen fifty two seventeen seventy this marvellous boy to whom keats dedicated his endymion and who is celebrated in shelley's adonais is one of the saddest and most interesting figures of the romantic revival during his childhood he haunted the old church of st mary redcliffe in bristol where he was fascinated by the medieval air of the place and especially by one old chest known as caninga's coffer containing musty documents which had been preserved for three hundred years with strange uncanny intentness the child pored over these relics of the past copying them instead of his writing-book until he could imitate not only the spelling and language but even the handwriting of the original 
soon after the ossian forgeries appeared chatterton began to produce documents apparently very old containing medieval poems legends and family histories centering around two characters thomas rowley priest and poet and william canning merchant of bristol in the days of henry the sixth it seems incredible that the whole design of these medieval romances should have been worked out by a child of eleven and that he could reproduce the style and the writing of caxton's day so well that the printers were deceived but such is the fact more and more rowley papers as they were called were produced by chatterton apparently from the archives of the old church in reality from his own imagination delighting a large circle of readers and deceiving all but gray and a few scholars who recognized the occasional misuse of fifteenth-century english words all this work was carefully finished and bore the unmistakable stamp of literary genius reading now his aella or the ballad of carita or the long poem in ballad style called bristow tragedy it is hard to realize that it is a boy's work at seventeen years of age chatterton went for a literary career to london where he soon afterwards took poison and killed himself in a fit of childish despondency brought on by poverty and hunger thomas percy seventeen twenty nine eighteen eleven to percy bishop of the irish church in dromore we are indebted for the first attempt at a systematic collection of the folk songs and ballads which are counted among the treasures of a nation's literature note for various other collections of songs and ballads antedating percy's see phelps beginnings of the english romantic movement chapter seven end of note in seventeen sixty five he published in three volumes his famous relics of ancient english poetry the most valuable part of this work is the remarkable collection of old english and scottish ballads such as chevy chase the nut brown maid children of the wood battle of otterburn and many more which but for his labor might easily have perished we have now much better and more reliable editions of these same ballads for percy garbled his materials adding and subtracting freely and even inventing a few ballads of his own two motives probably influenced him in this first the different versions of the same ballad varied greatly and percy in changing them to suit himself took the same liberty as had many other writers in dealing with the same material second percy was under the influence of johnson and his school and thought it necessary to add a few elegant ballads to atone for the rudeness of the most obsolete poems that sounds queer now used as we are to exactness in dealing with historical and literary material but it expresses the general spirit of the age in which he lived notwithstanding these drawbacks percy's relics marks an epoch in the history of romanticism and it is difficult to measure its influence on the whole romantic movement scott says of it the first time i could scrape a few shillings together i bought myself a copy of these beloved volumes nor do i believe i ever read a book half so frequently or with half the enthusiasm scott's own poetry is strongly modelled upon these early ballads and his minstrelsy of the scottish border is due chiefly to the influence of percy's work besides the relics percy has given us another good work in his northern antiquities seventeen seventy translated from the french of malay's history of denmark this also was of immense influence since it introduced to english readers a new and fascinating mythology more rugged and primitive than that of the greeks and we are still in music as in letters under the spell of thor and odin of freya and the valkyr maidens and of that stupendous drama of passion and tragedy which ended in the twilight of the gods 
the literary world owes a debt of gratitude to percy who wrote nothing of importance himself but who by collecting and translating the works of other men did much to hasten the triumph of romanticism in the nineteenth century part three the first english novelists the chief literary phenomena of the complex eighteenth century are the reign of so-called classicism the revival of romantic poetry and the discovery of the modern novel of these three the last is probably the most important aside from the fact that the novel is the most modern and at present the most widely read and influential type of literature we have a certain pride in regarding it as england's original contribution to the world of letters other great types of literature like the epic the romance and the drama were first produced by other nations but the idea of the modern novel seems to have been worked out largely on english soil note the first books to which the term novel in the modern sense may be applied appeared almost simultaneously in england france and germany the rapid development of the english novel had an immense influence in all european nations End of note and in the number and the fine quality of her novelists england has hardly been rivaled by any other nation before we study the writers who developed this new type of literature it is well to consider briefly its meaning and history the story element meaning of the novel probably the most significant remark made by the ordinary reader concerning a work of fiction takes the form of a question is it a good story for the reader of to-day is much like the child and the primitive man in this respect that he must be attracted and held by the story element of a narrative before he learns to appreciate its style or moral significance the story element is therefore essential to the novel but where the story originates is impossible to say as well might we seek for the origin of the race for wherever primitive men are found there we see them gathering eagerly about the story-teller in the halls of our saxon ancestors the scop and the tale-bringer were ever the most welcome guests and in the bark wigwams of the american indians the man who told the legends of hiawatha had an audience quite as attentive as that which gathered at the greek festivals to hear the story of ulysses wanderings to man's instinct or innate love for a story we are indebted for all our literature and the novel must in some degree satisfy this instinct or fail of appreciation the romance the second question which we ask concerning a work of fiction is how far does the element of imagination enter into it for upon the element of imagination depends largely our classification of works of fiction into novels romances and mere adventure stories the divisions here are as indefinite as the borderland between childhood and youth between instinct and reason but there are certain principles to guide us we note in the development of any normal child that there comes a time when for his stories he desires knights giants elves fairies witches magic and marvelous adventures which have no basis in experience he tells extraordinary tales about himself which may be only the vague remembrances of a dream or the creations of a dawning imagination both of which are as real to him as any other part of life when we say that such a child romances we give exactly the right name to it for this sudden interest in extraordinary beings and events marks the development of the human imagination running riot at first because it is not guided by reason which is a later development and to satisfy this new interest the romance note the name romance was given at first to any story in one of the romance languages like the french metrical romances which we have considered 
because these stories were brought to england at a time when the childish mind of the middle ages delighted in the most impossible stories the name romance was retained to cover any work of the unbridled imagination End of note was invented the romance is originally a work of fiction in which the imagination is given full play without being limited by facts or probabilities it deals with extraordinary events with heroes whose powers are exaggerated and often adds the element of superhuman or supernatural characters it is impossible to draw the line where romance ends but this element of excessive imagination and of impossible heroes and incidents is its distinguishing mark in every literature the novel where the novel begins it is likewise impossible to say but again we have a suggestion in the experience of every reader there comes a time naturally and inevitably in the life of every youth when the romance no longer enthralls him he lives in a world of facts gets acquainted with men and women some good some bad but all human and he demands that literature shall express life as he knows it by experience this is the stage of the awakened intellect and in our stories the intellect as well as the imagination must now be satisfied at the beginning of this stage we delight in robinson crusoe we read eagerly a multitude of adventure narratives and a few so-called historical novels but in each case we must be lured by a story must find heroes and moving accidents by flood and field to appeal to our imagination and though the hero and the adventure may be exaggerated they must both be natural and within the bounds of probability gradually the element of adventure or surprising incident grows less and less important as we learn that true life is not adventurous but a plain heroic matter of work and duty and the daily choice between good and evil life is the most real thing in the world now not the life of kings or heroes or superhuman creatures but the individual life with its struggles and temptations and triumphs or failures like our own and any work that faithfully represents life becomes interesting so we drop the adventure story and turn to the novel for the novel is a work of fiction in which the imagination and the intellect combine to express life in the form of a story and the imagination is always directed and controlled by the intellect it is interested chiefly not in romance or adventure but in men and women as they are it aims to show the motives and influences which govern human life and the effects of personal choice upon character and destiny such is the true novel note this division of works of fiction into romances and novels is a somewhat arbitrary one but it seems on the whole the most natural and the most satisfactory many writers use the generic term novel to include all prose fiction they divide novels into two classes stories and romances the story being a form of the novel which relates certain incidents of life with as little complexity as possible and the romance being a form of novel which describes life as led by strong emotions into complex and unusual circumstances novels are otherwise divided into novels of personality like vicar of wakefield and silas marner historical novels ivanhoe novels of romance like lorna doone and novels of purpose like oliver twist and uncle tom's cabin all such classifications are imperfect and the best of them is open to objections End of note and as such it opens a wider and more interesting field than any other type of literature end of section thirty eight section thirty nine of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued precursors of the novel 
before the novel could reach its modern stage of a more or less sincere attempt to express human life and character it had to pass through several centuries of almost imperceptible development among the early precursors of the novel we must place a collection of tales known as the greek romances dating from the second to the sixth centuries these are imaginative and delightful stories of ideal love and marvelous adventure note one of these tales was called the wonderful things beyond tuli it is the story of a youth dinius who for love of a girl dercyllis did heroic things and undertook many adventures including a journey to the frozen north and another to the moon a second tale ephesiaca is the story of a man and a maid each of whom scoffs at love they meet and fall desperately in love but the course of true love does not run smooth and they separate and suffer and go through many perils before they live happily ever after this tale is the source of the medieval story apollonius of tyre which is used in gower's confessio amantis and in shakespeare's pericles the third tale is the pastoral love story daphnis and chloe which reappeared in many forms in subsequent literature End of note which profoundly affected romance writing for the next thousand years a second group of predecessors is found in the italian and spanish pastoral romances which were inspired by the eclogues of virgil these were extremely popular in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries and their influence is seen later in sydney's arcadia which is the best of this type in english the third and most influential group of predecessors of the novel is made up of the romances of chivalry such as are found in mallory's mort d'arthur it is noticeable in reading these beautiful old romances in different languages that each nation changes them somewhat so as to make them more expressive of national traits and ideals in a word the old romance tends inevitably towards realism especially in england where the excessive imagination is curbed and the heroes become more human in mallory in the unknown author of sir gawain and the green knight and especially in chaucer we see the effect of the practical english mind in giving these old romances a more natural setting and in making the heroes suggest though faintly the men and women of their own day the canterbury tales with their story interest and their characters delightfully true to nature have in them the suggestion at least of a connected story whose chief aim is to reflect life as it is in the elizabethan age the idea of the novel grows more definite in sydney's arcadia fifteen eighty a romance of chivalry the pastoral setting at least is generally true to nature our credulity is not taxed as in the old romances by the continual appearance of magic or miracles and the characters though idealized till they become tiresome occasionally give the impression of being real men and women in bacon's the new atlantis sixteen twenty seven we have the story of the discovery by mariners of an unknown country inhabited by a superior race of men more civilized than ourselves an idea which had been used by moore in his utopia in fifteen sixteen these two books are neither romances nor novels in the strict sense but studies of social institutions they use the connected story as a means of teaching moral lessons and of bringing about needed reforms and this valuable suggestion has been adopted by many of our modern writers in the so-called problem novels and novels of purpose nearer to the true novel is lodge's romantic story of rosalinda which was used by shakespeare in as you like it this was modeled upon the italian novella or short story which became very popular in england during the elizabethan age in the same age we have introduced into england the spanish picaresque novel 
from picaro a knave or rascal which at first was a kind of burlesque on the medieval romance and which took for its hero some low scoundrel or outcast instead of a knight and followed him through a long career of scandals and villainies one of the earliest types of this picaresque novel in english is nash's the unfortunate traveller or the life of jack wilton fifteen ninety four which is also a forerunner of the historical novel since its action takes place during that gorgeous interview between henry the eighth and the king of france on the field of the cloth of gold in all these short stories and picaresque novels the emphasis was laid not so much on life and character as on the adventures of the hero and the interest consisted largely in wondering what would happen next and how the plot would end the same method is employed in all trashy novels and it is especially the bane of many modern story writers this excessive interest in adventures or incidents for their own sake and not for their effect on character is what distinguishes the modern adventure story from the true novel in the puritan age we approach still nearer to the modern novel especially in the work of bunyan and as the puritan always laid emphasis on character stories appeared having a definite moral purpose bunyan's the pilgrim's progress sixteen seventy eight differs from the fairy queen and from all other medieval allegories in this important respect that the characters far from being bloodless abstractions are but thinly disguised men and women indeed many a modern man reading the story of the christian has found in it the reflection of his own life and experience in the life and death of mr badman sixteen eighty two we have another and even more realistic study of a man as he was in bunyan's day these two striking figures christian and mr badman belong among the great characters of english fiction bunyan's good work his keen insight his delineation of character and his emphasis upon the moral effects of individual action was carried on by addison and steele some thirty years later the character of sir roger de coverley is a real reflection of english country life in the eighteenth century and with steele's domestic sketches in the tatler the spectator and the guardian seventeen o nine seventeen thirteen we definitely cross the borderland that lies outside of romance and enter the region of character study where the novel has its beginning the discovery of the modern novel notwithstanding this long history of fiction to which we have called attention it is safe to say that until the publication of richardson's pamela in seventeen forty no true novel had appeared in any literature by a true novel we mean simply a work of fiction which relates the story of a plain human life under stress of emotion which depends for its interest not on incident or adventure but on its truth to nature a number of english novelists goldsmith richardson fielding smollett sterne all seem to have seized upon the idea of reflecting life as it is in the form of a story and to have developed it simultaneously the result was an extraordinary awakening of interest especially among people who had never before been greatly concerned with literature we are to remember that in previous periods the number of readers was comparatively small and that with the exception of a few writers like langland and bunyan authors wrote largely for the upper classes in the eighteenth century the spread of education and the appearance of newspapers and magazines led to an immense increase in the number of readers and at the same time the middle-class people assumed a foremost place in english life and history these new readers and this new powerful middle class had no classic tradition to hamper them 
they cared little for the opinions of dr johnson and the famous literary club and so far as they read fiction at all they apparently took little interest in the exaggerated romances of impossible heroes and the picaresque stories of intrigue and villainy which had interested the upper classes some new type of literature was demanded this new type must express the new ideal of the eighteenth century namely the value and the importance of the individual life so the novel was born expressing though in a different way exactly the same ideals of personality and the dignity of common life which were later proclaimed in the american and in the french revolution and were welcomed with rejoicing by the poets of the romantic revival to tell men not about knights or kings or types of heroes but about themselves in the guise of plain men and women about their own thoughts and motives and struggles and the results of actions upon their own characters this was the purpose of our first novelists the eagerness with which their chapters were read in england and the rapidity with which their work was copied abroad show how powerfully the new discovery appealed to readers everywhere before we consider the work of these writers who first developed the modern novel we must glance at the work of a pioneer daniel defoe whom we place among the early novelists for the simple reason that we do not know how else to classify him daniel defoe sixteen sixty one question mark seventeen thirty one to defoe is often given the credit for the discovery of the modern novel but whether or not he deserves that honor is an open question even a casual reading of robinson crusoe seventeen nineteen which generally heads the list of modern fiction shows that this exciting tale is largely an adventure story rather than the study of human character which defoe probably intended it to be young people still read it as they might a dime novel skipping its moralizing passages and hurrying on to more adventures but they seldom appreciate the excellent mature reasons which banish the dime novel to a secret place in the haymow while crusoe hangs proudly on the christmas tree and holds an honored place on the family bookshelf defoe's apparition of mrs veal memoirs of a cavalier and journal of the plague year are such mixtures of fact fiction and credulity that they defy classification while other so-called novels like captain singleton moll flanders and roxana are but little better than picaresque stories with a deal of unnatural moralizing and repentance added for puritanical effect in crusoe defoe brought the realistic adventure story to a very high stage of its development but his works hardly deserve to be classified as true novels which must subordinate incident to the faithful portrayal of human life and character life defoe was the son of a london butcher named foe and kept his family name until he was forty years of age when he added the aristocratic prefix with which we have grown familiar the events of his busy seventy years of life in which he passed through all extremes from poverty to wealth from prosperous brickmaker to starveling journalist from newgate prison to immense popularity and royal favor are obscure enough in details but four facts stand out clearly which help the reader to understand the character of his work first defoe was a jack at all trades as well as a writer his interest was largely with the working classes and notwithstanding many questionable practices he seems to have had some continued purpose of educating and uplifting the common people this partially accounts for the enormous popularity of his works and for the fact that they were criticized by literary men as being fit only for the kitchen second he was a radical nonconformist in religion and was intended by his father for the independent ministry the puritan zeal for reform possessed him and he tried to do by his pen what wesley was doing by his preaching without however having any great measure of the latter's sincerity or singleness of purpose 
this zeal for reform marks all his numerous works and accounts for the moralizing to be found everywhere third defoe was a journalist and pamphleteer with a reporter's eye for the picturesque and a newspaper man's instinct for making a good story he wrote an immense number of pamphlets poems and magazine articles conducted several papers one of the most popular the review being issued from prison and the fact that they often blew hot and cold upon the same question was hardly noticed indeed so extraordinarily interesting and plausible were defoe's articles that he generally managed to keep employed by the party in power whether whig or tory this long journalistic career lasting half a century accounts for his direct simple narrative style which holds us even now by its intense reality to defoe's genius we are also indebted for two discoveries the interview and the leading editorial both of which are still in daily use in our best newspapers the fourth fact to remember is that defoe knew prison life and thereby hangs a tale in seventeen o two defoe published a remarkable pamphlet called the shortest way with the dissenters supporting the claims of the free churches against the high flyers i e tories and anglicans in a vein of grim humor which recalls swift's modest proposal defoe advocated hanging all dissenting ministers and sending all members of the free churches into exile and so ferociously realistic was the satire that both dissenters and tories took the author literally defoe was tried found guilty of seditious libel and sentenced to be fined to stand three days in the pillory and to be imprisoned hardly had the sentence been pronounced when defoe wrote his hymn to the pillory hail hieroglyphic state machine contrived to punish fancy in a set of doggerel verses ridiculing his prosecutors which defoe with a keen eye for advertising scattered all over london crowds flocked to cheer him in the pillory and seeing that defoe was making popularity out of persecution his enemies bundled him off to newgate prison he turned this experience also to account by publishing a popular newspaper and by getting acquainted with rogues pirates smugglers and miscellaneous outcasts each one with a good story to be used later after his release from prison in seventeen o four he turned his knowledge of criminals to further account and entered the government employ as a kind of spy or secret service agent his prison experience and the further knowledge of criminals gained in over twenty years as a spy accounts for his numerous stories of thieves and pirates jonathan wild and captain avery and also for his later novels which deal almost exclusively with villains and outcasts when defoe was nearly sixty years of age he turned to fiction and wrote the great work by which he is remembered robinson crusoe was an instant success and the author became famous all over europe other stories followed rapidly and defoe earned money enough to retire to newington and live in comfort but not idly for his activity in producing fiction is rivaled only by that of walter scott thus in seventeen twenty appeared captain singleton duncan campbell and memoirs of a cavalier in seventeen twenty two colonel jack moll flanders and the amazingly realistic journal of the plague year so the list grows with astonishing rapidity ending with the history of the devil in seventeen twenty six in the latter year defoe's secret connection with the government became known and a great howl of indignation rose against him in the public print destroying in an hour the popularity which he had gained by a lifetime of intrigue and labor he fled from his home to london where he died obscurely in seventeen thirty one while hiding from real or imaginary enemies works of defoe at the head of the list stands robinson crusoe seventeen nineteen seventeen twenty one of the few books in any literature which has held its popularity undiminished for nearly two centuries 
the story is based upon the experiences of alexander selkirk or selcraig who had been marooned in the island of juan fernandez off the coast of chile and who had lived there in solitude for five years on his return to england in seventeen o nine selkirk's experiences became known and steele published an account of them in the englishman without however attracting any wide attention that defoe used selkirk's story is practically certain but with his usual duplicity he claimed to have written crusoe in seventeen o eight a year before selkirk's return however that may be the story itself is real enough to have come straight from a sailor's logbook defoe as shown in his journal of the plague year and his memoirs of a cavalier had the art of describing things he had never seen with the accuracy of an eye-witness robinson crusoe the charm of the story is its intense reality in the succession of thoughts feelings incidents which every reader recognizes to be absolutely true to life at first glance it would seem that one man on a desert island could not possibly furnish the material for a long story but as we read we realize with amazement that every slightest thought and action the saving of the cargo of the shipwrecked vessel the preparation for defense against imaginary foes the intense agitation over the discovery of a footprint in the sand is a record of what the reader himself would do and feel if he were alone in such a place defoe's long and varied experience now stood him in good stead in fact he was the only man of letters in his time who might have been thrown on a desert island without finding himself at a loss what to do note mentos life of defoe end of note and he puts himself so perfectly in his hero's place that he repeats his blunders as well as his triumphs thus what reader ever followed defoe's hero through weary feverish months of building a huge boat which was too big to be launched by one man without recalling some boy who spent many stormy days in shed or cellar building a boat or dog-house and who when the thing was painted and finished found it a foot wider than the door and had to knock it to pieces this absolute naturalness characterizes the whole story it is a study of the human will also of patience fortitude and the indomitable saxon spirit overcoming all obstacles and it was this element which made rousseau recommend robinson crusoe as a better treatise on education than anything which aristotle or the moderns had ever written and this suggests the most significant thing about defoe's masterpiece namely that the hero represents the whole of human society doing with his own hands all the things which by the division of labor and the demands of modern civilization are now done by many different workers he is therefore the type of the whole civilized race of men in the remaining works of defoe more than two hundred in number there is an astonishing variety but all are marked by the same simple narrative style and the same intense realism the best known of these are the journal of the plague year in which the horrors of a frightful plague are minutely recorded the memoirs of a cavalier so realistic that chatham quoted it as history in parliament and several picaresque novels like captain singleton colonel jack moll flanders and roxana the last work is by some critics given a very high place in realistic fiction but like the other three and like defoe's minor narratives of jack shepherd and cartouche it is a disagreeable study of vice ending with a forced and unnatural repentance End of section thirty nine section forty of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued samuel richardson sixteen eighty nine seventeen sixty one to richardson belongs the credit of writing the first modern novel 
he was the son of a london joiner who for economy's sake resided in some unknown town in derbyshire where samuel was born in sixteen eighty nine the boy received very little education but he had a natural talent for writing letters and even as a boy we find him frequently employed by working girls to write their love letters for them this early experience together with his fondness for the society of his dearest ladies rather than of men gave him that intimate knowledge of the hearts of sentimental and uneducated women which is manifest in all his works moreover he was a keen observer of manners and his surprisingly accurate descriptions often compel us to listen even when he is most tedious at seventeen years of age he went to london and learned the printer's trade which he followed to the end of his life when fifty years of age he had a small reputation as a writer of elegant epistles and this reputation led certain publishers to approach him with a proposal that he write a series of familiar letters which could be used as models by people unused to writing richardson gladly accepted the proposal and had the happy inspiration to make these letters tell the connected story of a girl's life defoe had told an adventure story of human life on a desert island but richardson would tell the story of a girl's inner life in the midst of english neighbors that sounds simple enough now but it marked an epoch in the history of literature like every other great and simple discovery it makes us wonder why some one had not thought of it before richardson's novels the result of richardson's inspiration was pamela or virtue rewarded an endless series of letters note these were not what the booksellers expected they wanted a handy letter writer something like a book of etiquette and it was published in seventeen forty one a few months after pamela End of note telling of the trials tribulations and the final happy marriage of a too sweet young maiden published in four volumes extending over the years seventeen forty and seventeen forty one its chief fame lies in the fact that it is our first novel in the modern sense aside from this important fact and viewed solely as a novel it is sentimental grandiloquent and wearisome its success at the time was enormous and richardson began another series of letters he could tell a story in no other way which occupied his leisure hours for the next six years the result was clarissa or the history of a young lady published in eight volumes in seventeen forty seven to seventeen forty eight this was another and somewhat better sentimental novel and it was received with immense enthusiasm of all richardson's heroines clarissa is the most human in her doubts and scruples of conscience and especially in her bitter grief and humiliation she is a real woman in marked contrast with the mechanical hero lovelace who simply illustrates the author's inability to portray a man's character the dramatic element in this novel is strong and is increased by means of the letters which enable the reader to keep close to the characters of the story and to see life from their different viewpoints macaulay who was deeply impressed by clarissa is said to have made the remark that were the novel lost he could restore almost the whole of it from memory richardson now turned from his middle-class heroines and in five or six years completed another series of letters in which he attempted to tell the story of a man and an aristocrat the result was sir charles grandison seventeen fifty four a novel in seven volumes whose hero was intended to be a model of aristocratic manners and virtues for the middle-class people who largely constituted the novelist's readers for richardson who began in pamela with the purpose of teaching his hearers how to write ended with the deliberate purpose of teaching them how to live and in most of his work his chief object was in his own words to inculcate virtue and good deportment 
his novels therefore suffer as much from his purpose as from his own limitations notwithstanding his tedious moralizing and his other defects richardson in these three books gave something entirely new to the literary world and the world appreciated the gift this was the story of human life told from within and depending for its interest not on incident or adventure but on its truth to human nature reading his work is on the whole like examining the antiquated model of a stern-wheel steamer it is interesting for its undeveloped possibilities rather than for its achievement henry fielding seventeen o seven seventeen fifty four life judged by his ability alone fielding was the greatest of this new group of novel writers and one of the most artistic that our literature has produced he was born in east Stour, dorsetshire in seventeen o seven in contrast with richardson he was well educated having spent several years at the famous eton school and taken a degree in letters at the university of leyden in seventeen twenty eight moreover he had a deeper knowledge of life gained from his own varied and sometimes riotous experience for several years after returning from leyden he gained a precarious living by writing plays farces and buffoneries for the stage in seventeen thirty five he married an admirable woman of whom we have glimpses in two of his characters amelia and sophia western and lived extravagantly on her little fortune at east Stour. having used up all his money he returned to london and studied law gaining his living by occasional plays and by newspaper work for ten years or more little is definitely known of him save that he published his first novel joseph andrews in seventeen forty two and that he was made justice of the peace for westminster in seventeen forty eight the remaining years of his life in which his best novels were written were not given to literature but rather to his duties as magistrate and especially to breaking up the gangs of thieves and cutthroats which infested the streets of london after nightfall he died in lisbon whither he had gone for his health in seventeen fifty four and lies buried there in the english cemetery the pathetic account of his last journey together with an inkling of the generosity and kind-heartedness of the man notwithstanding the scandals and irregularities of his life are found in his last work the journal of a voyage to lisbon fielding's work fielding's first novel joseph andrews seventeen forty two was inspired by the success of pamela and began as a burlesque of the false sentimentality and the conventional virtues of richardson's heroine he took for his hero the alleged brother of pamela who was exposed to the same kind of temptations but who instead of being rewarded for his virtue was unceremoniously turned out of doors by his mistress there the burlesque ends the hero takes to the open road and fielding forgets all about pamela in telling the adventures of joseph and his companion parson adams unlike richardson who has no humor who minces words and moralizes and dotes on the sentimental woes of his heroines fielding is direct vigorous hilarious and coarse to the point of vulgarity he is full of animal spirits and he tells the story of a vagabond life not for the sake of moralizing like richardson or for emphasizing a forced repentance like defoe but simply because it interests him and his only concern is to laugh men out of their follies so his story though it abounds in unpleasant incidents generally leaves the reader with the strong impression of reality fielding's later novels are jonathan wilde the story of a rogue which suggests defoe's narrative the history of tom jones a foundling seventeen forty nine his best work and amelia seventeen fifty one the story of a good wife in contrast with an unworthy husband 
his strength in all these works is in the vigorous but coarse figures like those of jan steen's pictures which fill most of his pages his weakness is in lack of taste and in barrenness of imagination or invention which leads him to repeat his plots and incidents with slight variations in all his work sincerity is perhaps the most marked characteristic fielding likes virile men just as they are good and bad but detests shams of every sort his satire has none of swift's bitterness but is subtle as that of chaucer and good-natured as that of steele he never moralizes though some of his powerfully drawn scenes suggest a deeper moral lesson than anything in defoe or richardson he never judges even the worst of his characters without remembering his own frailty and tempering justice with mercy on the whole though much of his work is perhaps in bad taste and is too coarse for pleasant or profitable reading fielding must be regarded as an artist a very great artist in realistic fiction and the advanced student who reads him will probably concur in the judgment of a modern critic that by giving us genuine pictures of men and women of his own age without moralizing over their vices and virtues he became the real founder of the modern novel smollett and stern tobias smollett seventeen twenty one seventeen seventy one apparently tried to carry on fielding's work but he lacked fielding's genius as well as his humor and inherent kindness and so crowded his pages with the horrors and brutalities which are sometimes mistaken for realism smollett was a physician of eccentric manners and ferocious instincts who developed his unnatural peculiarities by going as a surgeon on a battleship where he seems to have picked up all the evils of the navy and of the medical profession to use later in his novels smollett's novels his three best-known works are roderick random seventeen forty eight a series of adventures related by the hero peregrine pickle seventeen fifty one in which he reflects with brutal directness the worst of his experiences at sea and humphrey clinker seventeen seventy one his last work recounting the mild adventures of a welsh family in a journey through england and scotland this last alone can be generally read without arousing the reader's profound disgust without any particular ability he models his novels on don quixote and the result is simply a series of coarse adventures which are characteristic of the picaresque novel of his age were it not for the fact that he unconsciously imitates johnson's every man in his humor he would hardly be named among our writers of fiction but in seizing upon some grotesque habit or peculiarity and making a character out of it such as commodore trunnion in peregrine pickle matthew bramble in humphrey clinker and bowling in roderick random he laid the foundation for that exaggeration in portraying human eccentricities which finds a climax in dickens caricatures lawrence stern seventeen thirteen seventeen sixty eight has been compared to a little bronze satyr of antiquity in whose hollow body exquisite odors were stored that is true so far as the satyr is concerned for a more weazened unlovely personality would be hard to find the only question in the comparison is in regard to the character of the odors and that is a matter of taste in his work he is the reverse of smollett the latter being given over to coarse vulgarities which are often mistaken for realism the former to whims and vagaries and sentimental tears which frequently only disguise a sneer at human grief and pity stern's work the two books by which stern is remembered are tristram shandy and a sentimental journey through france and italy these are termed novels for the simple reason that we know not what else to call them 
the former was begun in his own words with no real idea of how it was to turn out its nine volumes published at intervals from seventeen sixty to seventeen sixty seven proceed in the most aimless way recording the experiences of the eccentric shandy family and the book was never finished its strength lies chiefly in its brilliant style the most remarkable of the age and in its odd characters like uncle toby and corporal trim which with all their eccentricities are so humanized by the author's genius that they belong among the great creations of our literature the sentimental journey is a curious combination of fiction sketches of travel miscellaneous essays on odd subjects all marked by the same brilliancy of style and all stamped with sterne's false attitudes towards everything in life many of his best passages were either adapted or taken bodily from burton rabelais and a score of other writers so that in reading sterne one is never quite sure how much is his own work though the mark of his grotesque genius is on every page the first novelists and their work with the publication of goldsmith's vicar of wakefield in seventeen sixty six the first series of english novels came to a suitable close of this work with its abundance of homely sentiment clustering about the family life as the most sacred of anglo-saxon institutions we have already spoken if we accept robinson crusoe as an adventure story the vicar of wakefield is the only novel of the period which can be freely recommended to all readers as giving an excellent idea of the new literary type which was perhaps more remarkable for its promise than for its achievement in the short space of twenty-five years there suddenly appeared and flourished a new form of literature which influenced all europe for nearly a century and which still furnishes the largest part of our literary enjoyment each successive novelist brought some new element to the work as when fielding supplied animal vigor and humor to richardson's analysis of a human heart and sterne added brilliancy and goldsmith emphasized purity and the honest domestic sentiments which are still the greatest ruling force among men so these early workers were like men engaged in carving a perfect cameo from the reverse side one works the profile another the eyes a third the mouth and the fine lines of character and not till the work is finished and the cameo turned do we see the complete human face and read its meaning such in a parable is the story of the english novel summary of the eighteenth century the period we are studying is included between the english revolution of sixteen eighty eight and the beginning of the french revolution of seventeen eighty nine historically the period begins in a remarkable way by the adoption of the bill of rights in sixteen eighty nine this famous bill was the third and final step in the establishment of constitutional government the first step being the great charter twelve fifteen and the second the petition of right sixteen twenty eight the modern form of cabinet government was established in the reign of george the first seventeen fourteen seventeen twenty seven the foreign prestige of england was strengthened by the victories of marlborough on the continent in the war of the spanish succession and the bounds of empire were enormously increased by clive in india by cook in australia and the islands of the pacific and by english victories over the french in canada and the mississippi valley during the seven years or french and indian wars politically the country was divided into whigs and tories the former seeking greater liberty for the people the latter upholding the king against popular government the continued strife between these two political parties had a direct and generally a harmful influence on literature as many of the great writers were used by the whig or tory party to advance its own interests and to satirize its enemies notwithstanding this perpetual strife of parties the age is remarkable for the rapid social development which soon expressed itself in literature 
clubs and coffee houses multiplied and the social life of these clubs resulted in better manners in a general feeling of toleration and especially in a kind of superficial elegance which showed itself in most of the prose and poetry of the period on the other hand the moral standard of the nation was very low bands of rowdies infested the city streets after nightfall bribery and corruption were the rule in politics and drunkenness was frightfully prevalent among all classes swift's degraded race of yahoos is a reflection of the degradation to be seen in multitudes of london saloons this low standard of morals emphasizes the importance of the great methodist revival under whitefield and wesley which began in the second quarter of the eighteenth century the literature of the century is remarkably complex but we may classify it all under three general heads the reign of so-called classicism the revival of romantic poetry and the beginning of the modern novel the first half of the century especially is an age of prose owing largely to the fact that the practical and social interests of the age demanded expression modern newspapers like the chronicle post and times and literary magazines like the tatler and spectator which began in this age greatly influenced the development of a serviceable prose style the poetry of the first half of the century as typified in pope was polished unimaginative formal and the closed couplet was in general use supplanting all other forms of verse both prose and poetry were too frequently satiric and satire does not tend to produce a high type of literature these tendencies in poetry were modified in the latter part of the century by the revival of romantic poetry in our study we have noted one the augustan or classic age the meaning of classicism the life and work of alexander pope the greatest poet of the age of jonathan swift the satirist of joseph addison the essayist of richard steele who was the original genius of the tatler and the spectator of samuel johnson who for nearly half a century was the dictator of english letters of james boswell who gave us the immortal life of johnson of edmund burke the greatest of english orators and of edward gibbon the historian famous for his decline and fall of the roman empire two the revival of romantic poetry the meaning of romanticism the life and work of thomas gray of oliver goldsmith famous as poet dramatist and novelist of william cowper of robert burns the greatest of scottish poets of william blake the mystic and the minor poets of the early romantic movement james thompson william collins george crabbe james mcpherson author of the ossian poems thomas chatterton the boy who originated the rowley papers and thomas percy whose work for literature was to collect the old ballads which he called the relics of ancient english poetry and to translate the stories of norse mythology in his northern antiquities three the first english novelists the meaning and history of the modern novel the life and work of daniel defoe author of robinson crusoe who is hardly to be called a novelist but whom we placed among the pioneers and the novels of richardson fielding smollett stern and goldsmith suggestive questions one describe briefly the social development of the eighteenth century what effect did this have on literature what accounts for the prevalence of prose what influence did the first newspapers exert on life and literature how do the readers of this age compare with those of the age of elizabeth two how do you explain the fact that satire was largely used in both prose and poetry name the principal satires of the age what is the chief object of satire of literature how do the two objects conflict three what is the meaning of the term classicism as applied to the literature of this age 
did the classicism of johnson for instance have any relation to classic literature in its true sense why is this period called the augustan age why was shakespeare not regarded by this age as a classical writer four pope in what respect is pope a unique writer tell briefly the story of his life what are his principal works how does he reflect the critical spirit of his age what are the chief characteristics of his poetry what do you find to copy in his style what is lacking in his poetry compare his subjects with those of burns of tennyson or milton for instance how would chaucer or burns tell the story of the rape of the lock what similarity do you find between pope's poetry and addison's prose five swift what is the general character of swift's work name his chief satires what is there to copy in his style does he ever strive for ornament or effect in writing compare swift's gulliver's travels with defoe's robinson crusoe in style purpose of writing and interest what resemblances do you find in these two contemporary writers can you explain the continued popularity of gulliver's travels six addison and steele what great work did addison and steele do for literature make a brief comparison between these two men having in mind their purpose humor knowledge of life and human sympathy as shown for instance in number one twelve and number two of the spectator essays compare their humor with that of swift how is their work a preparation for the novel seven johnson for what is dr johnson famous in literature can you explain his great influence compare his style with that of swift or defoe what are the remarkable elements in boswell's life of johnson write a description of an imaginary meeting of johnson goldsmith and boswell in a coffee-house eight burke for what is burke remarkable what great objects influenced him in the three periods of his life why has he been called a romantic poet who speaks in prose compare his use of imagery with that of other writers of the period what is there to copy and what is there to avoid in his style can you trace the influence of burke's american speeches on later english politics what similarities do you find between burke and milton as revealed in their prose works nine gibbon for what is gibbon worthy to be remembered why does he mark an epoch in historical writing what is meant by the scientific method of writing history compare gibbon's style with that of johnson contrast it with that of swift and also with that of some modern historian parkman for example ten what is meant by the term romanticism what are its chief characteristics how does it differ from classicism illustrate the meaning from the work of gray cowper or burns can you explain the prevalence of melancholy in romanticism eleven gray what are the chief works of gray can you explain the continued popularity of his elegy what romantic elements are found in his poetry what resemblances and what differences do you find in the works of gray and of goldsmith twelve goldsmith tell the story of goldsmith's life what are his chief works show from the deserted village the romantic and the so-called classic elements in his work what great work did he do for the early novel in the vicar of wakefield can you explain the popularity of she stoops to conquer name some of goldsmith's characters who have found a permanent place in our literature what personal reminiscences have you noted in the traveller the deserted village and she stoops to conquer thirteen cowper describe cowper's the task how does it show the romantic spirit give passages from john gilpin to illustrate cowper's humour fourteen burns tell the story of burns life some one has said the measure of a man's sin is the difference between what he is and what he might be comment upon this with reference to burns 
what is the general character of his poetry why is he called the poet of common men what subjects does he choose for his poetry compare him in this respect with pope what elements in the poet's character are revealed in such poems as to a mouse and to a mountain daisy how do burns and gray regard nature what poems show his sympathy with the french revolution and with democracy read the cotter's saturday night and explain its enduring interest can you explain the secret of burns great popularity fifteen blake what are the characteristics of blake's poetry can you explain why blake though the greatest poetic genius of the age is so little appreciated sixteen percy in what respect did percy's relics influence the romantic movement what are the defects in his collection of ballads can you explain why such a crude poem as chevy chase should be popular with an age that delighted in pope's essay on man seventeen macpherson what is meant by macpherson's ocean can you account for the remarkable success of the oceanic forgeries eighteen chatterton tell the story of chatterton and the rowley poems read chatterton's bristow tragedy and compare it in style and interest with the old ballads like the battle of otterburn or the hunting of the cheviot all in manley's english poetry nineteen the first novelists what is meant by the modern novel how does it differ from the early romance and from the adventure story what are some of the precursors of the novel what was the purpose of stories modeled after don quixote what is the significance of pamela what elements did fielding add to the novel what good work did goldsmith's vicar of wakefield accomplish compare goldsmith in this respect with steele and addison chronology end of seventeenth and the eighteenth century history sixteen eighty nine william and mary seventeen hundred question mark beginning of london clubs seventeen o two anne death seventeen fourteen seventeen o four battle of blenheim seventeen o seven union of england and scotland seventeen fourteen george the first death seventeen twenty seven seventeen twenty one cabinet government walpole first prime minister seventeen twenty seven george the second death seventeen sixty seventeen thirty eight rise of methodism seventeen forty war of austrian succession seventeen forty six jacobite rebellion seventeen fifty seventeen fifty seven conquest of india seventeen fifty six war with france seventeen fifty nine wolf at quebec seventeen sixty george the third death eighteen twenty seventeen sixty five stamp act seventeen seventy three boston tea party seventeen seventy four howard's prison reforms seventeen seventy five american revolution seventeen seventy six declaration of independence seventeen eighty three treaty of paris seventeen eighty six trial of warren hastings seventeen eighty nine seventeen ninety nine french revolution seventeen ninety three war with france literature sixteen eighty three seventeen nineteen defoe's early writings bill of rights toleration act sixteen ninety five press made free war of spanish succession seventeen o two first daily newspaper seventeen o four addison's the campaign swift's tale of a tub seventeen o nine the tatler johnson born died seventeen eighty four seventeen ten seventeen thirteen swift in london journal to stella 
seventeen eleven the spectator seventeen twelve pope's rape of the lock seventeen nineteen robinson crusoe seventeen twenty six gulliver's travels seventeen twenty six seventeen thirty thompson's the seasons seventeen thirty two seventeen thirty four essay on man seventeen forty richardson's pamela seventeen forty two fielding's joseph andrews seventeen forty nine fielding's tom jones seventeen fifty seventeen fifty two johnson's the rambler seventeen fifty one gray's elegy seventeen fifty five johnson's dictionary seventeen sixty seventeen sixty seven sterne's tristram shandy seventeen sixty four johnson's literary club seventeen sixty five percy's relics seventeen sixty six goldsmith's vicar of wakefield seventeen seventy goldsmith's deserted village seventeen seventy one beginning of great newspapers seventeen seventy four seventeen seventy five burke's american speeches seventeen seventy six seventeen eighty eight gibbons rome seventeen seventy nine cowper's only hymns seventeen seventy nine eighty one johnson's lives of the poets seventeen eighty three blake's poetical sketches seventeen eighty five cowper's the task the london times seventeen eighty six burns first poems the kilmarnock burns burke's warren hastings seventeen ninety burke's french revolution seventeen ninety one boswell's life of johnson end of section forty end of chapter nine section forty one of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the age of romanticism eighteen hundred to eighteen fifty the second creative period of english literature the first half of the nineteenth century records the triumph of romanticism in literature and of democracy in government and the two movements are so closely associated in so many nations and in so many periods of history that one must wonder if there be not some relation of cause and effect between them just as we understand the tremendous energizing influence of puritanism in the matter of english liberty by remembering that the common people had begun to read and that their book was the bible so we may understand this age of popular government by remembering that the chief subject of romantic literature was the essential nobleness of common men and the value of the individual as we read now that brief portion of history which lies between the declaration of independence seventeen seventy six and the english reform bill of eighteen thirty two we are in the presence of such mighty political upheavals that the age of revolution is the only name by which we can adequately characterize it its great historic movements become intelligible only when we read what was written in this period for the french revolution and the american commonwealth as well as the establishment of a true democracy in england by the reform bill were the inevitable results of ideas which literature had spread rapidly through the civilized world liberty is fundamentally an ideal and that ideal beautiful inspiring compelling as a loved banner in the wind was kept steadily before men's minds by a multitude of books and pamphlets as far apart as burns poems and thomas paine's rights of man 
all read eagerly by the common people all proclaiming the dignity of common life and all uttering the same passionate cry against every form of class or caste oppression first the dream the ideal in some human soul then the written word which proclaims it and impresses other minds with its truth and beauty then the united and determined effort of men to make the dream a reality that seems to be a fair estimate of the part that literature plays even in our political progress historical summary the period we are considering begins in the latter half of the reign of george the third and ends with the accession of victoria in eighteen thirty seven when on a foggy morning in november seventeen eighty three king george entered the house of lords and in a trembling voice recognized the independence of the united states of america he unconsciously proclaimed the triumph of that free government by free men which has been the ideal of english literature for more than a thousand years though it was not till eighteen thirty two when the reform bill became the law of the land that england herself learned the lesson taught her by america and became the democracy of which her writers had always dreamed the french revolution the half-century between these two events is one of great turmoil yet of steady advance in every department of english life the storm centre of the political unrest was the french revolution that frightful uprising which proclaimed the natural rights of man and the abolition of class distinctions its effect on the whole civilized world is beyond computation patriotic clubs and societies multiplied in england all asserting the doctrine of liberty equality fraternity the watchwords of the revolution young england led by pitt the younger hailed the new french republic and offered it friendship old england which pardons no revolutions but her own looked with horror on the turmoil in france and misled by burke and the nobles of the realm forced the two nations into war even pitt saw a blessing in this at first because the sudden zeal for fighting a foreign nation which by some horrible perversion is generally called patriotism might turn men's thoughts from their own to their neighbors affairs and so prevent a threatened revolution at home economic conditions the causes of this threatened revolution were not political but economic by her invention in steel and machinery and by her monopoly of the carrying trade england had become the workshop of the world her wealth had increased beyond her wildest dreams but the unequal distribution of that wealth was a spectacle to make angels weep the invention of machinery at first threw thousands of skilled hand workers out of employment in order to protect a few agriculturists heavy duties were imposed on corn and wheat and bread rose to famine prices just when laboring men had the least money to pay for it there followed a curious spectacle while england increased in wealth and spent vast sums to support her army and subsidize her allies in europe and while nobles landowners manufacturers and merchants lived in increasing luxury a multitude of skilled laborers were clamoring for work fathers sent their wives and little children into the mines and factories where sixteen hours labor would hardly pay for the daily bread and in every large city were riotous mobs made up chiefly of hungry men and women it was this unbearable economic condition and not any political theory as burke supposed which occasioned the danger of another english revolution it is only when we remember these conditions that we can understand two books adam smith's wealth of nations and thomas paine's rights of man which can hardly be considered as literature but which exercised an enormous influence in england smith was a scottish thinker who wrote to uphold the doctrine that labor is the only source of a nation's wealth 
and that any attempt to force labor into unnatural channels or to prevent it by protective duties from freely obtaining the raw materials for its industry is unjust and destructive pain was a curious combination of jekyll and hyde shallow and untrustworthy personally but with a passionate devotion to popular liberty his rights of man published in london in seventeen ninety one was like one of burns lyric outcries against institutions which oppressed humanity coming so soon after the destruction of the bastille it added fuel to the flames kindled in england by the french revolution the author was driven out of the country on the curious ground that he endangered the english constitution but not until his book had gained a wide sale and influence reforms all these dangers real and imaginary passed away when england turned from the affairs of france to remedy her own economic conditions the long continental war came to an end with napoleon's overthrow at waterloo in eighteen fifteen and england having gained enormously in prestige abroad now turned to the work of reform at home the destruction of the african slave trade the mitigation of horribly unjust laws which included poor debtors and petty criminals in the same class the prevention of child labor the freedom of the press the extension of manhood suffrage the abolition of restrictions against catholics in parliament the establishment of hundreds of popular schools under the leadership of andrew bell and joseph lancaster these are but a few of the reforms which mark the progress of civilization in a single half century when england in eighteen thirty three proclaimed the emancipation of all slaves in all her colonies she unconsciously proclaimed her final emancipation from barbarism romantic enthusiasm literary characteristics of the age it is intensely interesting to note how literature at first reflected the political turmoil of the age and then when the turmoil was over and england began her mighty work of reform how literature suddenly developed a new creative spirit which shows itself in the poetry of wordsworth coleridge byron shelley keats and in the prose of scott jane austen lamb and de quincey a wonderful group of writers whose patriotic enthusiasm suggests the elizabethan days and whose genius has caused their age to be known as the second creative period of our literature thus in the early days when old institutions seemed crumbling with the bastille coleridge and southey formed their youthful scheme of pantisocracy on the banks of the susquehanna and ideal commonwealth in which the principles of moore's utopia should be put in practice even wordsworth fired with political enthusiasm could write bliss was it in that dawn to be alive but to be young was very heaven the essence of romanticism was it must be remembered that literature must reflect all that is spontaneous and unaffected in nature and in man and be free to follow its own fancy in its own way we have already noted this characteristic in the work of the elizabethan dramatists who followed their own genius in opposition to all the laws of the critics in coleridge we see this independence expressed in kubla khan and the ancient mariner two dream pictures one of the populous orient the other of the lonely sea in wordsworth this literary independence led him inward to the heart of common things following his own instinct as shakespeare does he too finds tongues in trees books in the running brooks sermons in stones and good in everything and so more than any other writer of the age he invests the common life of nature and the souls of common men and women with glorious significance 
these two poets coleridge and wordsworth best represent the romantic genius of the age in which they lived though scott had a greater literary reputation and byron and shelley had larger audiences an age of poetry the second characteristic of this age is that it is emphatically an age of poetry the previous century with its practical outlook on life was largely one of prose but now as in the elizabethan age the young enthusiasts turned as naturally to poetry as a happy man to singing the glory of the age is in the poetry of scott wordsworth coleridge byron shelley keats moore and southey of its prose works those of scott alone have attained a very wide reading though the essays of charles lamb and the novels of jane austen have slowly won for their authors a secure place in the history of our literature coleridge and southey who with wordsworth form the trio of so-called lake poets wrote far more prose than poetry and southey's prose is much better than his verse it was characteristic of the spirit of this age so different from our own that southey could say that in order to earn money he wrote in verse what would otherwise have been better written in prose women as novelists it was during this period that woman assumed for the first time an important place in our literature probably the chief reason for this interesting phenomenon lies in the fact that woman was for the first time given some slight chance of education of entering into the intellectual life of the race and as is always the case when woman is given anything like a fair opportunity she responded magnificently a secondary reason may be found in the nature of the age itself which was intensely emotional the french revolution stirred all europe to its depths and during the following half century every great movement in literature as in politics and religion was characterized by strong emotion which is all the more noticeable by contrast with the cold formal satiric spirit of the early eighteenth century as woman is naturally more emotional than man it may well be that the spirit of this emotional age attracted her and gave her the opportunity to express herself in literature as all strong emotions tend to extremes the age produced a new type of novel which seems rather hysterical now but which in its own day delighted multitudes of readers whose nerves were somewhat excited and who reveled in bogey stories of supernatural terror mrs anne radcliffe seventeen sixty four eighteen twenty three was one of the most successful writers of this school of exaggerated romance her novels with their azure-eyed heroines haunted castles trap-doors bandits abductions rescues in the nick of time and a general medley of overwrought joys and horrors note mrs radcliffe's best work is the mysteries of udolpho this is the story of a tender heroine shut up in a gloomy castle over her broods the terrible shadow of an ancestor's crime there are the usual goose-flesh accompaniments of haunted rooms secret doors sliding panels mysterious figures behind old pictures and a subterranean passage leading to a vault dark and creepy as a tomb here the heroine finds a chest with blood-stained papers by the light of a flickering candle she reads with chills and shivering the record of long-buried crimes at the psychological moment the little candle suddenly goes out then out of the darkness a cold clammy hand Ugh! foolish as such stories seem to us now they show first a wild reaction from the skepticism of the preceding age and second a development of the medieval romance of adventure only the adventure is here inward rather than outward it faces a ghost instead of a dragon and for this work a nun with her beads is better than a knight in armor 
so heroines abound instead of heroes the age was too educated for medieval monsters and magic but not educated enough to reject ghosts and other bogies end of note were immensely popular not only with the crowd of novel readers but also with the men of unquestioned literary genius like scott and byron in marked contrast to these extravagant stories is the enduring work of jane austen with her charming descriptions of everyday life and of maria edgeworth whose wonderful pictures of irish life suggested to walter scott the idea of writing his scottish romances two other women who attained a more or less lasting fame were hannah moore poet dramatist and novelist and jane porter whose scottish chiefs and thaddeus of warsaw are still in demand in our libraries besides these were fanny burney parentheses madame d'arblay and several other writers whose works in the early part of the nineteenth century raised woman to the high place in literature which she has ever since maintained the modern magazines in this age literary criticism became firmly established by the appearance of such magazines as the edinburgh review eighteen o two the quarterly review eighteen o eight blackwood's magazine eighteen seventeen the westminster review eighteen twenty four the spectator eighteen twenty eight the athenium eighteen twenty eight the fraser's magazine eighteen thirty these magazines edited by such men as francis jeffrey john wilson who is known to us as christopher north and john gibson lockhart who gave us the life of scott exercised an immense influence on all subsequent literature at first their criticisms were largely destructive as when jeffrey hammered scott wordsworth and byron most unmercifully and lockhart could find no good in either keats or tennyson but with added wisdom criticism assumed its true function of construction and when these magazines began to seek and to publish the works of unknown writers like hazlitt lamb and leigh hunt they discovered the chief mission of the modern magazine which is to give every writer of ability the opportunity to make his work known to the world End of section 41section forty two of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued part one the poets of romanticism william wordsworth seventeen seventy eighteen fifty it was in seventeen ninety seven that the new romantic movement in our literature assumed definite form wordsworth and coleridge retired to the quantock hills somerset and there formed the deliberate purpose to make literature adapted to interest mankind permanently which they declared classic poetry could never do helping the two poets was wordsworth's sister dorothy with a woman's love for flowers and all beautiful things and a woman's divine sympathy for human life even in its lowliest forms though a silent partner she furnished perhaps the largest share of the inspiration which resulted in the famous lyrical ballads of seventeen ninety eight in their partnership coleridge was to take up the supernatural or at least romantic while wordsworth was to give charm of novelty to things of every day by awakening the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and the wonders of the world before us the whole spirit of their work is reflected in two poems of this remarkable little volume the rhyme of the ancient mariner which is coleridge's masterpiece and lines written a few miles above tintern abbey which expresses wordsworth's poetical creed and which is one of the noblest and most significant of our poems that the lyrical ballads attracted no attention note the lyrical ballads were better appreciated in america than in england 
the first edition was printed here in eighteen o two end of note and was practically ignored by a public that would soon go into raptures over byron's child harold and don juan is of small consequence many men will hurry a mile to see skyrockets who never notice orion and the pleiades from their own doorstep had wordsworth and coleridge written only this one little book they would still be among the representative writers of an age that proclaimed the final triumph of romanticism life of wordsworth to understand the life of him who in tennyson's words uttered nothing base it is well to read first the prelude which records the impressions made upon wordsworth's mind from his earliest recollection until his full manhood in eighteen o five when the poem was completed note the prelude was not published till after wordsworth's death nearly a half century later End of note outwardly his long and uneventful life divides itself naturally into four periods one his childhood and youth in the cumberland hills from seventeen seventy to seventeen eighty seven two a period of uncertainty of storm and stress including his university life at cambridge his travels abroad and his revolutionary experience from seventeen eighty seven to seventeen ninety seven three a short but significant period of finding himself and his work from seventeen ninety seven to seventeen ninety nine four a long period of retirement in the northern lake region where he was born and where for a full half century he lived so close to nature that her influence is reflected in all his poetry when one has outlined these four periods he has told almost all that can be told of a life which is marked not by events but largely by spiritual experiences wordsworth was born in seventeen seventy at cockermouth cumberland where the derwent fairest of all rivers loved to blend his murmurs with my nurse's song and from his alder shades and rocky falls and from his fords and shallows sent a voice that flowed along my dreams it is almost a shock to one who knows wordsworth only by his calm and noble poetry to read that he was of a moody and violent temper and that his mother despaired of him alone among her five children she died when he was but eight years old but not till she had exerted an influence which lasted all his life so that he could remember her as the heart of all our learnings and our loves the father died some six years later and the orphan was taken in charge by relatives who sent him to school at hawkshead in the beautiful lake region here apparently the unroofed school of nature attracted him more than the discipline of the classics and he learned more eagerly from the flowers and hills and stars than from his books but one must read wordsworth's own record in the prelude to appreciate this three things in this poem must impress even the casual reader first wordsworth loves to be alone and is never lonely with nature second like every other child who spends much time alone in the woods and fields he feels the presence of some living spirit real though unseen and companionable though silent third his impressions are exactly like our own and delightfully familiar when he tells of the long summer day spent in swimming basking in the sun and questing over the hills or of the winter night when on his skates he chased the reflection of a star in the black ice or of his exploring the lake in a boat and getting suddenly frightened when the world grew big and strange in all this he is simply recalling a multitude of our own vague happy memories of childhood he goes out into the woods at night to tend his woodcock snares he runs across another boy's snares follows them finds a woodcock caught takes it hurries away through the night and then i heard among the solitary hills low breathings coming after me and sounds of undistinguishable motion 
that is like a mental photograph any boy who has come home through the woods at night will recognize it instantly again he tells as of going birds nesting on the cliffs oh when i have hung above the raven's nest by knots of grass and half-inch fissures in the slippery rock but ill-sustained and almost so it seemed suspended by the blast that blew amain shouldering the naked crag oh at that time while on the perilous ridge i hung alone with what strange utterance did the loud dry wind blow through my ear the sky seemed not a sky of earth and with what motion moved the clouds no man can read such records without finding his own boyhood again and his own abounding joy of life in the poet's early impressions the second period of wordsworth's life begins with his university course at cambridge in seventeen eighty seven in the third book of the prelude we find a dispassionate account of student life with its trivial occupations its pleasures and general aimlessness wordsworth proved to be a very ordinary scholar following his own genius rather than the curriculum and looking forward more eagerly to his vacation among the hills than to his examinations perhaps the most interesting thing in his life at cambridge was his fellowship with the young political enthusiasts whose spirit is expressed in his remarkable poem on the french revolution a poem which is better than a volume of history to show the hopes and ambitions that stirred all europe in the first days of that mighty upheaval wordsworth made two trips to france in seventeen ninety and seventeen ninety one seeing things chiefly through the rosy spectacles of the young oxford republicans on his second visit he joined the girondists or the moderate republicans and only the decision of his relatives who cut off his allowance and hurried him back to england prevented his going headlong to the guillotine with the leaders of his party two things rapidly cooled wordsworth's revolutionary enthusiasm and ended the only dramatic interest of his placid life one was the excesses of the revolution itself and especially the execution of louis the sixteenth the other was the rise of napoleon and the slavish adulation accorded by france to this most vulgar and dangerous of tyrants his coolness soon grew to disgust and opposition as shown by his subsequent poems and this brought upon him the censure of shelley byron and other extremists though it gained the friendship of scott who from the first had no sympathy with the revolution or with the young english enthusiasts of the decisive period of wordsworth's life when he was living with his sister dorothy and with coleridge at alfoxton we have already spoken the importance of this decision to give himself to poetry is evident when we remember that at thirty years of age he was without money or any definite aim or occupation in life he considered the law but confessed he had no sympathy for its contradictory precepts and practices he considered the ministry but though strongly inclined to the church he felt himself not good enough for the sacred office once he had wanted to be a soldier and serve his country but had wavered at the prospect of dying of disease in a foreign land and throwing away his life without glory or profit to anybody an apparent accident which looks more to us like a special providence determined his course he had taken care of a young friend raisley calvert who died of consumption and left wordsworth heir to a few hundred pounds and to the request that he should give his life to poetry it was this unexpected gift which enabled wordsworth to retire from the world and follow his genius all his life he was poor and lived in an atmosphere of plain living and high thinking his poetry brought him almost nothing in the way of money rewards and it was only by a series of happy accidents that he was enabled to continue his work 
one of these accidents was that he became a tory and soon accepted the office of a distributor of stamps and was later appointed poet laureate by the government which occasioned browning's famous but ill-considered poem of the lost leader just for a handful of silver he left us just for a ribbon to stick in his coat the last half-century of wordsworth's life in which he retired to his beloved lake district and lived successively at grasmere and rydal mount remind one strongly of browning's long struggle for literary recognition it was marked by the same steadfast purpose the same trusted ideal the same continuous work and the same tardy recognition by the public his poetry was mercilessly ridiculed by nearly all the magazine critics who seized upon the worst of his work as a standard of judgment and book after book of poems appeared without meeting any success save the approval of a few loyal friends without doubt or impatience he continued his work trusting to the future to recognize and approve it his attitude here reminds one strongly of the poor old soldier whom he met in the hills note the prelude book four end of note who refused to beg or to mention his long service or the neglect of his country saying with noble simplicity my trust is in the god of heaven and in the eye of him who passes me such work and patience are certain of their reward and long before wordsworth's death he felt the warm sunshine of general approval the wave of popular enthusiasm for scott and byron passed by as their limitations were recognized and wordsworth was hailed by critics as the first living poet and one of the greatest that england had ever produced on the death of southey eighteen forty three he was made poet laureate against his own inclination the late excessive praise left him quite as unmoved as the first excessive neglect the steady decline in the quality of his work is due not as might be expected to self-satisfaction at success but rather to his intense conservatism to his living too much alone and failing to test his work by the standards and judgment of other literary men he died tranquilly in eighteen fifty at the age of eighty years and was buried in the churchyard at grasmere such is the brief outward record of the world's greatest interpreter of nature's message and only one who is acquainted with both nature and the poet can realize how inadequate is any biography for the best thing about wordsworth must always remain unsaid it is a comfort to know that his life noble sincere heroically happy never contradicted his message poetry was his life his soul was in all his work and only by reading what he has written can we understand the man the poetry of wordsworth there is often a sense of disappointment when one reads wordsworth for the first time and this leads us to speak first of two difficulties which may easily prevent a just appreciation of the poet's worth the first difficulty is in the reader who is often puzzled by wordsworth's absolute simplicity we are so used to stage effects in poetry that beauty unadorned is apt to escape our notice like wordsworth's lucy a violet by a mossy stone half hidden from the eye fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky wordsworth set himself to the task of freeing poetry from all its conceits of speaking the language of simple truth and of portraying man and nature as they are and in this good work we are apt to miss the beauty the passion the intensity that hide themselves under his simplest lines the second difficulty is in the poet not in the reader it must be confessed that wordsworth is not always melodious that he is seldom graceful and only occasionally inspired when he is inspired few poets can be compared with him 
at other times the bulk of his verse is so wooden and prosy that we wonder how a poet could have written it moreover he is absolutely without humor and so he often fails to see the small step that separates the sublime from the ridiculous in no other way can we explain the idiot boy or pardon the serious absurdity of peter bell and his grieving jackass poems of nature on account of these difficulties it is well to avoid at first the longer works and begin with a good book of selections note dowden's selections from wordsworth is the best of many such collections see selections for reading and bibliography at the end of this chapter end of note when we read these exquisite shorter poems with their noble lines that live forever in our memory we realize that wordsworth is the greatest poet of nature that our literature has produced if we go further and study the poems that impress us we shall find four remarkable characteristics one wordsworth is sensitive as a barometer to every subtle change in the world about him in the prelude he compares himself to an aeolian harp which answers with harmony to every touch of the wind and the figure is strikingly accurate as well as interesting for there is hardly a sight or a sound from a violet to a mountain and from a bird note to the thunder of the cataract that is not reflected in some beautiful way in wordsworth's poetry Two of all the poets who have written of nature there is none that compares with him in the truthfulness of his representation burns like gray is apt to read his own emotions into natural objects so that there is more of the poet than of nature even in his mouse and mountain daisy but wordsworth gives you the bird and the flower the wind and the tree and the river just as they are and is content to let them speak their own message three no other poet ever found such abundant beauty in the common world he had not only sight but insight that is he not only sees clearly and describes accurately but penetrates to the heart of things and always finds some exquisite meaning that is not written on the surface it is idle to specify or to quote lines on flowers or stars on snow or vapor nothing is ugly or commonplace in his world on the contrary there is hardly one natural phenomenon which he has not glorified by pointing out some beauty that was hidden from our eyes for it is the life of nature which is everywhere recognized not mere growth and cell changes but sentient personal life and the recognition of this personality in nature characterizes all the world's great poetry in his childhood wordsworth regarded natural objects the streams the hills the flowers even the winds as his companions and with his mature belief that all nature is the reflection of the living god it was inevitable that his poetry should thrill with the sense of a spirit that rolls through all things cowper burns keats tennyson all these poets give you the outward aspects of nature in varying degrees but wordsworth gives you her very life and the impression of some personal living spirit that meets and accompanies the man who goes alone through the woods and fields we shall hardly find even in the philosophy of leibniz or in the nature myths of our indians any such impression of living nature as this poet awakens in us and that suggests another delightful characteristic of wordsworth's poetry namely that he seems to awaken rather than create an impression he stirs our memory deeply so that in reading him we live once more in the vague beautiful wonderland of our own childhood poems of human life such is the philosophy of wordsworth's nature poetry if we search now for his philosophy of human life we shall find four more doctrines which rest upon his basal conception that man is not apart from nature but is the very life of her life one 
in childhood man is sensitive as a wind harp to all natural influences he is an epitome of the gladness and beauty of the world wordsworth explains this gladness and this sensitiveness to nature by the doctrine that the child comes straight from the creator of nature our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting the soul that rises with us our life's star hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness but trailing clouds of glory do we come from god who is our home in this exquisite ode which he calls intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood eighteen o seven wordsworth sums up his philosophy of childhood and he may possibly be indebted here to the poet vaughan who more than a century before had proclaimed in the retreat the same doctrine this kinship with nature and with god which glorifies childhood ought to extend through a man's whole life and ennoble it this is the teaching of tintern abbey in which the best part of our life is shown to be the result of natural influences according to wordsworth society and the crowded unnatural life of cities tend to weaken and pervert humanity and a return to natural and simple living is the only remedy for human wretchedness two the natural instincts and pleasures of childhood are the true standards of a man's happiness in this life all artificial pleasures soon grow tiresome the natural pleasures which a man so easily neglects in his work are the chief means by which we may expect permanent and increasing joy in tintern abbey the rainbow ode to duty and intimations of immortality we see this plain teaching but we can hardly read one of wordsworth's pages without finding it slipped in unobtrusively like the fragrance of a wild flower three the truth of humanity that is the common life which labors and loves and shares the general heritage of smiles and tears is the only subject of permanent literary interest burns and the early poets of the revival began the good work of showing the romantic interest of common life and wordsworth continued it in michael the solitary reaper to a highland girl stepping westward the excursion and a score of lesser poems joy and sorrow not of princes or heroes but in widest commonality spread are his themes and the hidden purpose of many of his poems is to show that the keynote of all life is happiness not an occasional thing the result of chance or circumstance but a heroic thing to be won as one would win any other success by work and patience for to this natural philosophy of man wordsworth adds a mystic element the result of his own belief that in every natural object there is a reflection of the living god nature is everywhere transfused and illumined by spirit man also is a reflection of the divine spirit and we shall never understand the emotions roused by a flower or a sunset until we learn that nature appeals through the eye of man to his inner spirit in a word nature must be spiritually discerned in tintern abbey the spiritual appeal of nature is expressed in almost every line but the mystic conception of man is seen more clearly in intimations of immortality which emerson calls the high water mark of poetry in the nineteenth century in this last splendid ode wordsworth adds to his spiritual interpretation of nature and man the alluring doctrine of pre-existence which has appealed so powerfully to hindu and greek in turn and which makes of human life a continuous immortal thing without end or beginning the recluse 
wordsworth's longer poems since they contain much that is prosy and uninteresting may well be left till after we have read the odes sonnets and short descriptive poems that have made him famous as showing a certain heroic cast of wordsworth's mind it is interesting to learn that the greater part of his work including the prelude and the excursion was intended for a place in a single great poem to be called the recluse which should treat of nature man and society the prelude treating of the growth of a poet's mind was to introduce the work the home at grasmere which is the first book of the recluse was not published till eighteen eighty eight long after the poet's death the excursion eighteen fourteen is the second book of the recluse and the third was never completed though wordsworth intended to include most of his shorter poems in this third part and so make an immense personal epic of a poet's life and work it is perhaps just as well that the work remained unfinished the best of his work appeared in the lyrical ballads seventeen ninety eight and in the sonnets odes and lyrics of the next ten years though the dudden sonnets eighteen twenty to a skylark eighteen twenty five and yarrow revisited eighteen thirty one show that he retained till past sixty much of his youthful enthusiasm in his later years however he perhaps wrote too much his poetry like his prose becomes dull and unimaginative and we miss the flashes of insight the tender memories of childhood and the recurrence of noble lines each one a poem that constitutes the surprise and the delight of reading wordsworth the outward shows of sky and earth of hill and valley he has viewed and impulses of deeper birth have come to him in solitude in common things that round us lie some random truths he can impart the harvest of a quiet eye that broods and sleeps on his own heart End of section forty two Section forty three of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter ten continued. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, seventeen seventy two, eighteen thirty four. A grief without a pang, void, dark, and drear, a stifled, drowsy, unimpassioned grief, which finds no natural outlet, no relief in word or sigh or tear in the wonderful ode to dejection from which the above fragment is taken we have a single strong impression of coleridge's whole life a sad broken tragic life in marked contrast with the peaceful existence of his friend wordsworth for himself during the greater part of his life the poet had only grief and remorse as his portion but for everybody else for the audiences that were charmed by the brilliancy of his literary lectures for the friends who gathered about him to be inspired by his ideals and conversations and for all his readers who found unending delight in the little volume which holds his poetry he had and still has a cheering message full of beauty and hope and inspiration such is coleridge a man of grief who makes the world glad life in seventeen seventy two there lived in ottery st mary devonshire a queer little man the reverend john coleridge vicar of the parish church and master of the local grammar school in the former capacity he preached profound sermons quoting to open-mouthed rustics long passages from the hebrew which he told them was the very tongue of the holy ghost in the latter capacity he wrote for his boys a new latin grammar to mitigate some of the difficulties of traversing that terrible jungle by means of ingenious bypaths and shortcuts for instance when his boys found the ablative a somewhat difficult case to understand he told them to think of it as the 
quale quare quiditive case which of course makes its meaning perfectly clear in both these capacities the elder coleridge was a sincere man gentle and kindly whose memory was like a religion to his sons and daughters in that same year was born samuel taylor coleridge the youngest of thirteen children he was an extraordinarily precocious child who could read at three years of age and who before he was five had read the bible and the arabian nights and could remember an astonishing amount from both books from three to six he attended a dame school and from six till nine when his father died and left the family destitute he was in his father's school learning the classics reading an enormous quantity of english books avoiding novels and delighting in cumbrous theological and metaphysical treatises at ten he was sent to the charity school of christ's hospital london where he met charles lamb who records his impression of the place and of coleridge in one of his famous essays note see christ's hospital five and thirty years ago in essays of elia End of note coleridge seems to have remained in this school for seven or eight years without visiting his home a poor neglected boy whose comforts and entertainments were all within himself just as when a little child he used to wander over the fields with a stick in his hand slashing the tops from weeds and thistles and thinking himself to be the mighty champion of christendom against the infidels so now he would lie on the roof of the school forgetting the play of his fellows and the roar of the london streets watching the white clouds drifting over and following them in spirit into all sorts of romantic adventures at nineteen this hopeless dreamer who had read more books than an old professor entered cambridge as a charity student he remained for nearly three years then ran away because of a trifling debt and enlisted in the dragoons where he served several months before he was discovered and brought back to the university he left in seventeen ninety four without taking his degree and presently we find him with the youthful southey a kindred spirit who had been fired to wild enthusiasm by the french revolution founding his famous pantisocracy for the regeneration of human society the fall of robespierre a poem composed by the two enthusiasts is full of the new revolutionary spirit the pantisocracy on the banks of the susquehanna was to be an ideal community in which the citizens combined farming and literature the work was to be limited to two hours each day moreover each member of the community was to marry a good woman and take her with him the two poets obeyed the latter injunction first marrying two sisters and then found that they had no money to pay even their travelling expenses to the new utopia during all the rest of his career a tragic weakness of will takes possession of coleridge making it impossible for him with all his genius and learning to hold himself steady to any one work or purpose he studied in germany worked as a private secretary till the drudgery wore upon his free spirit then he went to rome and remained for two years lost in study later he started the friend a paper devoted to truth and liberty lectured on poetry and the fine arts to enraptured audiences in london until his frequent failures to meet his engagements scattered his hearers was offered an excellent position and a half interest amounting to some two thousand pounds in the morning post and the courier but declined it saying that i would not give up the country and the lazy reading of old folios for two thousand times two thousand pounds in short that beyond three hundred and fifty pounds a year i considered money a real evil his family meanwhile was almost entirely neglected he lived apart following his own way and the wife and children were left in charge of his friend southey 
needing money he was on the point of becoming a unitarian minister when a small pension from two friends enabled him to live for a few years without regular employment a terrible shadow in coleridge's life was the apparent cause of most of his dejection in early life he suffered from neuralgia and to ease the pain began to use opiates the result on such a temperament was almost inevitable he became a slave to the drug habit his naturally weak will lost all its directing and sustaining force until after fifteen years of pain and struggle and despair he gave up and put himself in charge of a physician one mr gilman of highgate carlyle who visited him at this time calls him a king of men but records that he gave you the idea of a life that had been full of sufferings a life heavy laden half vanquished still swimming painfully in seas of manifold physical and other bewilderment the shadow is dark indeed but there are gleams of sunshine that occasionally break through the clouds one of these is his association with wordsworth and his sister dorothy in the quantock hills out of which came the famous lyrical ballads of seventeen ninety eight another was his loyal devotion to poetry for its own sake with the exception of his tragedy remorse which through byron's influence was accepted at drury lane theatre and for which he was paid four hundred pounds he received almost nothing for his poetry indeed he seems not to have desired it for he says poetry has been to me its own exceeding great reward it has soothed my afflictions it has multiplied and refined my enjoyments it has endeared solitude and it has given me the habit of wishing to discover the good and the beautiful in all that meets and surrounds me one can better understand his exquisite verse after such a declaration a third ray of sunlight came from the admiration of his contemporaries for though he wrote comparatively little he was by his talents and learning a leader among literary men and his conversations were as eagerly listened to as were those of dr johnson wordsworth says of him that though other men of the age had done some wonderful things coleridge was the only wonderful man he had ever known of his lectures on literature a contemporary says his words seemed to flow as from a person repeating with grace and energy some delightful poem and of his conversation it is recorded throughout a long-drawn summer's day would this man talk to you in low equable but clear and musical tones concerning things human and divine marshalling all history harmonizing all experiment probing the depths of your consciousness and revealing visions of glory and terror to the imagination the last bright ray of sunlight comes from coleridge's own soul from the gentle kindly nature which made men love and respect him in spite of his weakness and which caused lamb to speak of him humorously as an archangel a little damaged the universal law of suffering seems to be that it refines and softens humanity and coleridge was no exception to the law in his poetry we find a note of human sympathy more tender and profound than can be found in wordsworth or indeed in any other of the great english poets even in his later poems when he has lost his first inspiration and something of the splendid imaginative power that makes his work equal to the best of blake's we find a soul tender triumphant quiet in the stillness of a great peace he died in eighteen thirty four and was buried in highgate church the last stanza of the boatman's song in remorse serves better to express the world's judgment than any epitaph hark the cadence dies away on the quiet moonlit sea the boatmen rest their oars and say misere domini works of coleridge the works of coleridge naturally divide themselves into three classes the poetic the critical and the philosophical corresponding to the early the middle and the later periods of his career of his poetry stopford brooke well says 
all that he did excellently might be bound up in twenty pages but it should be bound in pure gold his early poems show the influence of gray and blake especially of the latter when coleridge begins his daydream with the line my eyes make pictures when they're shut we recall instantly blake's haunting songs of innocence but there is this difference between the two poets in blake we have only a dreamer in coleridge we have the rare combination of the dreamer and the profound scholar the quality of this early poetry with its strong suggestion of blake may be seen in such poems as a daydream the devil's thoughts the suicide's argument and the wanderings of cain his later poems wherein we see his imagination bridled by thought and study but still running very freely may best be appreciated in kubla khan christabel and the rhyme of the ancient mariner it is difficult to criticize such poems one can only read them and wonder at their melody and at the vague suggestions which they conjure up in the mind kubla khan is a fragment painting a gorgeous oriental dream picture such as one might see in an october sunset the whole poem came to coleridge one morning when he had fallen asleep over purchase and upon awakening he began to write hastily in xanadu did kubla khan a stately pleasure dome decree where alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea he was interrupted after fifty-four lines were written and he never finished the poem christabel is also a fragment which seems to have been planned as the story of a pure young girl who fell under the spell of a sorcerer in the shape of the woman geraldine it is full of a strange melody and contains many passages of exquisite poetry but it trembles with a strange unknown horror and so suggests the supernatural terrors of the popular hysterical novels to which we have referred on this account it is not wholesome reading though one flies in the face of swinburne and of other critics by venturing to suggest such a thing the rhyme of the ancient mariner the rhyme of the ancient mariner is coleridge's chief contribution to the lyrical ballads of seventeen ninety eight and is one of the world's masterpieces though it introduces the reader to a supernatural realm with a phantom ship a crew of dead men the overhanging curse of the albatross the polar spirit and the magic breeze it nevertheless manages to create a sense of absolute reality concerning these manifest absurdities all the mechanisms of the poem its metre rhyme and melody are perfect and some of its descriptions of the lonely sea have never been equalled perhaps we should say suggestions rather than descriptions for coleridge never describes things but makes a suggestion always brief and always exactly right and our own imagination instantly supplies the details it is useless to quote fragments one must read the entire poem if he reads nothing else of the romantic school of poetry among coleridge's shorter poems there is a wide variety and each reader must be left largely to follow his own taste the beginner will do well to read a few of the early poems to which we have referred and then to try the ode to france youth and age dejection love poems fears in solitude religious musings work without hope and the glorious hymn before sunrise in the vale of chamouni one exquisite little poem from the latin the virgin's cradle hymn and his version of schiller's wallenstein show coleridge's remarkable power as a translator the latter is one of the best poetical translations in our literature prose works of coleridge's prose works the biographia literaria or sketches of my literary life and opinions eighteen seventeen his collected lectures on shakespeare eighteen forty nine and aids to reflection eighteen twenty five are the most interesting from a literary viewpoint 
the first is an explanation and criticism of wordsworth's theory of poetry and contains more sound sense and illuminating ideas on the general subject of poetry than any other book in our language the lectures as refreshing as a west wind in midsummer are remarkable for their attempt to sweep away the arbitrary rules which for two centuries had stood in the way of literary criticism of shakespeare in order to study the works themselves no finer analysis and appreciation of the master's genius has ever been written in his philosophical work coleridge introduced the idealistic philosophy of germany into england he set himself in line with berkeley and squarely against bentham malthus mill and all the materialistic tendencies which were and still are the bane of english philosophy the aids to reflection is coleridge's most profound work but is more interesting to the student of religion and philosophy than to the readers of literature robert salvey seventeen seventy four eighteen forty three closely associated with wordsworth and coleridge is robert salvey and the three on account of their residence in the northern lake district were referred to contemptuously as the lakers by the scottish magazine reviewers salvey holds his place in this group more by personal association than by his literary gifts he was born at bristol in seventeen seventy four studied at westminster school and at oxford where he found himself in perpetual conflict with the authorities on account of his independent views he finally left the university and joined coleridge in his scheme of a pantisocracy for more than fifty years he labored steadily at literature refusing to consider any other occupation he considered himself seriously as one of the greatest writers of the day and a reading of his ballads which connected him at once with the romantic school leads us to think that had he written less he might possibly have justified his own opinion of himself unfortunately he could not wait for inspiration being obliged to support not only his own family but also in large measure that of his friend coleridge works of salvey salvey gradually surrounded himself with one of the most extensive libraries in england and set himself to the task of writing something every working day the results of his industry were one hundred and nine volumes besides some hundred and fifty articles for the magazines most of which are now utterly forgotten his most ambitious poems are thalaba a tale of arabian enchantment the curse of kahama a medley of hindu mythology madoc a legend of a welsh prince who discovered the western world and roderick a tale of the last of the goths all these and many more although containing some excellent passages are on the whole exaggerated and unreal both in manner and in matter salvey wrote far better prose than poetry and his admirable life of nelson is still often read besides these are his lives of british admirals his lives of cowper and wesley and his histories of brazil and of the peninsular war salvey was made poet laureate in eighteen thirteen and was the first to raise that office from the low estate into which it had fallen since the death of dryden the opening lines of thalaba beginning how beautiful is night a dewy freshness fills the silent air are still sometimes quoted and a few of his best-known short poems like the scholar ald klutz the well of st ken the inchcape rock and lodore will repay the curious reader the beauty of salvey's character his patience and helpfulness make him a worthy associate of the two greater poets with whom he is generally named End of section forty three section forty four of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued walter scott seventeen seventy one eighteen thirty two 
we have already called attention to two significant movements of the eighteenth century which we must for a moment recall if we are to appreciate scott not simply as a delightful teller of tales but as a tremendous force in modern literature the first is the triumph of romantic poetry in wordsworth and coleridge the second is the success of our first english novelists and the popularization of literature by taking it from the control of a few patrons and critics and putting it into the hands of the people as one of the forces which mould our modern life scott is an epitome of both these movements the poetry of wordsworth and coleridge was read by a select few but scott's marmion and lady of the lake aroused a whole nation to enthusiasm and for the first time romantic poetry became really popular so also the novel had been content to paint men and women of the present until the wonderful series of waverley novels appeared when suddenly by the magic of this wizard of the north all history seemed changed the past which had hitherto appeared as a dreary region of dead heroes became alive again and filled with a multitude of men and women who had the surprising charm of reality it is of small consequence that scott's poetry and prose are both faulty that his poems are read chiefly for the story rather than for their poetic excellence and that much of the evident crudity and barbarism of the middle ages is ignored or forgotten in scott's writings by their vigor their freshness their rapid action and their breezy out-of-door atmosphere scott's novels attracted thousands of readers who else had known nothing of the delights of literature he is therefore the greatest known factor in establishing and in popularizing that romantic element in prose and poetry which has been for a hundred years the chief characteristic of our literature life scott was born in edinburgh on august fifteenth seventeen seventy one on both his mother's and father's side he was descended from old border families distinguished more for their feuds and fighting than for their intellectual attainments his father was a barrister a just man who often lost clients by advising them to be first of all honest in their lawsuits his mother was a woman of character and education strongly imaginative a teller of tales which stirred young walter's enthusiasm by revealing the past as a world of living heroes as a child scott was lame and delicate and was therefore sent away from the city to be with his grandmother in the open country at sandy knowe in roxburghshire near the tweed this grandmother was a perfect treasure-house of legends concerning the old border feuds from her wonderful tales scott developed that intense love of scottish history and tradition which characterizes all his work by the time he was eight years old when he returned to edinburgh scott's tastes were fixed for life at the high school he was a fair scholar but without enthusiasm being more interested in border stories than in the textbooks he remained at school only six or seven years and then entered his father's office to study law at the same time attending lectures at the university he kept this up for some six years without developing any interest in his profession not even when he passed his examinations and was admitted to the bar in seventeen ninety two after nineteen years of desultory work in which he showed far more zeal in gathering highland legends than in gaining clients he had won two small legal offices which gave him enough income to support him comfortably his home meanwhile was at ashesteel on the tweed where all his best poetry was written scott's literary work began with the translation from german of bürger's romantic ballad of lenore seventeen ninety six and of goethe's goetz von berklingen seventeen ninety nine but there was romance enough in his own loved highlands and in eighteen o two to eighteen o three appeared three volumes of his minstrelsy of the scottish border which he had been collecting for many years in eighteen o five when scott was thirty-four years old appeared his first original work the lady of the last minstrel 
its success was immediate and when marmion 1808 and the lady of the lake 1810 aroused scotland and england to intense enthusiasm and brought unexpected fame to the author without in the least spoiling his honest and lovable nature scott gladly resolved to abandon the law in which he had won scant success and give himself wholly to literature unfortunately however in order to increase his earnings he entered secretly into partnership with the firms of constable and the brothers ballantine as printer publishers a sad mistake indeed and the cause of that tragedy which closed the life of scotland's greatest writer the year eighteen eleven is remarkable for two things in scott's life in this year he seems to have realized that notwithstanding the success of his poems he had not yet found himself that he was not a poetic genius like burns that in his first three poems he had practically exhausted his material though he still continued to write verse and that if he was to keep his popularity he must find some other work the fact that only a year later byron suddenly became the popular favorite shows how correctly scott had judged himself and the reading public which was even more fickle than usual in this emotional age in that same year eighteen eleven scott bought the estate at abbotsford on the tweed with which place his name is forever associated here he began to spend large sums and to dispense the generous hospitality of a scotch laird of which he had been dreaming for years in eighteen twenty he was made a baronet and his new title of sir walter came nearer to turning his honest head than had all his literary success his business partnership was kept secret and during all the years when the waverley novels were the most popular books in the world their authorship remained unknown for scott deemed it beneath the dignity of his title to earn money by business or literature and sought to give the impression that the enormous sum spent at abbotsford in improving the estate and in entertaining lavishly were part of the dignity of the position and came from ancestral sources it was the success of byron's child harold and the comparative failure of scott's later poems rokeby the bridal of Triermain, and the lord of the isles which led our author into the new field where he was to be without rival rummaging through a cabinet one day in search of some fishing tackle scott found the manuscript of a story which he had begun and laid aside nine years before he read this old story eagerly as if it had been another's work finished it within three weeks and published it without signing his name the success of this first novel waverley eighteen fourteen was immediate and unexpected its great sales and the general chorus of praise for its unknown author were without precedent and when guy mannering the antiquary black dwarf old mortality rob roy and the heart of midlothian appeared within the next four years england's delight and wonder knew no bounds not only at home but also on the continent large numbers of these fresh and fascinating stories were sold as fast as they could be printed during the seventeen years which followed the appearance of waverley scott wrote on an average nearly two novels per year creating an unusual number of characters and illustrating many periods of scotch english and french history from the time of the crusades to the fall of the stuarts in addition to these historical novels he wrote tales of a grandfather demonology and witchcraft biographies of dryden and of swift the life of napoleon in nine volumes and a large number of articles for the reviews and magazines it was an extraordinary amount of literary work but it was not quite so rapid and spontaneous as it seemed he had been very diligent in looking up old records and we must remember that in nearly all his poems and novels scott was drawing upon a fund of legend tradition history and poetry which he had been gathering for forty years and which his memory enabled him to produce at will with almost the accuracy of an encyclopedia 
for the first six years scott held himself to scottish history giving us in nine remarkable novels the whole of scotland its heroism its superb faith and enthusiasm and especially its clannish loyalty to its hereditary chiefs giving us also all parties and characters from covenanters to royalists and from kings to beggars after reading these nine volumes we know scotland and scotchmen as we can know them in no other way in eighteen nineteen he turned abruptly from scotland and in ivanhoe the most popular of his works showed what a mine of neglected wealth lay just beneath the surface of english history it is hard to realize now as we read its rapid melodramatic action its vivid portrayal of saxon and norman character and all its picturesque details that it was written rapidly at a time when the author was suffering from disease and could hardly repress an occasional groan from finding its way into the rapid dictation it stands to-day as the best example of the author's own theory that the will of a man is enough to hold him steadily against all obstacles to the task of doing what he has a mind to do kenilworth nigel peveril and woodstock all written in the next few years show his grasp of the romantic side of english annals count robert and the talisman show his enthusiasm for the heroic side of the crusader's nature and quentin durward and anne of geierstein suggest another mine of romance which he discovered in french history for twenty years scott labored steadily at literature with the double object of giving what was in him and of earning large sums to support the lavish display which he deemed essential to a laird of scotland in eighteen twenty six while he was blithely at work on woodstock the crash came not even the vast earnings of all these popular novels could longer keep the wretched business of ballantine on its feet and the firm failed after years of mismanagement though a silent partner scott assumed full responsibility and at fifty-five years of age sick suffering and with all his best work behind him he found himself facing a debt of over half a million dollars the firm could easily have compromised with its creditors but scott refused to hear of bankruptcy laws under which he could have taken refuge he assumed the entire debt as a personal one and set resolutely to work to pay every penny times were indeed changed in england when instead of a literary genius starving until some wealthy patron gave him a pension this man aided by his pen alone could confidently begin to earn that enormous amount of money and this is one of the unnoticed results of the popularization of literature without a doubt scott would have accomplished the task had he been granted only a few years of health he still lived at abbotsford which he had offered to his creditors but which they generously refused to accept and in two years by miscellaneous work had paid some two hundred thousand dollars of his debt nearly half of this sum coming from his life of napoleon a new edition of the waverley novels appeared which was very successful financially and scott had every reason to hope that he would soon face the world owing no man a penny when he suddenly broke under the strain in eighteen thirty occurred a stroke of paralysis from which he never fully recovered though after a little time he was again at work dictating with splendid patience and resolution he writes in his diary at this time the blow is a stunning one i suppose for i scarcely feel it it is singular but it comes with as little surprise as if i had a remedy ready yet god knows i am at sea in the dark and the vessel leaky it is good to remember that governments are not always ungrateful and to record that when it became known that a voyage to italy might improve scott's health the british government promptly placed a naval vessel at the disposal of a man who had led no armies to the slaughter but had only given pleasure to multitudes of peaceable men and women by his stories he visited malta naples and rome but in his heart he longed for scotland and turned homeward after a few months of exile the river tweed the scotch hills the trees of abbotsford 
the joyous clamor of his dogs brought forth the first exclamation of delight which had passed scott's lips since he sailed away he died in september of the same year eighteen thirty two and was buried with his ancestors in the old dryburg abbey works of scott scott's work is of a kind which the critic gladly passes over leaving each reader to his own joyous and uninstructed opinion from a literary viewpoint the works are faulty enough if one is looking for faults but it is well to remember that they were intended to give delight and that they rarely fail of their object when one has read the stirring marmion or the more enduring lady of the lake felt the heroism of the crusaders in the talisman the picturesqueness of chivalry in ivanhoe the nobleness of soul of a scotch peasant girl in the heart of midlothian and the quality of scotch faith in old mortality then his own opinion of scott's genius will be of more value than all the criticisms that have ever been written scott's poetry at the outset we must confess frankly that scott's poetry is not artistic in the highest sense and that it lacks the deeply imaginative and suggestive qualities which make a poem the noblest and most enduring work of humanity we read it now not for its poetic excellence but for its absorbing story interest even so it serves an admirable purpose marmion and the lady of the lake which are often the first long poems read by the beginner in literature almost invariably lead to a deeper interest in the subject and many readers owe to these poems an introduction to the delights of poetry they are an excellent beginning therefore for young readers since they are almost certain to hold the attention and to lead indirectly to an interest in other and better poems aside from this scott's poetry is marked by vigor and youthful abandon its interest lies in its vivid pictures its heroic characters and especially in its rapid action and succession of adventures which hold and delight us still as they held and delighted the first wandering readers and one finds here and there terse descriptions or snatches of song and ballad like the boat song and lochinvar which are among the best known in our literature scott's novels in his novels scott plainly wrote too rapidly and too much while a genius of the first magnitude the definition of genius as the infinite capacity for taking pains hardly belongs to him for details of life and history for finely drawn characters and for tracing the logical consequences of human action he has usually no inclination he sketches a character roughly plunges him into the midst of stirring incidents and the action of the story carries us on breathlessly to the end so his stories are largely adventure stories at the best and it is this element of adventure and glorious action rather than the study of character which makes scott a perennial favorite of the young the same element of excitement is what causes mature readers to turn from scott to better novelists who have more power to delineate human character and to create or discover a romantic interest in the incidents of everyday life rather than in stirring adventure note see scott's criticism of his own work in comparison with jane austen's End of note. scott's work for literature notwithstanding these limitations it is well especially in these days when we hear that scott is outgrown to emphasize four noteworthy things that he accomplished one he created the historical novel note scott's novels were not the first to have an historical basis for thirty years preceding the appearance of waverley historical romances were popular but it was due to scott's genius that the historical novel became a permanent type of literature see cross the development of the english novel end of note and all novelists of the last century who draw upon history for their characters and events are followers of scott and acknowledge his mastery two his novels are on a vast scale covering a very wide range of action and are concerned with public rather than with private interests so with the exception of the bride of lammermoor the love story in his novels is generally pale and feeble but the strife and passions of big parties are magnificently portrayed 
a glance over even the titles of his novels show how the heroic side of history for over six hundred years finds expression in his pages and all the parties of these six centuries crusaders covenanters cavaliers roundheads papists jews gypsies rebels start into life again and fight or give a reason for the faith that is in them no other novelist in england and only balzac in france approaches scott in the scope of his narratives three scott was the first novelist in any language to make the scene an essential element in the action he knew scotland and loved it and there is hardly an event in any of his scottish novels in which we do not breathe the very atmosphere of the place and feel the presence of its moors and mountains the place moreover is usually so well chosen and described that the action seems almost to be the result of natural environment perhaps the most striking illustration of this harmony between scene and incident is found in old mortality where morton approaches the cave of the old covenanter and where the spiritual terror inspired by the fanatic struggle with imaginary fiends is paralleled by the physical terror of a gulf and a roaring flood spanned by a slippery tree trunk a second illustration of the same harmony of scene and incident is found in the meeting of the arms and ideals of the east and west when the two champions fight in the burning desert and then eat bread together in the cool shade of the oasis as described in the opening chapter of the talisman a third illustration is found in that fascinating love scene where ivanhoe lies wounded raging at his helplessness while the gentle rebecca alternately hides and reveals her love as she describes the terrific assault on the castle which goes on beneath her window his thoughts are all on the fight hers on the man she loves and both are natural and both are exactly what we expect under the circumstances these are but striking examples of the fact that in all his work scott tries to preserve perfect harmony between the scene and the action four scott's chief claim to greatness lies in the fact that he was the first novelist to recreate the past that he changed our whole conception of history by making it to be not a record of dry facts but a stage on which living men and women played their parts carlyle's criticism is here most pertinent these historical novels have taught this truth unknown to writers of history that the bygone ages of the world were actually filled by living men not by protocols state papers controversies and abstractions of men not only the pages of history but all the hills and vales of his beloved scotland are filled with living characters lords and ladies soldiers pirates gypsies preachers schoolmasters clansmen bailiffs dependents all scotland is here before our eyes in the reality of life itself it is astonishing with his large numbers of characters that scott never repeats himself naturally he is most at home in scotland and with humble people scott's own romantic interest in feudalism caused him to make his lords altogether too lordly his aristocratic maidens are usually bloodless conventional exasperating creatures who talk like books and pose like figures in an old tapestry but when he describes characters like genie deans in the heart of midlothian and the old clansman evan dhu in waverley we know the very soul of scotch womanhood and manhood perhaps one more thing should be said or rather repeated of scott's enduring work he is always sane wholesome manly inspiring we know the essential nobility of human life better and we are better men and women ourselves because of what he has written End of section forty four section forty five of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued george gordon lord byron seventeen eighty eight eighteen twenty four there are two distinct sides to byron and his poetry one good the other bad and those who write about him generally describe one side or the other in superlatives 
thus one critic speaks of his splendid and imperishable excellence of sincerity and strength another of his gaudy charlatanry blare of brass and big bow wowishness as both critics are fundamentally right we shall not here attempt to reconcile their differences which arise from viewing one side of the man's nature and poetry to the exclusion of the other before his exile from england in eighteen sixteen the general impression made by byron is that of a man who leads an irregular life poses as a romantic hero makes himself out much worse than he really is and takes delight in shocking not only the conventions but the ideals of english society his poetry of this first period is generally though not always shallow and insincere in thought and declamatory or bombastic in expression after his exile and his meeting with shelley in italy we note a gradual improvement due partly to shelley's influence and partly to his own mature thought and experience we have the impression now of a disillusioned man who recognizes his true character and who though cynical and pessimistic is at least honest in his unhappy outlook on society his poetry of this period is generally less shallow and rhetorical and though he still parades his feelings in public he often surprises us by being manly and sincere thus in the third canto of child harold written just after his exile he says in my youth's summer i did sing of one the wandering outlaw of his own dark mind and as we read on to the end of the splendid fourth canto with its poetic feeling for nature and its stirring rhythm that grips and holds the reader like martial music we lay down the book with profound regret that this gifted man should have devoted so much of his talent to describing trivial or unwholesome intrigues and posing as the hero of his own verses the real tragedy of byron's life is that he died just as he was beginning to find himself life byron was born in london in seventeen eighty eight the year preceding the french revolution we shall understand him better and judge him more charitably if we remember the tainted stock from which he sprang his father was a dissipated spendthrift of unspeakable morals his mother was a scotch heiress passionate and unbalanced the father deserted his wife after squandering her fortune and the boy was brought up by the mother who alternately petted and abused him in his eleventh year the death of the grand uncle left him heir to newstead abbey and to the baronial title of one of the oldest houses in england he was singularly handsome and a lameness resulting from a deformed foot lent a suggestion of pathos to his make-up all this with his social position his pseudo-heroic poetry and his dissipated life over which he contrived to throw a veil of romantic secrecy made him a magnet of attraction to many thoughtless young men and foolish women who made the downhill path both easy and rapid to one whose inclinations led him in that direction naturally he was generous and easily led by affection he is therefore largely a victim of his own weakness and of unfortunate surroundings at school at harrow and in the university at cambridge byron led an unbalanced life and was more given to certain sports from which he was not debarred by lameness than to books and study his school life like his infancy is sadly marked by vanity violence and rebellion against every form of authority yet it was not without its hours of nobility and generosity scott describes him as a man of real goodness of heart and the kindness and best feelings miserably thrown away by his foolish contempt of public opinion while at cambridge byron published his first volume of poems hours of idleness in eighteen o seven 
a severe criticism of the volume in the edinburgh review wounded byron's vanity and threw him into a violent passion the result of which was the now famous satire called english bards and scotch reviewers in which not only his enemies but also scott wordsworth and nearly all the literary men of his day were satirized in heroic couplets after the manner of pope's dunciad it is only just to say that he afterwards made friends with scott and with others whom he had abused without provocation it is interesting to note in view of his own romantic poetry that he denounced all masters of romance and accepted the artificial standards of pope and dryden his two favorite books were the old testament and a volume of pope's poetry of the latter he says his is the greatest name in poetry all the rest are barbarians in eighteen o nine byron when only twenty-one years of age started on a tour of europe and the orient the poetic results of this trip were the first two cantos of child harold's pilgrimage with their famous descriptions of romantic scenery the work made him instantly popular and his fame overshadowed scott's completely as he says himself i awoke one morning to find myself famous and presently he styles himself the grand napoleon of the realms of rhyme the worst element in byron at this time was his insincerity his continual posing as the hero of his poetry his best works were translated and his fame spread almost as rapidly on the continent as in england even goethe was deceived and declared that a man so wonderful in character had never before appeared in literature and would never appear again now that the tinsel has worn off and we can judge the man and his work dispassionately we see how easily even the critics of the age were governed by romantic impulses the adulation of byron lasted only a few years in england in eighteen fifteen he married miss milbank an english heiress who abruptly left him a year later with womanly reserve she kept silence but the public was not slow to imagine plenty of reasons for the separation this together with the fact that men had begun to penetrate the veil of romantic secrecy with which byron surrounded himself and found a rather brassy idol beneath turned the tide of public opinion against him he left england under a cloud of distrust and disappointment in eighteen sixteen and never returned eight years were spent abroad largely in italy where he was associated with shelley until the latter's tragic death in eighteen twenty two his house was ever the meeting-place for revolutionists and malcontents calling themselves patriots whom he trusted too greatly and with whom he shared his money most generously curiously enough while he trusted men too easily he had no faith in human society or government and wrote in eighteen seventeen i have simplified my politics to an utter detestation of all existing governments during his exile he finished child harold the prisoner of chillon his dramas cain and manfred and numerous other works in some of which as in don juan he delighted in revenging himself upon his countrymen by holding up to ridicule all that they held most sacred in eighteen twenty four byron went to greece to give himself and a large part of his fortune to help that country in its struggle for liberty against the turks how far he was led by his desire for posing as a hero and how far by a certain vigorous viking spirit that was certainly in him will never be known the greeks welcomed him and made him a leader and for a few months he found himself in the midst of a wretched squabble of lies selfishness insincerity cowardice and intrigue instead of the heroic struggle for liberty which he had anticipated he died of fever in missolonghi in eighteen twenty four one of his last poems written there on his thirty-sixth birthday a few months before he died expresses his own view of his disappointing life 
my days are in the yellow leaf the flowers and fruits of love are gone the worm the canker and the grief are mine alone works of byron in reading byron it is well to remember that he was a disappointed and embittered man not only in his personal life but also in his expectation of a general transformation of human society as he pours out his own feelings chiefly in his poetry he is the most expressive writer of his age in voicing the discontent of a multitude of europeans who were disappointed at the failure of the french revolution to produce an entirely new form of government and society hours of idleness one who wishes to understand the whole scope of byron's genius and poetry will do well to begin with his first work hours of idleness written when he was a young man at the university there is very little poetry in the volume only a striking facility in rhyme brightened by the devil-may-care spirit of the cavalier poets but as a revelation of the man himself it is remarkable in a vain and sophomoric preface he declares that poetry is to him an idle experiment and that this is his first and last attempt to amuse himself in that line curiously enough as he starts for greece on his last fatal journey he again ridicules literature and says that the poet is a mere babbler it is this despising of the art which alone makes him famous that occasions our deepest disappointment even in his magnificent passages in a glowing description of nature or of a hindu woman's exquisite love his work is frequently marred by a wretched pun or by some cheap buffoonery which ruins our first splendid impression of his poetry longer poems byron's later volumes manfred and cain the one a curious and perhaps unconscious parody of faust the other of paradise lost are his two best-known dramatic works aside from the question of their poetic value they are interesting as voicing byron's excessive individualism and his rebellion against society the best known and the most readable of byron's works mazeppa the prisoner of chillon and child harold's pilgrimage the first two cantos of child harold eighteen twelve are perhaps more frequently read than any other work of the same author partly because of their melodious verse partly because of their descriptions of places along the lines of european travel but the last two cantos eighteen sixteen eighteen eighteen 18, written after his exile from england have more sincerity and are in every way better expressions of byron's mature genius scattered through all his works one finds magnificent descriptions of natural scenery and exquisite lyrics of love and despair but they are mixed with such a deal of bombast and rhetoric together with much that is unwholesome that the beginner will do well to confine himself to a small volume of well-chosen selections note see selections for reading and bibliography at the end of this chapter end of note byron is often compared with scott as having given to us europe and the orient just as scott gave us scotland and its people but while there is a certain resemblance in the swing and dash of the verses the resemblance is all on the surface and the underlying difference between the two poets is as great as that between thackeray and bulwer lytton scott knew his country well its hills and valleys which are interesting as the abode of living and lovable men and women byron pretended to know the secret unwholesome side of europe which generally hides itself in the dark but instead of giving us a variety of living men he never gets away from his own unbalanced and egotistical self all his characters in cain manfred the corsair the jaour child harold don juan are tiresome repetitions of himself a vain disappointed cynical man who finds no good in life or love or anything 
naturally with such a disposition he is entirely incapable of portraying a true woman to nature alone especially in her magnificent moods byron remains faithful and his portrayal of the night and the storm and the ocean in child harold are unsurpassed in our language End of section 45section forty six of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued percy bish shelley seventeen ninety two eighteen twenty two make me thy lyre even as the forest is what if my leaves are falling like its own the tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone sweet though in sadness be thou spirit fierce my spirit be thou me impetuous one in this fragment from the ode to the west wind we have a suggestion of shelley's own spirit as reflected in all his poetry the very spirit of nature which appeals to us in the wind and the cloud the sunset and the moonrise seems to have possessed him at times and made him a chosen instrument of melody at such times he is a true poet and his work is unrivalled at other times unfortunately shelley joins with byron in voicing a vain rebellion against society his poetry like his life divides itself into two distinct moods in one he is the violent reformer seeking to overthrow our present institutions and to hurry the millennium out of its slow walk into a gallop out of this mood come most of his longer poems like queen mab revolt of islam hellas and the witch of atlas which are somewhat violent diatribes against government priests marriage religion even god as men supposed him to be in a different mood which finds expression alastor adonais and his wonderful lyrics shelley is like a wanderer following a vague beautiful vision forever sad and forever unsatisfied in the latter mood he appeals profoundly to all men who have known what it is to follow after an unattainable ideal shelley's life there are three classes of men who see visions and all three are represented in our literature the first is the mere dreamer like blake who stumbles through a world of reality without noticing it and is happy in his visions the second is the seer the prophet like langland or wycliffe who sees a vision and quietly goes to work in ways that men understand to make the present world a little more like the ideal one which he sees in his vision the third who appears in many forms as visionary enthusiast radical anarchist revolutionary call him what you will sees a vision and straightway begins to tear down all human institutions which have been built up by the slow toil of centuries simply because they seem to stand in the way of his dream to the latter class belongs shelley a man perpetually at war with the present world a martyr and exile simply because of his inability to sympathize with men and society as they are and because of his own mistaken judgment as to the value and purpose of a vision shelley was born in field place near horsham sussex in seventeen ninety two on both his father's and his mother's side he was descended from noble old families famous in the political and literary history of england from childhood he lived like blake in a world of fancy so real that certain imaginary dragons and headless creatures of the neighboring wood kept him and his sisters in a state of fearful expectancy he learned rapidly absorbed the classics as if by intuition and dissatisfied with ordinary processes of learning seems to have sought like faustus the acquaintance of spirits as shown in his hymn to intellectual beauty while yet a boy i sought for ghosts and sped through many a listening chamber cave and ruin and starlight wood with fearful steps pursuing hopes of high talk with the departed dead 
shelley's first public school kept by a hard-headed scotch master with its floggings and its general brutality seemed to him like a combination of hell and prison and his active rebellion against existing institutions was well under way when at twelve years of age he entered the famous preparatory school at eton he was a delicate nervous marvellously sensitive boy of great physical beauty and like cowper he suffered torments at the hands of his rough schoolfellows unlike cowper he was positive resentful and brave to the point of rashness soul and body rose up against tyranny and he promptly organized a rebellion against the brutal fagging system mad shelley the boys called him and they chivied him like dogs around a little coon that fights and cries defiance to the end one finds what he seeks in this world and it is not strange that shelley after his eton experiences found causes for rebellion in all existing forms of human society and that he left school to war among mankind as he says of himself in the revolt of islam his university days are but a repetition of his earlier experiences while a student at oxford he read some scraps of hume's philosophy and immediately published a pamphlet called the necessity of atheism it was a crude foolish piece of work and shelley distributed it by post to every one to whom it might give offence naturally this brought on a conflict with the authorities but shelley would not listen to reason or make any explanation and was expelled from the university in eighteen eleven shelley's marriage was even more unfortunate while living in london on a generous sister's pocket money a certain young schoolgirl harriet westbrook was attracted by shelley's crude revolutionary doctrines she promptly left school as her own personal part in the general rebellion and refused to return or even to listen to her parents upon the subject having been taught by shelley she threw herself upon his protection and this unbalanced couple were presently married as they said in deference to anarch custom the two infants had already proclaimed a rebellion against the institution of marriage for which they proposed to substitute the doctrine of elective affinity for two years they wandered about england ireland and wales living on a small allowance from shelley's father who had disinherited his son because of his ill-considered marriage the pair soon separated and two years later shelley having formed a strong friendship with one godwin a leader of young enthusiasts and a preacher of anarchy presently showed his belief in godwin's theories by eloping with his daughter mary it is a sad story and the details were perhaps better forgotten we should remember that in shelley we are dealing with a tragic blend of high-mindedness and light-headedness byron wrote of him the most gentle the most amiable and the least worldly-minded person i ever met led by the general hostility against him and partly by his own delicate health shelley went to italy in eighteen eighteen and never returned to england after wandering over italy he finally settled in pisa beloved of so many english poets beautiful sleepy pisa where one looks out of his window on the main street at the busiest hour of the day and the only living thing in sight is a donkey dozing lazily with his head in the shade and his body in the sunshine here his best poetry was written and here he found comfort in the friendship of byron hunt and trelawney who are forever associated with shelley's italian life he still remained hostile to english social institutions but life is a good teacher and that shelley dimly recognized the error of his rebellion is shown in the increasing sadness of his later poems o world o life o time on whose last steps i climb trembling at that where i had stood before when will return the glory of your prime no more oh never more out of the day and night a joy has taken flight fresh spring and summer and winter hoar move my faint heart with grief 
but with delight no more oh never more in eighteen twenty two when only thirty years of age shelley was drowned while sailing in a small boat off the italian coast his body was washed ashore several days later and was cremated near viareggio by his friends byron hunt and trelawney his ashes might with all reverence have been given to the winds that he loved and that were a symbol of his restless spirit instead they found a resting-place near the grave of keats in the english cemetery at rome one rarely visits the spot now without finding english and american visitors standing in silence before the significant inscription cor cordium works of shelley as a lyric poet shelley is one of the supreme geniuses of our literature and the reader will do well to begin with the poems which show him at his very best the cloud to a skylark ode to the west wind to-night poems like these must surely set the reader to searching among shelley's miscellaneous works to find for himself the things worthy to be remembered alastor in reading shelley's longer poems one must remember that there are in this poet two distinct men one the wanderer seeking ideal beauty and forever unsatisfied the other the unbalanced reformer seeking the overthrow of present institutions and the establishment of universal happiness alastor or the spirit of solitude eighteen sixteen is by far the best expression of shelley's greater mood here we see him wandering restlessly through the vast silences of nature in search of a loved dream maiden who shall satisfy his love of beauty here shelley is the poet of the moonrise and of the tender exquisite fancies that can never be expressed the charm of the poem lies in its succession of dreamlike pictures but it gives absolutely no impressions of reality it was written when shelley after his long struggle had begun to realize that the world was too strong for him alastor is therefore the poet's confession not simply of failure but of undying hope in some better thing that is to come prometheus prometheus unbound eighteen 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 twenty a lyrical drama is the best work of shelley's revolutionary enthusiasm and the most characteristic of all his poems shelley's philosophy if one may dignify a hopeless dream by such a name was a curious aftergrowth of the french revolution namely that it is only the existing tyranny of state church and society which keeps man from growth into perfect happiness naturally shelley forgot like many other enthusiasts that church and state and social laws were not imposed upon man from without but were created by himself to minister to his necessities in shelley's poem the hero prometheus represents mankind itself a just and noble humanity chained and tortured by jove who is here the personification of human institutions note shelley undoubtedly took his idea from a lost drama of aeschylus a sequel to prometheus bound in which the great friend of mankind was unchained from a precipice where he had been placed by the tyrant zeus End of note in due time demogorgon which is shelley's name for necessity overthrows the tyrant jove and releases prometheus mankind who is presently united to asia the spirit of love and goodness in nature while the earth and the moon join in a wedding song and everything gives promise that they shall live together happy ever afterwards shelley here looks forward not back to the golden age and is the prophet of science and evolution if we compare his titan with similar characters in faust and cain we shall find this interesting difference 
that while goethe's titan is cultured and self-reliant and byron's stoic and hopeless shelley's hero is patient under torture seeking help and hope beyond his suffering and he marries love that the earth may be peopled with superior beings who shall substitute brotherly love for the present laws and conventions of society such is his philosophy but the beginner will read this poem not chiefly for its thought but for its youthful enthusiasm for its marvelous imagery and especially for its ethereal music perhaps we should add here that prometheus is and probably always will be a poem for the chosen few who can appreciate its peculiar spirit-like beauty in its purely pagan conception of the world it suggests by contrast milton's christian philosophy in paradise regained shelley's revolutionary works queen mab eighteen thirteen the revolt of islam eighteen eighteen hellas eighteen twenty one and the witch of atlas eighteen twenty are to be judged in much the same way as is prometheus unbound they are largely invectives against religion marriage kingcraft and priestcraft most impractical when considered as schemes for reform but abounding in passages of exquisite beauty for which alone they are worth reading in the drama called the cenci eighteen nineteen which is founded upon a morbid italian story shelley for the first and only time descends to reality the heroine beatrice driven to desperation by the monstrous wickedness of her father kills him and suffers the death penalty in consequence she is the only one of shelley's characters who seems to us entirely human adonais far different in character is epipsychidion eighteen twenty one a rhapsody celebrating platonic love the most impalpable and so one of the most characteristic of shelley's works it was inspired by a beautiful italian girl emilia viviani who was put into a cloister against her will and in whom shelley imagined he found his long-sought ideal of womanhood with this should be read adonais eighteen twenty one the best known of all shelley's longer poems adonais is a wonderful threnody or a song of grief over the death of the poet keats even in his grief shelley still preserves a sense of unreality and calls in many shadowy allegorical figures sad spring weeping hours glooms splendors destinies all uniting in bewailing the loss of a loved one the whole poem is a succession of dream pictures exquisitely beautiful such as only shelley could imagine and it holds its place with milton's lycidas and tennyson's in memoriam as one of the three greatest elegies in our language shelley and wordsworth in his interpretation of nature shelley suggests wordsworth both by resemblance and by contrast to both poets all natural objects are symbols of truth both regard nature as permeated by the great spiritual life which animates all things but while wordsworth finds a spirit of thought and so of communion between nature and the soul of man shelley finds a spirit of love which exists chiefly for its own delight and so the cloud the skylark and the west wind three of the most beautiful poems in our language have no definite message for humanity in his hymn to intellectual beauty shelley is most like wordsworth but in his sensitive plant with its fine symbolism and imagery he is like nobody in the world but himself comparison is sometimes an excellent thing and if we compare shelley's exquisite lament beginning o world o life o time with wordsworth's intimations of immortality we shall perhaps understand both poets better 
both poems recall many happy memories of youth both express a very real mood of a moment but while the beauty of one merely saddens and disheartens us the beauty of the other inspires us with something of the poet's own faith and hopefulness in a word wordsworth found and shelley lost himself in nature End of section forty six section forty seven of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued john keats seventeen ninety five eighteen twenty one keats was not only the last but also the most perfect of the romanticists while scott was merely telling stories and wordsworth reforming poetry or upholding the moral law and shelley advocating impossible reforms and byron voicing his own egoism and the political discontent of the times keats lived apart from men and from all political measures worshipping beauty like a devotee perfectly content to write what was in his heart or to reflect some splendor of the natural world as he saw or dreamed it to be he had moreover the novel idea that poetry exists for its own sake and suffers loss by being devoted to philosophy or politics or indeed to any cause however great or small as he says in lamia do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy there was an awful rainbow once in heaven we know her woof her texture she is given in the dull catalogue of common things philosophy will clip an angel's wings conquer all mysteries by rule and line empty the haunted air and nomad mine unweave a rainbow as it erewhile made the tender personed lamia melt into a shade partly because of this high ideal of poetry partly because he studied and unconsciously imitated the greek classics and the best works of the elizabethans keats's last little volume of poetry is unequalled by the work of any of his contemporaries when we remember that all his work was published in three short years from eighteen seventeen to eighteen twenty and that he died when only twenty-five years old we must judge him to be the most promising figure of the early nineteenth century and one of the most remarkable in the history of literature life keats's life of devotion to beauty and to poetry is all the more remarkable in view of his lowly origin he was the son of a hostler and stable-keeper and was born in the stable of the swan and hoop inn london in seventeen ninety five one has only to read the rough stable scenes from our first novelists or even from dickens to understand how little there was in such an atmosphere to develop poetic gifts before keats was fifteen years old both parents died and he was placed with his brothers and sisters in charge of guardians their first act seems to have been to take keats from school at enfield and to bind him as an apprentice to a surgeon at edmonton for five years he served his apprenticeship and for two years more he was surgeon's helper in the hospitals but though skilful enough to win approval he disliked his work and his thoughts were on other things the other day during a lecture he said to a friend there came a sunbeam into the room and with it a whole troop of creatures floating in the ray i was off with them to oberon and fairyland a copy of spencer's fairy queen which had been given him by charles cowden clark was the prime cause of his abstraction he abandoned his profession in eighteen seventeen and early in the same year published his first volume of poems it was modest enough in spirit as was also his second volume endymion eighteen eighteen but that did not prevent brutal attacks upon the author and his work by the self-constituted critics 
of blackwood's magazine and the quarterly it is often alleged that the poet's spirit and ambition were broken by these attacks note this idea is supported by shelley's poem adonais and by byron's parody against the reviewers beginning who killed john keats i say the quarterly end of note but keats was a man of strong character and instead of quarrelling with his reviewers or being crushed by their criticism he went quietly to work with the idea of producing poetry that should live for ever as matthew arnold says keats had flint and iron in him and in his next volume he accomplished his own purpose and silenced unfriendly criticism for the three years during which keats wrote his poetry he lived chiefly in london and in hampstead but wandered at times over england and scotland living for brief spaces in the isle of wight in devonshire and in the lake district seeking to recover his own health and especially to restore that of his brother his illness began with a severe cold but soon developed into consumption and added to this sorrow was another his love for fanny braun to whom he was engaged but whom he could not marry on account of his poverty and growing illness when we remember all this personal grief and the harsh criticism of literary men the last small volume lamia isabella the eve of st agnes and other poems eighteen twenty is most significant as showing not only keats's wonderful poetic gifts but also his beautiful and indomitable spirit shelley struck by the beauty and promise of hyperion sent a generous invitation to the author to come to pisa and live with him but keats refused having little sympathy with shelley's revolt against society the invitation had this effect however that it turned keats's thoughts to italy whither he soon went in the effort to save his life he settled in rome with his friend severn the artist but died soon after his arrival in february eighteen twenty one his grave in the protestant cemetery at rome is still an object of pilgrimage to thousands of tourists for among all our poets there is hardly another whose heroic life and tragic death have so appealed to the hearts of poets and young enthusiasts the work of keats none but the master shall praise us and none but the master shall blame might well be written on the fly-leaf of every volume of keats poetry for never was there a poet more devoted to his ideal entirely independent of success or failure in strong contrast with his contemporary byron who professed to despise the art that made him famous keats lived for poetry alone and as lowell pointed out a virtue went out of him into everything he wrote in all his work we have the impression of this intense loyalty to his art we have the impression also of a profound dissatisfaction that the deed falls so far short of the splendid dream thus after reading chapman's translation of homer he writes much have i travelled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen round many western islands have i been which bards in fealty to apollo hold oft of one wide expanse had i been told that deep-browed homer ruled as his domain yet did i never breathe its pure serene till i heard chapman speak out loud and bold then felt i like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken or like stout cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise silent upon a peak in darien in this striking sonnet we have a suggestion of keats's high ideal and of his sadness because of his own ignorance when he published his first little volume of poems in eighteen seventeen he knew no greek yet greek literature absorbed and fascinated him as he saw its broken and imperfect reflection in an english translation 
like shakespeare who also was but poorly educated in the schools he had a marvelous faculty of discerning the real spirit of the classics a faculty denied to many great scholars and to most of the classic writers of the preceding century and so he set himself to the task of reflecting in modern english the spirit of the old greeks the imperfect results of this attempt are seen in his next volume endymion which is the story of a young shepherd beloved by a moon goddess the poem begins with the striking lines a thing of beauty is a joy for ever its loveliness increases it will never pass into nothingness but still will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing which well illustrate the spirit of keats's later work with its perfect finish and melody it has many quotable lines and passages and its hymn to pan should be read in connection with wordsworth's famous sonnet beginning the world is too much with us the poem gives splendid promise but as a whole it is rather chaotic with too much ornament and too little design like a modern house that keats felt this defect strongly is evident from his modest preface wherein he speaks of endymion not as a deed accomplished but only as an unsuccessful attempt to suggest the underlying beauty of greek mythology lamia and other poems keats's third and last volume lamia isabella the eve of st agnes and other poems eighteen twenty is the one with which the reader should begin his acquaintance with this master of english verse it has only two subjects greek mythology and medieval romance hyperion is a magnificent fragment suggesting the first arch of a cathedral that was never finished its theme is the overthrow of the titans by the young sun-god apollo realizing his own immaturity and lack of knowledge keats laid aside this work and only the pleadings of his publisher induced him to print the fragment with its completed poems throughout this last volume and especially in hyperion the influence of milton is apparent while spencer is more frequently suggested in reading endymion of the longer poems in the volume lamia is the most suggestive it is the story of a beautiful enchantress who turns from a serpent into a glorious woman and fills every human sense with delight until as a result of the foolish philosophy of old apollonius she vanishes forever from her lover's sight the eve of st agnes the most perfect of keats's medieval poems is not a story after the manner of the metrical romances but rather a vivid painting of a romantic mood such as comes to all men at times to glorify a workaday world like all the work of keats and shelley it has an element of unreality and when we read at the end and they are gone ay ages long ago these lovers fled away into the storm it is as if we were waking from a dream which is the only possible ending to all of keats's greek and medieval fancies we are to remember however that no beautiful thing though it be intangible as a dream can enter a man's life and leave him quite the same afterwards keats's own word is here suggestive the imagination he said may be likened to adam's dream he awoke and found it true it is by his short poems that keats is known to the majority of present-day readers among these exquisite shorter poems we mention only the four odes on a grecian urn to a nightingale to autumn and to psyche these are like an invitation to a feast one who reads them will hardly be satisfied until he knows more of such delightful poetry those who study only the ode to a nightingale might find four things a love of sensuous beauty a touch of pessimism a purely pagan conception of nature 
and a strong individualism which are characteristic of this last of the romantic poets as wordsworth's work is too often marred by the moralizer and byron's by the demagogue and shelley's by the reformer so keats's work suffers by the opposite extreme of aloofness from every human interest so much so that he is often accused of being indifferent to humanity his work is also criticized as being too effeminate for ordinary readers three things should be remembered in this connection first that keats sought to express beauty for its own sake that beauty is as essential to normal humanity as is government or law and that the higher man climbs in civilization the more imperative becomes his need of beauty as a reward for his labors second that keats's letters are as much an indication of the man as is his poetry and in his letters with their human sympathy their eager interest in social problems their humor and their keen insight into life there is no trace of effeminacy but rather every indication of a strong and noble manhood the third thing to remember is that all keats's work was done in three or four years with small preparation and that dying at twenty-five he left us a body of poetry which will always be one of our most cherished possessions he is often compared with the marvelous boy chatterton whom he greatly admired and to whose memory he dedicated his endymion but though both died young chatterton was but a child while keats was in all respects a man it is idle to prophesy what he might have done had he been granted a tennyson's long life and scholarly training at twenty-five his work was as mature as was tennyson's at fifty though the maturity suggests the too rapid growth of a tropical plant which under the warm rains and the flood of sunlight leaps into life grows blooms in a day and dies as we have stated keats's work was bitterly and unjustly condemned by the critics of his day he belonged to what was derisively called the cockney school of poetry of which leigh hunt was chief and proctor and beddoes were fellow workmen not even from wordsworth and byron who were ready enough to recommend far less gifted writers did keats receive the slightest encouragement like young lochinvar he rode all unarmed and he rode all alone shelley with his sincerity and generosity was the first to recognize this young genius and in his noble adonais written alas like most of our tributes when the subject of our praise is dead he spoke the first true word of appreciation and placed keats where he unquestionably belongs among our greatest poets the fame denied him in his sad life was granted freely after his death most fitly does he close the list of poets of the romantic revival because in many respects he was the best workman of them all he seems to have studied words more carefully than did his contemporaries and so his poetic expression or the harmony of word and thought is generally more perfect than theirs more than any other he lived for poetry as the noblest of the arts more than any other he emphasized beauty because to him as shown by his grecian urn beauty and truth were one and inseparable and he enriched the whole romantic movement by adding to its interest in common life the spirit rather than the letter of the classics and of elizabethan poetry for these reasons keats is like spencer a poet's poet his work profoundly influenced tennyson and indeed most of the poets of the present era End of section forty seven section forty eight of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued part two prose writers of the romantic period aside from the splendid work of the novel writers walter scott whom we have considered 
and jane austen to whom we shall presently return the early nineteenth century is remarkable for the development of a new and valuable type of critical prose writing if we accept the isolated work of dryden and of addison it is safe to say that literary criticism in its modern sense was hardly known in england until about the year eighteen twenty five such criticism as existed seems to us now to have been largely the result of personal opinion or prejudice indeed we could hardly expect anything else before some systematic study of our literature as a whole had been attempted in one age a poem was called good or bad according as it followed or ran counter to so-called classic rules in another we have the dogmatism of dr johnson in a third the personal judgment of lockhart and the editors of the edinburgh review and the quarterly who so violently abused keats and the lake poets in the name of criticism early in the nineteenth century there arose a new school of criticism which was guided by knowledge of literature on the one hand and by what one might call the fear of god on the other the latter element showed itself in a profound human sympathy the essence of the romantic movement and its importance was summed up by de quincey when he said not to sympathize is not to understand these new critics with abundant reverence for past masters could still lay aside the dogmatism and prejudice which marked johnson and the magazine editors and read sympathetically the work of a new author with the sole idea of finding what he had contributed or tried to contribute to the magnificent total of our literature coleridge hunt hazlitt lamb and de quincey were the leaders in this new and immensely important development and we must not forget the importance of the new periodicals like the london magazine founded in eighteen twenty in which lamb de quincey and carlyle found their first real encouragement of coleridge's biographica literaria and his lectures on shakespeare we have already spoken lee hunt seventeen eighty four eighteen fifty nine wrote continuously for more than thirty years as editor and essayist and his chief object seems to have been to make good literature known and appreciated william hazlitt seventeen seventy eight eighteen thirty in a long series of lectures and essays treated all reading as a kind of romantic journey into new and pleasant countries to his work largely with that of lamb was due the new interest in elizabethan literature which so strongly influenced keats's last and best volume of poetry for those interested in the art of criticism and in the appreciation of literature both hunt and hazlitt will well repay study but we must pass over their work to consider the larger literary interest of lamb and de quincey who were not simply critics of other men's labor but who also produced some delightful work of their own which the world has carefully put away among the things worthy to be remembered charles lamb seventeen seventy five eighteen thirty four in lamb and wordsworth we have two widely different views of the romantic movement one shows the influence of nature and solitude the other of society lamb was a lifelong friend of coleridge and an admirer and defender of the poetic creed of wordsworth but while the latter lived apart from men content with nature and with reading an occasional moral lesson to society lamb was born and lived in the midst of the london streets the city crowd with its pleasures and occupations its endless little comedies and tragedies alone interested him according to his own account when he paused in the crowded street tears would spring to his eyes tears of pure pleasure at the abundance of so much good life and when he wrote he simply interpreted that crowded human life of joy and sorrow as wordsworth interpreted the woods and waters without any desire to change or to reform them 
he has given us the best pictures we possess of coleridge hazlitt lander hood cowden clark and many more of the interesting men and women of his age and it is due to his insight and sympathy that the life of those far-off days seems almost as real to us as if we ourselves remembered it of all our english essayists he is the most lovable partly because of his delicate old-fashioned style and humor but more because of that cheery and heroic struggle against misfortune which shines like a subdued light in all his writings life in the very heart of london there is a curious old-fashioned place known as the temple an enormous rambling apparently forgotten structure dusty and still in the midst of the endless roar of the city streets originally it was a chapter house of the knights templars and so suggests to us the spirit of the crusades and of the middle ages but now the building is given over almost entirely to the offices and lodgings of london lawyers it is this queer old place which more than all others is associated with the name of charles lamb i was born he says and passed the first seven years of my life in the temple its gardens its halls its fountain its river these are my oldest recollections he was the son of a poor clerk or rather servant of one of the barristers and was the youngest of seven children only three of whom survived infancy of these three john the elder was apparently a selfish creature who took no part in the heroic struggle of his brother and sister at seven years charles was sent to the famous blue coat charity school of christ's hospital here he remained seven years and here he formed his lifelong friendship for another poor neglected boy whom the world remembers as coleridge note see christ's hospital five and thirty years ago in essays of elia when only fourteen years old lamb left the charity school and was soon at work as a clerk in the south sea house two years later he became a clerk in the famous india house where he worked steadily for thirty-three years with the exception of six weeks in the winter of seventeen ninety five seventeen ninety six spent within the walls of an asylum in seventeen ninety six lamb's sister mary who was as talented and remarkable as lamb himself went violently insane and killed her own mother for a long time after this appalling tragedy she was in an asylum at hoxton then lamb in seventeen ninety seven brought her to his own little house and for the remainder of his life cared for her with a tenderness and devotion which furnishes one of the most beautiful pages in our literary history at times the malady would return to mary giving sure warning of its terrible approach and then brother and sister might be seen walking silently hand in hand to the gates of the asylum their cheeks wet with tears one must remember this as well as lamb's humble lodgings and the drudgery of his daily work in the big commercial house if he would appreciate the pathos of the old familiar faces or the heroism which shines through the most human and the most delightful essays in our language when lamb was fifty years of age the east india company led partly by his literary fame following his first essays of elia and partly by his thirty-three years of faithful service granted him a comfortable pension and happy as a boy turned loose from school he left india house for ever to give himself up to literary work he wrote to wordsworth in april eighteen twenty five i came home for ever on tuesday of last week it was like passing from life into eternity curiously enough lamb seems to lose power after his release from drudgery and his last essays published in eighteen thirty three lack something of the grace and charm of his earlier work he died at edmonton in eighteen thirty four and his gifted sister mary sank rapidly into the gulf from which his strength and gentleness had so long held her back 
no literary man was ever more loved and honored by a rare circle of friends and all who knew him bear witness to the simplicity and goodness which any reader may find for himself between the lines of his essays works the works of lamb divide themselves naturally into three periods first there are his early literary efforts including the poems signed c l in coleridge's poems on various subjects seventeen ninety six his romance rosamund gray seventeen ninety eight his poetical drama john woodville eighteen o two and various other immature works in prose and poetry this period comes to an end in eighteen o three when he gave up his newspaper work especially the contribution of six jokes puns and squibs daily to the morning post at sixpence apiece the second period was given largely to literary criticism and the tales from shakespeare eighteen o seven written by charles and mary lamb the former reproducing the tragedies and the latter the comedies may be regarded as his first successful literary venture the book was written primarily for children but so thoroughly had brother and sister steeped themselves in the literature of the elizabethan period that young and old alike were delighted with this new version of shakespeare's stories and the tales are still regarded as the best of their kind in our literature in eighteen o eight appeared his specimens of english dramatic poets contemporary with shakespeare this carried out the splendid critical work of coleridge and was the most noticeable influence in developing the poetic qualities of keats as shown in his last volume essays of elia the third period includes lamb's criticisms of life which are gathered together in his essays of elia eighteen twenty three and his last essays of elia which were published ten years later these famous essays began in eighteen twenty with the appearance of the new london magazine note in the first essay the south sea house lamb assumed as a joke the name of a former clerk elia other essays followed and the name was retained when several successful essays were published in book form in eighteen twenty three in these essays elia is lamb himself and cousin bridget is his sister mary End of note and were continued for many years such subjects as the dissertation on roast pig old china praise of chimney sweepers imperfect sympathies a chapter on ears mrs battle's opinions on whist mackery end grace before meat dream children and many others being chosen apparently at random but all leading to a delightful interpretation of the life of london as it appeared to a quiet little man who walked unnoticed through its crowded streets in the first and last essays which we have mentioned dissertation on roast pig and dream children we have the extremes of lamb's humor and pathos lamb's style the style of all these essays is gentle old-fashioned irresistibly attractive lamb was especially fond of old writers and borrowed unconsciously from the style of burton's anatomy of melancholy and from brown's religio medici and from the early english dramatists but this style had become a part of lamb by long reading and he was apparently unable to express his new thought without using their old quaint expressions though these essays are all criticisms or appreciation of the life of his age they are all intensely personal in other words they are an excellent picture of lamb and of humanity without a trace of vanity or self-assertion lamb begins with himself with some purely personal mood or experience and from this he leads the reader to see life and literature as he saw it it is this wonderful combination of personal and universal interests together with lamb's rare old style and quaint humor which make the essays remarkable 
they continue the best tradition of addison and steele our first great essayists but their sympathies are broader and deeper and their humor more delicious than any which preceded them end of section forty eight section forty nine of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued thomas de quincey seventeen eighty five eighteen fifty nine in de quincey the romantic element is even more strongly developed than in lamb not only in his critical work but also in his erratic and imaginative life he was profoundly educated even more so than coleridge and was one of the keenest intellects of the age yet his wonderful intellect seems always subordinate to his passion for dreaming like lamb he was a friend and associate of the lake poets making his headquarters in wordsworth's old cottage at grasmere for nearly twenty years here the resemblance ceases and a marked contrast begins as a man lamb is the most human and lovable of all our essayists while de quincey is the most uncanny and incomprehensible lamb's modest works breathe the two essential qualities of sympathy and humor the greater number of de quincey's essays while possessing more or less of both of these qualities are characterized chiefly by their brilliant style life as seen through de quincey's eyes is nebulous and chaotic and there is a suspicion of the fabulous in all that he wrote even in the revolt of the tartars the romantic element is uppermost and in much of de quincey's prose the element of unreality is more noticeable than in shelley's poetry of his subject matter his facts ideas and criticisms we are generally suspicious but of his style sometimes stately and sometimes headlong now gorgeous as an oriental dream now musical as keats and dimion and always even in the most violent contrasts showing a harmony between the idea and the expression such as no other english writer with the possible exception of newman has ever rivalled say what you will of the marvelous brilliancy of de quincey's style you have still only half expressed the truth it is the style alone which makes these essays immortal life de quincey was born in manchester in seventeen eighty five in neither his father who was a prosperous merchant nor his mother who was a quiet unsympathetic woman do we see any suggestion of the son's almost uncanny genius as a child he was given to dreams more vivid and intense but less beautiful than those of the young blake to whom he bears a strong resemblance in the grammar school at bath he displayed astonishing ability and acquired greek and latin with a rapidity that frightened his slow tutors at fifteen he not only read greek but spoke it fluently and one of his astounded teachers remarked that boy could harangue an athenian mob better than you or i could address an english one from the grammar school at manchester whither he was sent in eighteen hundred he soon ran away finding the instruction far below his abilities and the rough life absolutely intolerable to his sensitive nature an uncle just home from india interceded for the boy lest he be sent back to the school which he hated and with an allowance of a guinea a week he started a career of vagrancy much like that of goldsmith living on the open hills in the huts of shepherds and charcoal burners in the tents of gypsies wherever fancy led him his fear of the manchester school finally led him to run away to london where without money or friends his life was even more extraordinary than his gypsy wanderings the details of this vagrancy are best learned in his confessions of an english opium-eater where we meet not simply the facts of his life but also the confusion of dreams and fancies in the midst of which he wandered like a man lost on the mountains with storm-clouds under his feet hiding the familiar earth 
after a year of vagrancy and starvation he was found by his family and allowed to go to oxford where his career was marked by the most brilliant and erratic scholarship when ready for a degree in eighteen o seven he passed his written tests successfully but felt a sudden terror at the thought of the oral examination and disappeared from the university never to return it was in oxford that de quincey began the use of opium to relieve the pains of neuralgia and the habit increased until he was an almost hopeless slave to the drug only his extraordinary will-power enabled him to break away from the habit after some thirty years of misery some peculiarity of his delicate constitution enabled de quincey to take enormous quantities of opium enough to kill several ordinary men and it was largely opium working upon a sensitive imagination which produced his gorgeous dreams broken by intervals of weakness and profound depression for twenty years he resided at grasmere in the companionship of the lake poets and here led by the loss of his small fortune he began to write with the idea of supporting his family in eighteen twenty one he published his first famous work the confessions of an english opium eater and for nearly forty years afterwards he wrote industriously contributing to various magazines an astonishing number of essays on a great variety of subjects without thought of literary fame he contributed these articles anonymously but fortunately in eighteen fifty three he began to collect his own works and the last of fourteen volumes was published just after his death in eighteen thirty led by his connection with blackwood's magazine to which he was the chief contributor de quincey removed with his family to edinburgh where his erratic genius and his singularly childlike ways produced enough amusing anecdotes to fill a volume he would take a room in some place unknown to his friends and family would live in it for a few years until he had filled it even to the bathtub with books and with his own chaotic manuscripts allowing no one to enter or disturb his den and then when the place became too crowded he would lock the door and go away and take another lodging where he repeated the same extraordinary performance he died in edinburgh in eighteen fifty nine like lamb he was a small boyish figure gentle and elaborately courteous though excessively shy and escaping as often as possible to solitude he was nevertheless fond of society and his wide knowledge and vivid imagination made his conversations almost as prized as those of his friend coleridge works de quincey's works may be divided into two general classes the first includes his numerous critical articles and the second his autobiographical sketches all his works it must be remembered were contributed to various magazines and were hastily collected just before his death hence the general impression of chaos which we get from reading them critical essays from a literary viewpoint the most illuminating of de quincey's critical works is his literary reminiscences this contains brilliant appreciations of wordsworth coleridge lamb shelley keats hazlitt and landor as well as some interesting studies of the literary figures of the age preceding among the best of his brilliant critical essays are on the knocking at the gate in macbeth eighteen twenty three which is admirably suited to show the man's critical genius and murder considered as one of the fine arts eighteen twenty seven which reveals his grotesque humor other suggestive critical works if one must choose among such a multitude are his letters to a young man eighteen twenty three joan of arc eighteen forty seven the revolt of the tartars eighteen forty and the english mail coach eighteen forty nine in the last named essay the dream fugue is one of the most imaginative of all his curious works confessions of an opium eater etc 
of de quincey's autobiographical sketches the best known is his confessions of an english opium eater eighteen twenty one this is only partly a record of opium dreams and its chief interest lies in the glimpses it gives us of de quincey's own life and wanderings this should be followed by suspiria de profundis eighteen forty five which is chiefly a record of gloomy and terrible dreams produced by opiates the most interesting parts of his suspiria showing de quincey's marvelous insight into dreams are those in which we are brought face to face with the strange feminine creations levana madonna our lady of sighs and our lady of darkness a series of nearly thirty articles which he collected in eighteen fifty three called autobiographic sketches completes the revelation of the author's own life among his miscellaneous works may be mentioned in order to show his wide range of subjects klosterheim a novel logic of political economy the essays on style and rhetoric philosophy of herodotus and his articles on goethe pope schiller and shakespeare which he contributed to the encyclopedia britannica the style of de quincey de quincey's style is a revelation of the beauty of the english language and it profoundly influenced ruskin and other prose writers of the victorian age it has two chief faults diffuseness which continually leads de quincey away from his object and triviality which often makes him halt in the midst of a marvelous paragraph to make some light jest or witticism that has some humor but no mirth in it notwithstanding these faults de quincey's prose is still among the few supreme examples of style in our language though he was profoundly influenced by the seventeenth century writers he attempted definitely to create a new style which should combine the best elements of prose and poetry in consequence his prose works are often like those of milton more imaginative and melodious than much of our poetry he has been well called the psychologist of style and as such his works will never be popular but to the few who can appreciate him he will always be an inspiration to better writing one has a deeper respect for our english language and literature after reading him secondary writers of romanticism one has only to glance back over the authors we have been studying wordsworth coleridge salvey byron shelley keats scott lamb de quincey to realize the great change which swept over the life and literature of england in a single half century under two influences which we now know as the french revolution in history and the romantic movement in literature in life men had rebelled against the too strict authority of state and society in literature they rebelled even more vigorously against the bonds of classicism which had sternly repressed a writer's ambition to follow his own ideals and to express them in his own way naturally such an age of revolution was essentially poetic only the elizabethan age surpasses it in this respect and it produced a large number of minor writers who followed more or less closely the example of its great leaders among novelists we have jane austen francis burney maria edgeworth jane porter and susan ferrier all women be it noted among the poets campbell moore hogg parentheses the ettrick shepherd mrs hamans haber kebble hood and ingoldsby parentheses richard barham and among miscellaneous writers sidney smith christopher north parentheses john wilson chalmers lockhart lee hunt hazlitt hallam and lander here is an astonishing variety of writers and to consider all their claims to remembrance would of itself require a volume though these are generally classed as secondary writers much of their work has claims to popularity and some of it to permanence moore's irish melodies campbell's lyrics 
keble's christian year and jane porter's thaddeus of warsaw and scottish chiefs have still a multitude of readers where keats lamb and de quincey are prized only by the cultured few and hallam's historical and critical works are perhaps better known than those of gibbon who nevertheless occupies a larger place in our literature among all these writers we choose only two jane austen and walter savage landor whose works indicate a period of transition from the romantic to the victorian age end of section forty nine section fifty of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued jane austen seventeen seventy five eighteen seventeen we have so lately rediscovered the charm and genius of this gifted young woman that she seems to be a novelist of yesterday rather than the contemporary of wordsworth and coleridge and few even of her readers realize that she did for the english novel precisely what the late poets did for english poetry she refined and simplified it making it a true reflection of english life like the late poets she met with scanty encouragement in her own generation her greatest novel pride and prejudice was finished in seventeen ninety seven a year before the appearance of the famous lyrical ballads of wordsworth and coleridge but while the latter book was published and found a few appreciative readers the manuscript of this wonderful novel went begging for sixteen years before it found a publisher as wordsworth began with the deliberate purpose of making poetry natural and truthful so miss austen appears to have begun writing with the idea of presenting the life of english country society exactly as it was in opposition to the romantic extravagance of mrs radcliffe and her school but there was this difference that miss austen had in large measure the saving gift of humor which wordsworth sadly lacked maria edgeworth at the same time set a sane and excellent example in her tales of irish life the absentee and castle rack rent and miss austen followed up the advantage with at least six works which have grown steadily in value until we place them gladly in the first rank of our novels of common life it is not simply for her exquisite charm therefore that we admire her but also for her influence in bringing our novels back to their true place as an expression of human life it is due partly at least to her influence that a multitude of readers were ready to appreciate mrs gaskell's cranford and the powerful and enduring work of george eliot life jane austen's life gives little opportunity for the biographer unless perchance he has something of her own power to show the beauty and charm of commonplace things she was the seventh child of rev george austen rector of steventon and was born in the parsonage of the village in seventeen seventy five with her sisters she was educated at home and passed her life very quietly cheerfully in the doing of small domestic duties to which love lent the magic lamp that makes all things beautiful she began to write at an early age and seems to have done her work on a little table in the family sitting-room in the midst of the family life when a visitor entered she would throw a paper or a piece of sewing over her work and she modestly refused to be known as the author of novels which we now count among our treasured possessions with the publishers she had little success pride and prejudice went begging as we have said for sixteen years and north hanger abbey seventeen ninety eight was sold for a trivial sum to a publisher who laid it aside and forgot it until the appearance and moderate success of sense and sensibility in eighteen eleven then after keeping the manuscript some fifteen years he sold it back to the family who found another publisher 
an anonymous article in the quarterly review following the appearance of emma in 1815 full of generous appreciation of the charm of the new writer was the beginning of jane austen's fame and it is only within a few years that we have learned that the friendly and discerning critic was walter scott he continued to be her admirer until her early death but these two the greatest writers of fiction in their age were never brought together both were home-loving people and miss austen especially was averse to publicity and popularity she died quietly as she had lived at winchester in eighteen seventeen and was buried in the cathedral she was a bright attractive little woman whose sunny qualities are unconsciously reflected in all her books works very few english writers ever had so narrow a field of work as jane austen like the french novelists whose success seems to lie in choosing the tiny field that they know best her works have an exquisite perfection that is lacking in most of our writers of fiction with the exception of an occasional visit to the watering place of bath her whole life was spent in small country parishes whose simple country people became the characters of her novels her brothers were in the navy and so naval officers furnished the only exciting elements in her stories but even these alleged heroes lay aside their imposing martial ways and act like themselves and other people such was her literary field in which the chief duties were of the household the chief pleasures in country gatherings and the chief interests in matrimony life with its mighty interests its passions ambitions and tragic struggles swept by like a great river while the secluded interests of a country parish went round and round quietly like an eddy behind a sheltering rock we can easily understand therefore the limitations of jane austen but within her own field she is unequalled her characters are absolutely true to life and all her work has the perfection of a delicate miniature painting the most widely read of her novels is pride and prejudice but three others sense and sensibility emma and mansfield park have slowly won their way to the front rank of fiction from a literary viewpoint northanger abbey is perhaps the best for in it we find that touch of humor and delicate satire with which this gentle little woman combated the grotesque popular novels of the udolpho type reading any of these works one is inclined to accept the hearty endorsement of sir walter scott that young lady has a talent for describing the involvements and feelings and characters of ordinary life which is to me the most wonderful i ever met with the big bow-wow strain i can do myself like any now going but the exquisite touch which renders ordinary commonplace things and characters interesting from the truth of the description and the sentiment is denied to me what a pity such a gifted creature died so early walter savage landor seventeen seventy five eighteen sixty four while hazlitt lamb de quincey and other romantic critics went back to early english literature for their inspiration landor shows a reaction from the prevailing romanticism by his imitation of the ancient classic writers his life was an extraordinary one and like his work abounded in sharp contrasts on the one hand there are his egoism his uncontrollable anger his perpetual lawsuits and the last sad tragedy with his children which suggests king lear and his daughters on the other hand there is his steady devotion to the classics and to the cultivation of the deep wisdom of the ancients which suggests pindar and cicero in his works we find the wild extravagance of jabir followed by the superb classic style and charm of pericles and aspasia such was landor a man of high ideals perpetually at war with himself and the world life landor's stormy life covers the whole period from wordsworth's childhood to the middle of the victorian era he was the son of a physician and was born at warwick in seventeen seventy five 
from his mother he inherited a fortune but it was soon scattered by large expenditures and law quarrels and in his old age refused help by his own children only browning's generosity kept landor from actual want at rugby and at oxford his extreme republicanism brought him into constant trouble and his fitting out a band of volunteers to assist the spaniards against napoleon in eighteen o eight allies him with byron and his quixotic followers the resemblance to byron is even more strikingly shown in the poem jabir published in seventeen ninety eight a year made famous by the lyrical ballads of wordsworth and coleridge a remarkable change in lander's life is noticeable in eighteen twenty one when at forty-six years of age after having lost his magnificent estate at lanthony abbey in glamorganshire and after a stormy experience in como he settled down for a time at fiesole near florence to this period of calm after storm we owe the classical prose works for which he is famous the calm like that at the centre of a whirlwind lasted but a short time and landor leaving his family in great anger returned to bath where he lived alone for more than twenty years then in order to escape a libel suit the choleric old man fled back to italy he died at florence in eighteen sixty four the spirit of his whole life may be inferred from the defiant farewell which he flung to it i strove with none for none was worthy of my strife nature i loved and next to nature art i warmed both hands before the fire of life it sinks and i am ready to depart works landor's reaction from romanticism is all the more remarkable in view of his early efforts such as jabir a wildly romantic poem which rivals any work of byron or shelley in its extravagance notwithstanding its occasional beautiful and suggestive lines the work was not and never has been successful and the same may be said of all his poetical works his first collection of poems was published in seventeen ninety five his last a full half century later in eighteen forty six in the latter volume the hellenics which included some translations of his earlier latin poems called idilia eroica one has only to read the hamadryad and compare it with the lyrics of the first volume in order to realize the astonishing literary vigor of a man who published two volumes a half century apart without any appreciable diminution of poetical feeling in all these poems one is impressed by the striking and original figures of speech which lander uses to emphasize his meaning it is by his prose works largely that lander has won a place in our literature partly because of their intrinsic worth their penetrating thought and severe classic style and partly because of their profound influence upon the writers of the present age the most noted of his prose works are his six volumes of imaginary conversations eighteen twenty four eighteen forty six for these conversations landor brings together sometimes in groups sometimes in couples well-known characters or rather shadows from the four corners of the earth and from the remotest ages of recorded history thus diogenes talks with plato aesop with a young slave girl in egypt henry the eighth with anne boleyn in prison dante with beatrice leofric with lady godiva all these and many others from epictetus to cromwell are brought together and speak of life and love and death each from his own viewpoint occasionally as in the meeting of henry and anne boleyn the situation is tense and dramatic but as a rule the characters simply meet and converse in the same quiet strain which becomes after much reading somewhat monotonous on the other hand one who reads the imaginary conversations is lifted at once into a calm and noble atmosphere which braces and inspires him making him forget petty things like a view from a hilltop by its combination of lofty thought and severely classic style the book has won and deserves a very high place among our literary records the same criticism applies to pericles and aspasia 
which is a series of imaginary letters telling the experiences of aspasia a young lady from asia minor who visits athens at the summit of its fame and glory in the great age of pericles this is in our judgment the best worth reading of all landor's works one gets from it not only landor's classic style but what is well worth while a better picture of greece in the days of its greatness than can be obtained from many historical volumes summary of the age of romanticism this period extends from the war with the colonies following the declaration of independence in seventeen seventy six to the accession of victoria in eighteen thirty seven both limits being indefinite as will be seen by a glance at the chronology following during the first part of the period especially england was in a continual turmoil produced by political and economic agitation at home and by the long wars that covered two continents and the wide sea between them the mighty changes resulting from these two causes have given this period the name of the age of revolution the storm centre of all the turmoil at home and abroad was the french revolution which had a profound influence on the life and literature of all europe on the continent the overthrow of napoleon at waterloo eighteen fifteen apparently checked the progress of liberty which had started with the french revolution but in england the case was reversed the agitation for popular liberty which at one time threatened a revolution went steadily forward till it resulted in the final triumph of democracy in the reform bill of eighteen thirty two and in a number of exceedingly important reforms such as the extension of manhood suffrage the removal of the last unjust restrictions against catholics the establishment of a national system of schools followed by a rapid increase in popular education and the abolition of slavery in all english colonies eighteen thirty three to this we must add the changes produced by the discovery of steam and the invention of machinery which rapidly changed england from an agricultural to a manufacturing nation introduced the factory system and caused this period to be known as the age of industrial revolution the literature of the age is largely poetical in form and almost entirely romantic in spirit for as we have noted the triumph of democracy in government is generally accompanied by the triumph of romanticism in literature at first the literature as shown especially in the early work of wordsworth byron and shelley reflected the turmoil of the age and the wild hopes of an ideal democracy occasioned by the french revolution later the extravagant enthusiasm subsided and english writers produced so much excellent literature that the age is often called the second creative period the first being the age of elizabeth the six chief characteristics of the age are the prevalence of romantic poetry the creation of the historical novel by scott the first appearance of women novelists such as mrs anne radcliffe jane porter maria edgeworth and jane austen the development of literary criticism in the work of lamb de quincey coleridge and hazlitt the practical and economic bent of philosophy as shown in the works of malthus james mill and adam smith and the establishment of great literary magazines like the edinburgh review the quarterly blackwoods and the athenaeum in our study we have noted one the poets of romanticism the importance of the lyrical ballads of seventeen ninety eight the life and work of wordsworth coleridge scott byron shelley and keats two the prose writers the novels of scott the development of literary criticism the life and work of the essayists lamb de quincey landor and of the novelist jane austen suggestive questions note in a period like the age of romanticism the poems and essays chosen for special study vary so widely that only a few general questions on the selections for reading are attempted 
one why is this period of romanticism seventeen eighty nine eighteen thirty seven called the age of revolution give some reasons for the influence of the french revolution on english literature and illustrate from poems or essays which you have read explain the difference between classicism and romanticism which of these two types of literature do you prefer two what are the general characteristics of the literature of this period what two opposing tendencies are illustrated in the novels of scott and jane austen in the poetry of byron and wordsworth three wordsworth tell briefly the story of wordsworth's life and name some of his best poems why do the lyrical ballads seventeen ninety eight mark an important literary epoch read carefully and make an analysis of the intimations of immortality of tintern abbey can you explain what political conditions are referred to in wordsworth's sonnet on milton in his french revolution does he attempt to paint a picture in his sonnet on westminster bridge or has he some other object in view what is the general teaching of the ode to duty compare wordsworth's two skylark poems with shelley's make a brief comparison between wordsworth's sonnets and those of shakespeare and of milton having in mind the thought the melody the view of nature and the imagery of the three poets quote from wordsworth's poems to show his belief that nature is conscious to show the influence of nature on man to show his interest in children his sensitiveness to sounds to illustrate the chastening influence of sorrow make a brief comparison between the characters of wordsworth's michael and of burns the cotter's saturday night compare wordsworth's point of view and method in the three poems to a daisy with burns view as expressed in his famous lines on the same subjects four coleridge what are the general characteristics of coleridge's life what explains the profound sympathy for humanity that is reflected in his poems for what beside his poems is he remarkable can you quote any passages from his poetry which show the influence of wordsworth what are the characters in the ancient mariner in what respect is this poem romantic give your own reasons for its popularity does the thought or the style of this poem impress you if you have read any of the lectures on shakespeare explain why coleridge's work is called romantic criticism five scott tell the story of scott's life and name his chief poems and novels do you recall any passage from his poetry which suggests his own heroism why was he called the wizard of the north what is the general character of his poetry compare marmion with one of the old ballads having in mind the characters the dramatic interest of the story and the style of writing in what sense is he the creator of the historical novel upon what does he depend to hold the reader's attention compare him in this respect with jane austen which of his characters impress you as being the most lifelike name any novels of the present day which copy scott or show his influence read ivanhoe and the lady of the lake make a brief analysis of each work having in mind the style the plot the dramatic interest the use of adventure and the truth to nature of the different characters six byron why is byron called the revolutionary poet illustrate if possible from his poetry what is the general character of his work in what kind of poetry does he excel quote from child harold to illustrate your opinion describe the typical byronic hero can you explain his great popularity at first and his subsequent loss of influence why is he still popular on the continent do you find more of thought or of emotion in his poetry compare him in this respect with shelley with wordsworth which is the more brilliant writer byron or wordsworth 
which has the more humor which has the healthier mind which has the higher ideal of poetry which is the more inspiring and helpful is it fair to say that byron's quality is power not charm seven shelley what are the chief characteristics of shelley's poetry is it most remarkable for its thought form or imagery what poems show the influence of the french revolution what subjects are considered in lines written among the eugenian hills what does shelley try to teach in the sensitive plant compare shelley's view of nature as reflected in the cloud or the west wind with wordsworth's view as reflected in the prelude tintern abbey daffodils etc to what class of poems does adonais belong what is the subject of the poem name others of the same class how does shelley describe himself in this poem compare shelley's adonais and milton's lycidas with regard to the view of life after death as expressed in the poems what kinds of scenes does shelley like best to describe compare his characters with those of wordsworth of byron do you recall any poems in which he writes of ordinary people or of ordinary experiences eight keats what is the essence of keats's poetical creed as expressed in the ode on a grecian urn what are the remarkable elements in his life and work what striking difference do you find between his early poems and those of shelley and byron what are the chief subjects of his verse what poems show the influence of the classics of elizabethan literature can you explain why his work has been called literary poetry keats and shelley are generally classed together what similarities do you find in their poems give some reasons why keats introduces the old beadsman in the eve of st agnes name some of the literary friends mentioned in keats poetry compare keats characters with those of wordsworth of byron does keats ever remind you of spencer in what respects is your personal preference for wordsworth byron shelley or keats why nine lamb tell briefly the story of lamb's life and name his principal works why is he called the most human of essayists his friends call him the last of the elizabethans why what is the general character of the essays of elia how is the personality of lamb shown in all these essays cite any passages showing lamb's skill in portraying people make a brief comparison between lamb and addison having in mind the subjects treated the style the humor and the interest of both essayists which do you prefer and why ten de quincey what are the general characteristics of de quincey's essays explain why he is called the psychologist of style what accounts for a certain unreal element in all his work read a passage from the english mail coach or from joan of arc or from levana our lady of sorrows and comment freely upon it with regard to style ideas interest and the impression of reality or unreality which it leaves eleven landor in what respects does landor show a reaction from romanticism what qualities make landor's poems stand out so clearly in the memory why for instance do you think lamb was so haunted by rose aylmer quote from landor's poems to illustrate his tenderness his sensitiveness to beauty his power of awakening emotion his delicacy of characterization do you find the same qualities in his prose can you explain why much of his prose seems like a translation from the greek compare a passage from the imaginary conversations with a passage from gibbon or johnson to show the difference between the classic and the pseudo-classic style compare one of landor's characters in imaginary conversations with the same character in history twelve jane austen 
how does jane austen show a reaction from romanticism what important work did she do for the novel to what kind of fiction was her work opposed in what does the charm of her novels consist make a brief comparison between jane austen and scott as illustrated in pride and prejudice and ivanhoe having in mind the subject the characters the manner of treatment and the interest of both narratives do jane austen's characters have to be explained by the author or do they explain themselves which method calls for the greater literary skill what does jane austen say about mrs radcliffe in northanger abbey does she make any other observations on eighteenth century novelists chronology end of the eighteenth and beginning of the nineteenth century history seventeen sixty eighteen twenty george the third seventeen eighty nine seventeen ninety nine french revolution eighteen hundred union of great britain and ireland eighteen o two colonization of australia eighteen o five battle of trafalgar eighteen o seven abolition of slave trade eighteen o eight eighteen fourteen peninsular war eighteen twelve second war with united states eighteen fourteen congress of vienna eighteen fifteen battle of waterloo eighteen nineteen first atlantic steamship eighteen twenty george the fourth death eighteen thirty eighteen twenty six first temperance society eighteen twenty nine catholic emancipation bill eighteen thirty william the fourth death eighteen thirty seven first railway eighteen thirty two reform bill eighteen thirty three emancipation of slaves eighteen thirty four system of national education eighteen thirty seven victoria death nineteen o one literature seventeen seventy eighteen fifty wordsworth seventeen seventy one eighteen thirty two scott seventeen ninety six eighteen sixteen jane austen's novels seventeen ninety eight lyrical ballads of wordsworth and coleridge eighteen o two scott's minstrelsy of the scottish border eighteen o five eighteen seventeen scott's poems eighteen o seven wordsworth's intimations of immortality lamb's tales from shakespeare eighteen o nine eighteen eighteen byron's child harold eighteen ten eighteen thirteen coleridge's lectures on shakespeare eighteen fourteen eighteen thirty one waverley novels eighteen sixteen shelley's alastor eighteen seventeen coleridge's biographia literaria eighteen seventeen eighteen twenty keats poems eighteen 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 twenty shelley's prometheus eighteen twenty wordsworth's dudden's sonnets eighteen twenty eighteen thirty three lamb's essays of elia eighteen twenty one de quincey's confessions eighteen twenty four eighteen forty six landor's imaginary conversations eighteen thirty tennyson's first poems eighteen thirty one scott's last novel eighteen thirty three carlyle's sartor resartus browning's pauline eighteen fifty three eighteen sixty one de quincey's collected essays end of section fifty End of chapter 10section fifty one of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven the victorian age eighteen fifty nineteen hundred the modern period of progress and unrest 
when victoria became queen in 1837 english literature seemed to have entered upon a period of lean years in marked contrast with the poetic fruitfulness of the romantic age which we have just studied coleridge shelley keats byron and scott had passed away and it seemed as if there were no writers in england to fill their places wordsworth had written in eighteen thirty five like clouds that rake the mountain summits or waves that own no curbing hand how fast has brother followed brother from sunshine to sunless land in these lines is reflected the sorrowful spirit of a literary man of the early nineteenth century who remembered the glory that had passed away from the earth but the leanness of these first years is more apparent than real keats and shelley were dead it is true but already there had appeared three disciples of these poets who were destined to be far more widely read than were their masters tennyson had been publishing poetry since eighteen twenty seven his first poems appearing almost simultaneously with the last work of byron shelley and keats but it was not until eighteen forty two with the publication of his collected poems in two volumes that england recognized in him one of her great literary leaders so also elizabeth barrett had been writing since eighteen twenty but not till twenty years later did her poems become deservedly popular and browning had published his pauline in eighteen thirty three but it was not until eighteen forty six when he published the last of the series called bells and pomegranates that the reading public began to appreciate his power and originality moreover even as romanticism seemed passing away a group of great prose writers dickens thackeray carlyle and ruskin had already begun to proclaim the literary glory of a new age which now seems to rank only just below the elizabethan and the romantic periods democracy historical summary amid the multitude of social and political forces of this great age four things stand out clearly first the long struggle of the anglo-saxons for personal liberty is definitely settled and democracy becomes the established order of the day the king who appeared in an age of popular weakness and ignorance and the peers who came with the normans in triumph are both stripped of their power and left as figureheads of a past civilization the last vestige of personal government and of divine right of rulers disappears the house of commons becomes the ruling power in england and a series of new reform bills rapidly extend the suffrage until the whole body of english people choose for themselves the men who shall represent them social unrest second because it is an age of democracy it is an age of popular education of religious tolerance of growing brotherhood and of profound social unrest the slaves had been freed in eighteen thirty three but in the middle of the century england awoke to the fact that slaves are not necessarily negroes stolen in africa to be sold like cattle in the market-place but that multitudes of men women and little children in the mines and factories were victims of a more terrible industrial and social slavery to free these slaves also the unwilling victims of our unnatural competitive methods has been the growing purpose of the victorian age until the present day the ideal of peace third because it is an age of democracy and education it is an age of comparative peace england begins to think less of the pomp and false glitter of fighting and more of its moral evils as the nation realizes that it is the common people who bear the burden and the sorrow and the poverty of war while the privileged classes reap most of the financial and political rewards moreover with the growth of trade and of friendly foreign relations it becomes evident that the social equality for which england was contending at home belongs to the whole race of men that brotherhood is universal not insular 
that a question of justice is never settled by fighting and that war is generally unmitigated horror and barbarism tennyson who came of age when the great reform bill occupied attention expresses the ideals of the liberals of his day who proposed to spread the gospel of peace till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man the federation of the world arts and sciences fourth the victorian age is especially remarkable because of its rapid progress in all the arts and sciences and in mechanical inventions a glance at any record of the industrial achievements of the nineteenth century will show how vast they are and it is unnecessary to repeat here the list of the inventions from spinning looms to steamboats and from matches to electric lights all these material things as well as the growth of education have their influence upon the life of a people and it is inevitable that they should react upon its prose and poetry though as yet we are too much absorbed in our sciences and mechanics to determine accurately their influence upon literature when these new things shall by long use have become familiar as country roads or have been replaced by newer and better things then they also will have their associations and memories and a poem on the railroads may be as suggestive as wordsworth's sonnet on westminster bridge and the busy practical working men who to-day throng our streets and factories may seem to a future and greater age as quaint and poetical as to us seem the slow toilers of the middle ages an age of prose literary characteristics when one is interested enough to trace the genealogy of victoria he finds to his surprise that in her veins flowed the blood both of william the conqueror and of serdic the first saxon king of england and this seems to be symbolic of the literature of her age which embraces the whole realm of saxon and norman life the strength and ideals of the one and the culture and refinement of the other the romantic revival had done its work and england entered upon a new free period in which every form of literature from pure romance to gross realism struggled for expression at this day it is obviously impossible to judge the age as a whole but we are getting far enough away from the early half of it to notice certain definite characteristics first though the age produced many poets and two who deserve to rank among the greatest nevertheless this is emphatically an age of prose and since the number of readers has increased a thousandfold with the spread of popular education it is the age of the newspaper the magazine and the modern novel the first two being the story of the world's daily life and the last our pleasantest form of literary entertainment as well as our most successful method of presenting modern problems and modern ideals the novel in this age fills a place which the drama held in the days of elizabeth and never before in any age or language has the novel appeared in such numbers and in such perfection moral purpose the second marked characteristic of the age is that literature both in prose and in poetry seems to depart from the purely artistic standard of art for art's sake and to be actuated by a definite moral purpose tennyson browning carlyle ruskin who and what were these men if not the teachers of england not vaguely but definitely with superb faith in their message and with the conscious moral purpose to uplift and to instruct even the novel breaks away from scott's romantic influence and first studies life as it is and then points out what life may and ought to be whether we read the fun and sentiment of dickens the social miniatures of thackeray or the psychological studies of george eliot we find in almost every case a definite purpose to sweep away error and to reveal the underlying truth of human life 
so the novel sought to do for society in this age precisely what lyell and darwin sought to do for science that is to find the truth and to show how it might be used to uplift humanity perhaps for this reason the victorian age is emphatically an age of realism rather than of romance not the realism of zola and ibsen but a deeper realism which strives to tell the whole truth showing moral and physical diseases as they are but holding up health and hope as the normal conditions of humanity idealism it is somewhat customary to speak of this age as an age of doubt and pessimism following the new conception of man and of the universe which was formulated by science under the name of involution it is spoken of also as a prosaic age lacking in great ideals both these criticisms seem to be the result of judging a large thing when we are too close to it to get its true proportions just as cologne cathedral one of the world's most perfect structures seems to be a shapeless pile of stone when we stand too close beneath its mighty walls and buttresses tennyson's immature work like that of the minor poets is sometimes in a doubtful or despairing strain but his in memoriam is like a rainbow after storm and browning seems better to express the spirit of his age in the strong manly faith of rabbi ben ezra and in the courageous optimism of all his poetry stedman's victorian anthology is on the whole a most inspiring book of poetry it would be hard to collect more varied cheer from any age and the great essayists like macaulay carlyle ruskin and the great novelists like dickens thackeray george eliot generally leave us with a larger charity and with a deeper faith in our humanity so also the judgment that this age is too practical for great ideals may be only a description of the husk that hides a very full ear of corn it is well to remember that spencer and sidney judged their own age which we now consider to be the greatest in our literary history to be altogether given over to materialism and to be incapable of literary greatness just as time has made us smile at their blindness so the next century may correct our judgment of this as a material age and looking upon the enormous growth of charity and brotherhood among us and at the literature which expresses our faith in men may judge the victorian age to be on the whole the noblest and most inspiring in the history of the world End of section fifty one section fifty two of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued part one the poets of the victorian age alfred tennyson eighteen o nine eighteen ninety two o young mariner you from the haven under the sea-cliff you that are watching the gray magician with eyes of wonder i am merlin and i am dying i am merlin who follow the gleam o oh, young mariner down to the haven call your companions launch your vessel and crowd your canvas and ere it vanishes over the margin after it follow it follow the gleam one who reads this haunting poem of merlin and the gleam finds in it a suggestion of the spirit of the poet's whole life his devotion to the ideal as expressed in poetry his early romantic impressions his struggles doubts triumphs and his thrilling message to his race throughout the entire victorian period tennyson stood at the summit of poetry in england not in vain was he appointed laureate at the death of wordsworth in eighteen fifty for almost alone among those who have held the office he felt the importance of his place and filled it and honored it 
for nearly half a century tennyson was not only a man and a poet he was a voice the voice of a whole people expressing in exquisite melody their doubts and their faith their griefs and their triumphs in the wonderful variety of his verse he suggests all the qualities of england's greatest poets the dreaminess of spencer the majesty of milton the natural simplicity of wordsworth the fantasy of blake and coleridge the melody of keats and shelley the narrative vigor of scott and byron all these striking qualities are evident on successive pages of tennyson's poetry the only thing lacking is the dramatic power of the elizabethans in reflecting the restless spirit of this progressive age tennyson is as remarkable as pope was in voicing the artificiality of the early eighteenth century as a poet therefore who expresses not so much a personal as a national spirit he is probably the most representative literary man of the victorian era life tennyson's life is a remarkable one in this respect that from beginning to end he seems to have been dominated by a single impulse the impulse of poetry he had no large or remarkable experiences no wild oats to sow no great successes or reverses no business cares or public offices for sixty-six years from the appearance of the poems by two brothers in eighteen twenty seven until his death in eighteen ninety two he studied and practised his art continually and exclusively only browning his fellow-worker resembles him in this but the differences in the two men are world-wide tennyson was naturally shy retiring indifferent to men hating noise and publicity loving to be alone with nature like wordsworth browning was sociable delighting in applause in society in travel in the noise and bustle of the big world tennyson was born in the rectory of somersby lincolnshire in eighteen o nine the sweet influences of his early natural surroundings can be better understood from his early poems than from any biography he was one of the twelve children of the rev george clayton tennyson a scholarly clergyman and his wife elizabeth fitch a gentle lovable woman not learned save in gracious household ways to whom the poet pays a son's loyal tribute near the close of the princess it is interesting to note that most of these children were poetically inclined and that two of the brothers charles and frederick gave far greater promise than did alfred when seven years old the boy went to his grandmother's house at luth in order to attend a famous grammar school at that place not even a man's memory which generally makes light of hardship and glorifies early experiences could ever soften tennyson's hatred of school life his complaint was not so much at the roughness of the boys which had so frightened cowper as at the brutality of the teachers who put over the school door a wretched latin inscription translating solomon's barbarous advice about the rod and the child in these psychologic days when the child is more important than the curriculum and when we teach girls and boys rather than latin and arithmetic we read with wonder carlyle's description of his own schoolmaster evidently a type of his kind who knew of the human soul thus much that it had a faculty called memory and could be acted on through the muscular integument by appliance of birch rods after four years of most unsatisfactory school life tennyson returned home and was fitted for the university by his scholarly father with his brothers he wrote many verses and his first efforts appeared in a little volume called poems by two brothers in eighteen twenty seven the next year he entered trinity college cambridge where he became the centre of a brilliant circle of friends chief of whom was the young poet arthur henry hallam 
at the university tennyson soon became known for his poetical ability and two years after his entrance he gained the prize of the chancellor's medal for a poem called timbuktu the subject needless to say being chosen by the chancellor soon after winning this honor tennyson published his first signed work called poems chiefly lyrical eighteen thirty which though it seems somewhat crude and disappointing to us now nevertheless contained the germ of all his later poetry one of the most noticeable things in this volume is the influence which byron evidently exerted over the poet in his early days it was perhaps due largely to the same romantic influence that tennyson and his friend hallam presently sailed away to spain with the idea of joining the army of insurgents against king ferdinand considered purely as a revolutionary venture this was something of a fiasco suggesting the noble duke of york and his ten thousand men he marched them up a hill one day and he marched them down again from a literary viewpoint however the experience was not without its value the deep impression which the wild beauty of the pyrenees made upon the young poet's mind is reflected clearly in the poem enoni in eighteen thirty one tennyson left the university without taking his degree the reasons for this step are not clear but the family was poor and poverty may have played a large part in his determination his father died a few months later but by a generous arrangement with the new rector the family retained the rectory at somersby and here for nearly six years tennyson lived in a retirement which strongly suggests milton at horton he read and studied widely cultivated an intimate acquaintance with nature thought deeply on the problems suggested by the reform bill which was then agitating england and during his leisure hours wrote poetry the first fruits of this retirement appeared late in eighteen thirty two in a wonderful little volume bearing the simple name poems as the work of a youth only twenty-three this book is remarkable for the variety and melody of its verse among its treasures we still read with delight the lotus cedars palace of art a dream of fair women the miller's daughter enoni and the lady of shallot but the critics of the quarterly who had brutally condemned his earlier work were again unmercifully severe the effect of this harsh criticism upon a sensitive nature was most unfortunate and when his friend hallam died in eighteen thirty three tennyson was plunged into a period of gloom and sorrow the sorrow may be read in the exquisite little poem beginning break 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 on thy cold gray stones o sea which was his first published elegy for his friend and the depressing influence of the harsh and unjust criticism is suggested in merlin and the gleam which the reader will understand only after he has read tennyson's biography for nearly ten years after hallam's death tennyson published nothing and his movements are hard to trace as the family went here and there seeking peace and a home in various parts of england but though silent he continued to write poetry and it was in these sad wandering days that he began his immortal in memoriam and his idols of the king in eighteen forty two his friends persuaded him to give his work to the world and with some hesitation he published his poems the success of this work was almost instantaneous and we can appreciate the favor with which it was received when we read the noble blank verse of ulysses and mort d'arthur the perfect little song of grief for hallam which we have already mentioned and the exquisite idols like dora and the gardener's daughter which aroused even wordsworth's enthusiasm and brought from him a letter saying that he had been trying all his life to write such an english pastoral as dora and had failed 
from this time forward tennyson with increasing confidence in himself and his message steadily maintained his place as the best known and best loved poet in england the year eighteen fifty was a happy one for tennyson he was appointed poet laureate to succeed wordsworth and he married emily selwood her whose gentle will has changed my fate and made my life a perfumed altar flame whom he had loved for thirteen years but whom his poverty had prevented him from marrying the year is made further remarkable by the publication of in memoriam probably the most enduring of his poems upon which he had worked at intervals for sixteen years three years later with the money that his work now brought him he leased the house farringford in the isle of wight and settled in the first permanent home he had known since he left the rectory at somersby for the remaining forty years of his life he lived like wordsworth in the stillness of a great peace writing steadily and enjoying the friendship of a large number of people some distinguished some obscure from the kindly and sympathetic victoria to the servants of his own farm all of these he called with equal sincerity his friends and to each one he was the same man simple strong kindly and noble carlyle describes him as a fine large featured dim-eyed bronze-colored shaggy-headed man most restful brotherly solid-hearted loving solitude and hating publicity as he did the numerous tourists from both sides of the ocean who sought him out in his retreat and insisted upon seeing him made his life at times intolerable influenced partly by the desire to escape such popularity he bought land and built for himself a new house aldworth in surrey though he made his home in farringford for the greater part of the year his labor during these years and his marvelous freshness and youthfulness of feeling are best understood by a glance at the contents of his complete works inferior poems like the princess which was written in the first flush of his success and his dramas which were written against the advice of his best friends may easily be criticized but the bulk of his verse shows an astonishing originality and vigor to the very end he died very quietly at aldworth with his family about him in the moonlight and beside him a volume of shakespeare open at the dirge in cymbeline fear no more the heat o the sun nor the furious winter's rages thou thy worldly task hast done home art gone and ta'en thy wages the strong and noble spirit of his life is reflected in one of his best-known poems crossing the bar which was written in his eighty-first year and which he desired should be placed at the end of his collected works sunset and evening star and one clear call for me and may there be no moaning of the bar when i put out to sea but such a tide as moving seems asleep too full for sound and foam when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home twilight and evening bell and after that the dark and may there be no sadness of farewell when i embark for though from out our bourne of time and place the flood may bear me far i hope to see my pilot face to face when i have crossed the bar works at the outset of our study of tennyson's works it may be well to record two things by way of suggestion first tennyson's poetry is not so much to be studied as to be read and appreciated he is a poet to have open on one's table and to enjoy as one enjoys his daily exercise and second we should by all means begin to get acquainted with tennyson in the days of our youth unlike browning who is generally appreciated by more mature minds tennyson is for enjoyment for inspiration rather than for instruction 
only youth can fully appreciate him and youth unfortunately except in a few rare beautiful cases is something which does not dwell with us long after our school days the secret of poetry especially of tennyson's poetry is to be eternally young and like adam in paradise to find every morning a new world fresh wonderful inspiring as if just from the hands of god early poems and dramas except by the student eager to understand the whole range of poetry in this age tennyson's earlier poems and his later dramas may well be omitted opinions vary about both but the general judgment seems to be that the earlier poems show too much of byron's influence and their crudeness suffers by comparison with the exquisitely finished work of tennyson's middle life of dramatic works he wrote seven his great ambition being to present a large part of the history of england in a series of dramas becket was one of the best of these works and met with considerable favor on the stage but like all the others it indicates that tennyson lacked the dramatic power and the humor necessary for a successful playwright the princess and maud among the remaining poems there is such a wide variety that every reader must be left largely to follow his own delightful choice note an excellent little volume for the beginner is van dyck's poems by tennyson which shows the entire range of the poet's work from his earliest to his latest years see selections for reading at the end of this chapter end of note of the poems of eighteen forty two we have already mentioned those best worth reading the princess a medley eighteen forty seven a long poem of over three thousand lines of blank verse is tennyson's answer to the question of woman's rights and woman's sphere which was then as in our own day strongly agitating the public mind in this poem a baby finally solves the problem which philosophers have pondered ever since men began to think connectedly about human society a few exquisite songs like tears idle tears bugle song and sweet and low form the most delightful part of this poem which in general is hardly up to the standard of the poet's later work maud eighteen fifty five is what is called in literature a monodrama telling the story of a lover who passes from morbidness to ecstasy then to anger and murder followed by insanity and recovery this was tennyson's favorite and among his friends he read aloud from it more than from any other poem perhaps if we could hear tennyson read it we should appreciate it better but on the whole it seems overwrought and melodramatic even its lyrics like come into the garden mod which make this work a favorite with young lovers are characterized by prettiness rather than by beauty or strength in memoriam perhaps the most loved of all tennyson's works is in memoriam which on account of both its theme and its exquisite workmanship is one of the few immortal names that were not born to die the immediate occasion of this remarkable poem was tennyson's profound personal grief at the death of his friend hallam as he wrote lyric after lyric inspired by this sad subject the poet's grief became less personal and the greater grief of humanity mourning for its dead and questioning its immortality took possession of him gradually the poem became an expression first of universal doubt and then of universal faith a faith which rests ultimately not on reason or philosophy but on the soul's instinct for immortality the immortality of human love is the theme of the poem which is made up of over one hundred different lyrics the movement takes us through three years rising slowly from poignant sorrow and doubt to a calm peace and hope and ending with a noble hymn of courage and faith a modest courage and a humble faith love inspired which will be a favorite as long as saddened men turn to literature for consolation 
though darwin's greatest books had not yet been written science had already overturned many old conceptions of life and tennyson who lived apart and thought deeply on all the problems of his day gave this poem to the world as his own answer to the doubts and questionings of men this universal human interest together with its exquisite form and melody make the poem in popular favor at least the supreme threnody or elegiac poem of our literature though milton's lycidas is from the critical viewpoint undoubtedly a more artistic work idols of the king the idols of the king ranks among the greatest of tennyson's later works its general subject is the celtic legends of king arthur and his knights of the round table and the chief source of its material is mallory's morte d'arthur here in this mass of beautiful legends is certainly the subject of a great national epic yet after four hundred years during which many poets have used the material the great epic is still unwritten milton and spencer as we have already noted considered this material carefully and milton alone of all english writers had perhaps the power to use it in a great epic tennyson began to use these legends in his morte d'arthur eighteen forty two but the epic idea probably occurred to him later in eighteen fifty six when he began gerent and enid and he added the stories of vivian elaine guinevere and other heroes and heroines at intervals until balen the last of the idols appeared in eighteen eighty five later these works were gathered together and arranged with an attempt at unity the result is in no sense an epic poem but rather a series of single poems loosely connected by a thread of interest in arthur the central personage and in his unsuccessful attempt to found an ideal kingdom english idols entirely different in spirit is another collection of poems called english idols note tennyson made a distinction in spelling between the idols i d y l l s of the king and the english idols i d y l s like dora end of note which began in the poems of eighteen forty two and which tennyson intended should reflect the ideals of widely different types of english life of these varied poems dora the gardener's daughter ulysses locksley hall and sir galahad are the best but all are worthy of study one of the most famous of this series is enoch arden eighteen sixty four in which tennyson turns from medieval knights from lords heroes and fair ladies to find the material for true poetry among the lowly people that make up the bulk of english life its rare melody its sympathy for common life and its revelation of the beauty and heroism which hide in humble men and women everywhere made this work an instant favorite judged by its sales alone it was the most popular of his works during the poet's lifetime tennyson's later volumes like the ballads eighteen eighty and demeter eighteen eighty nine should not be overlooked since they contain some of his best work the former contains stirring war songs like the defense of lucknow and pictures of wild passionate grief like rizpa the latter is notable for romney's remorse a wonderful piece of work merlin and the gleam which expresses the poet's lifelong ideal and several exquisite little songs like the throstle and the oak which show how marvelously the aged poet retained his youthful freshness and inspiration here certainly is variety enough to give us long years of literary enjoyment and we need hardly mention miscellaneous poems like the brook and the charge of the light brigade which are known to every schoolboy and wages and the higher pantheism which should be read by every man who thinks about the old old problem of life and death characteristics of tennyson's poetry 
if we attempt to sum up the quality of tennyson as shown in all these works the task is a difficult one but three things stand out more or less plainly first tennyson is essentially the artist no other in his age studied the art of poetry so constantly or with such singleness of purpose and only swinburne rivals him in melody and the perfect finish of his verse second like all the great writers of his age he is emphatically a teacher often a leader in the preceding age as the result of the turmoil produced by the french revolution lawlessness was more or less common and individuality was the rule in literature tennyson's theme so characteristic of his age is the reign of order of law in the physical world producing evolution and of law in the spiritual world working out the perfect man in memoriam idols of the king the princess here are three widely different poems yet the theme of each so far as poetry is a kind of spiritual philosophy and weighs its words before it utters them is the orderly development of law in the natural and in the spiritual world tennyson's message this certainly is a new doctrine in poetry but the message does not end here law implies a source a method an object tennyson after facing his doubts honestly and manfully finds law even in the sorrows and losses of humanity he gives this law an infinite and personal source and finds the supreme purpose of all law to be a revelation of divine love all earthly love therefore becomes an image of the heavenly what first perhaps attracted readers to tennyson as to shakespeare was the character of his women pure gentle refined beings whom we must revere as our anglo-saxon forefathers revered the women they loved like browning the poet had loved one good woman supremely and her love made clear the meaning of all life the message goes one step farther because law and love are in the world faith is the only reasonable attitude toward life and death even though we understand them not such in a few words seems to be tennyson's whole message and philosophy if we attempt now to fix tennyson's permanent place in literature as the result of his life and work we must apply to him the same test that we applied to milton and wordsworth and indeed to all our great poets and ask with the german critics what new thing has he said to the world or even to his own country the answer is frankly that we do not yet know surely that we are still too near tennyson to judge him impersonally this much however is clear in a marvelously complex age and amid a hundred great men he was regarded as a leader for a full half century he was the voice of england loved and honored as a man and a poet not simply by a few discerning critics but by a whole people that do not easily give their allegiance to any one man and that for the present is tennyson's sufficient eulogy end of section fifty two section fifty three of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued robert browning eighteen twelve eighteen eighty nine how good is man's life the mere living how fit to employ all the heart and the soul and the senses for ever in joy in this new song of david from browning's saul we have a suggestion of the astonishing vigor and hope that characterize all the works of browning the one poet of the age who after thirty years of continuous work was finally recognized and placed beside tennyson and whom future ages may judge to be a greater poet perhaps even the greatest in our literature since shakespeare the chief difficulty in reading browning is the obscurity of his style which the critics of half a century ago held up to ridicule their attitude toward the poet's early work may be inferred from tennyson's humorous criticism of sordello 
it may be remembered that the first line of this obscure poem is who will may hear sordello's story told and that the last line is who would has heard sordello's story told tennyson remarked that these were the only lines in the whole poem that he understood and that they were evidently both lies if we attempt to explain this obscurity which puzzled tennyson and many less friendly critics we find that it has many sources first the poet's thought is often obscure or else so extremely subtle that language expresses it imperfectly thoughts hardly to be packed into a narrow act fancies that broke through language and escaped browning's obscurity second browning is led from one thing to another by his own mental associations and forgets that the reader's associations may be of an entirely different kind third browning is careless in his english and frequently clips his speech giving us a series of ejaculations as we do not quite understand his process of thought we must stop between the ejaculations to trace out the connections fourth browning's allusions are often far-fetched referring to some odd scrap of information which he has picked up in his wide reading and the ordinary reader finds it difficult to trace and understand them finally browning wrote too much and revised too little the time which he should have given to making one thought clear was used in expressing other thoughts that flitted through his head like a flock of swallows his field was the individual soul never exactly alike in any two men and he sought to express the hidden motives and principles which govern individual action in this field he is like a miner delving underground sending up masses of mingled earth and ore and the reader must sift all this material to separate the gold from the dross here certainly are sufficient reasons for browning's obscurity and we must add the word that the fault seems unpardonable for the simple reason that browning shows himself capable at times of writing directly melodiously and with noble simplicity browning as a teacher so much for the faults which must be faced and overlooked before one finds the treasure that is hidden in browning's poetry of all the poets in our literature no other is so completely so consciously so magnificently a teacher of men he feels his mission of faith and courage in a world of doubt and timidity for thirty years he faced indifference and ridicule working bravely and cheerfully the while until he made the world recognize and follow him the spirit of his whole life is well expressed in his paraclesus written when he was only twenty-two years old i see my way as birds their trackless way i shall arrive what time what circuit first i ask not but unless god send his hail or blinding fireballs sleet or stifling snow in some time his good time i shall arrive he guides me and the bird in his good time he is not like so many others an entertaining poet one cannot read him after dinner or when settled in a comfortable easy chair one must sit up and think and be alert when he reads browning if we accept these conditions we shall probably find that browning is the most stimulating poet in our language his influence upon our life is positive and tremendous his strength his joy of life his robust faith and his invincible optimism enter into us making us different and better men after reading him and perhaps the best thing he can say of browning is that his thought is slowly but surely taking possession of all well-educated men and women life browning's father was outwardly a business man a clerk for fifty years in the bank of england 
inwardly he was an interesting combination of the scholar and the artist with the best tastes of both his mother was a sensitive musical woman evidently very lovely in character the daughter of a german shipowner and merchant who had settled in scotland she was of celtic descent and carlyle describes her as the true type of a scottish gentlewoman from his neck down browning was the typical briton short stocky large-chested robust but even in the lifeless portrait his face changes as we view it from different angles now it is like an english business man now like a german scientist and now it has a curious suggestion of uncle remus these being no doubt so many different reflections of his mixed and unremembered ancestors he was born in camberwell on the outskirts of london in eighteen twelve from his home and from his first school at peckham he could see london and the city lights by night and the smoky chimneys by day had the same powerful fascination for the child that the woods and fields and the beautiful country had for his friend tennyson his schooling was short and desultory his education being attended to by private tutors and by his father who left the boy largely to follow his own inclination like the young milton browning was fond of music and in many of his poems especially in abt vogler and a toccata of galuppi's he interprets the musical temperament better perhaps than any other writer in our literature but unlike milton through whose poetry there runs a great melody music seems to have had no consistent effect upon his verse which is often so jarring that one must wonder how a musical ear could have endured it like tennyson this boy found his work very early and for fifty years hardly a week passed that he did not write poetry he began at six to produce verses in imitation of byron but fortunately this early work has been lost then he fell under the influence of shelley and his first known work pauline eighteen thirty three must be considered as a tribute to shelley and his poetry tennyson's earliest work poems by two brothers had been published and well paid for five years before but browning could find no publisher who would even consider pauline and the work was published by means of money furnished by an indulgent relative this poem received scant notice from the reviewers who had pounced like hawks on a dovecote upon tennyson's first two modest volumes two years later appeared paraclesus and then his tragedy strafford was put upon the stage but not till sordello was published in eighteen forty did he attract attention enough to be denounced for the obscurity and vagaries of his style six years later in eighteen forty six he suddenly became famous not because he finished in that year his bells and pomegranates which is browning's symbolic name for poetry and thought or singing and sermonizing but because he eloped with the best-known literary woman in england elizabeth barrett whose fame was for many years both before and after her marriage much greater than browning's and who was at first considered superior to tennyson thereafter until his own work compelled attention he was known chiefly as the man who married elizabeth barrett for years this lady had been an almost helpless invalid and it seemed a quixotic thing when browning having failed to gain her family's consent to the marriage carried her off romantically love and italy proved better than her physicians and for fifteen years browning and his wife lived an ideally happy life in pisa and in florence the exquisite romance of their love is preserved in mrs browning's sonnets from the portuguese and in the volume of letters recently published wonderful letters but so tender and intimate that it seems almost a sacrilege for inquisitive eyes to read them mrs browning died in florence in eighteen sixty one the loss seemed at first too much to bear and browning fled with his son to england 
for the remainder of his life he lived alternately in london and in various parts of italy especially at the palazzo rezzonico in venice which is now an object of pilgrimage to almost every tourist who visits the beautiful city wherever he went he mingled with men and women sociable well-dressed courteous loving crowds and popular applause the very reverse of his friend tennyson his earlier work had been much better appreciated in america than in england but with the publication of the ring and the book in eighteen sixty eight he was at last recognized by his countrymen as one of the greatest of english poets he died in venice on december twelfth eighteen eighty nine the same day that saw the publication of his last work azzolando though italy offered him an honored resting-place england claimed him for her own and he lies buried beside tennyson in westminster abbey the spirit of his whole life is magnificently expressed in his own lines in the epilogue of his last book one who never turned his back but marched breast forward never doubted clouds would break never dreamed though right were worsted wrong would triumph held we fall to rise are baffled to fight better sleep to wake works a glance at even the titles which browning gave to his best-known volumes dramatic lyrics eighteen forty two dramatic romances and lyrics eighteen forty five men and women eighteen fifty three dramatis persona eighteen sixty four will suggest how strong the dramatic element is in all his work indeed all his poems may be divided into three classes pure dramas like strafford and a blot in the scutcheon dramatic narratives like pippa passes which are dramatic in form but were not meant to be acted and dramatic lyrics like the last ride together which are short poems expressing some strong personal emotion or describing some dramatic episode in human life and in which the hero himself generally tells the story browning and shakespeare though browning is often compared with shakespeare the reader will understand that he has very little of shakespeare's dramatic talent he cannot bring a group of people together and let the actions and words of his characters show us the comedy and tragedy of human life neither can the author be disinterested satisfied as shakespeare was with life itself without drawing any moral conclusions browning has always a moral ready and insists upon giving us his own views of life which shakespeare never does his dramatic power lies in depicting what he himself calls the history of a soul sometimes as in paraclesus he endeavors to trace the progress of the human spirit more often he takes some dramatic moment in life some crisis in the ceaseless struggle between good and evil and describes with wonderful insight the hero's own thoughts and feelings but he almost invariably tells us how at such and such a point the good or the evil in his hero must inevitably have triumphed and generally as in my last duchess the speaker adds a word here and there aside from the story which unconsciously shows the kind of man he is it is this power of revealing the soul from within that causes browning to fascinate those who study him long enough his range is enormous and brings all sorts and conditions of men under analysis the musician in abt vogler the artist in andrea del sarto the early christian in a death in the desert the arab horseman in muteke the sailor in Erfkil, the medieval knight in child roland the hebrew in saul the greek in balaustion's adventure the monster in caliban the immortal dead in karshish all these and a hundred more histories of the soul show browning's marvellous versatility 
it is this great range of sympathy with many different types of life that constitutes browning's chief likeness to shakespeare though otherwise there is no comparison between the two men first period of work if we separate all these dramatic poems into three main periods the early from eighteen thirty three to eighteen forty one the middle from eighteen forty one to eighteen sixty eight and the late from eighteen sixty eight to eighteen eighty nine the work of the beginner will be much more easily designated of his early soul studies pauline eighteen thirty three paraclesis eighteen thirty five and sordello eighteen forty little need be said here except perhaps this that if we begin with these works we shall probably never read anything else by browning and that were a pity it is better to leave these obscure works until his better poems have so attracted us to browning that we will cheerfully endure his worst faults for the sake of his undoubted virtues the same criticism applies though in less degree to his first drama strafford eighteen thirty seven which belongs to the early period of his work second period the merciless criticism which greeted sordello had a wholesome effect on browning as is shown in the better work of his second period moreover his new power was developing rapidly as may be seen by comparing the eight numbers of his famous bells and pomegranates series eighteen forty one eighteen forty six with his earlier work thus the first number of this wonderful series published in eighteen forty one contains pippa passes which is on the whole the most perfect of his longer poems and another number contains a blot in the scutcheon which is the most readable of his dramas even a beginner must be thrilled by the beauty and the power of these two works two other noteworthy dramas of the period are colomb's birthday eighteen forty four and in a balcony eighteen fifty five which however met with scant appreciation on the stage having too much subtle analysis and too little action to satisfy the public nearly all his best lyrics dramas and dramatic poems belong to this middle period of labor and when the ring and the book appeared in eighteen sixty eight he had given to the world the noblest expression of his poetic genius third period in the third period beginning when browning was nearly sixty years old he wrote even more industriously than before and published on an average nearly a volume of poetry a year such volumes as fifine at the fair red cotton night cap country the inn album jocoseria and many others show how browning gains steadily in the power of revealing the hidden springs of human action but he often rambles most tiresomely and in general his work loses in sustained interest it is perhaps significant that most of his best work was done under mrs browning's influence what to read of the short miscellaneous poems there is such an unusual variety that one must hesitate a little in suggesting this or that to the beginner's attention my star evelyn hope wanting is what home thoughts from abroad meeting at night one word more an exquisite tribute to his dead wife prospice parentheses look forward songs from pippa passes various love poems like by the fireside and the last ride together the inimitable pied piper and the ballads like herve riel and how they brought the good news these are a mere suggestion expressing only the writer's personal preference but a glance at the contents of browning's volumes will reveal scores of other poems which another writer might recommend as being better in themselves or more characteristic of browning note an excellent little book for the beginner is lovett's selections from browning End of note soul studies 
among browning's dramatic soul studies there is also a very wide choice andrea del sarto is one of the best revealing as it does the strength and the weakness of the perfect painter whose love for a soulless woman with a pretty face saddens his life and hampers his best work next in importance to andrea stands an epistle reciting the experiences of karshish an arab physician which is one of the best examples of browning's peculiar method of presenting the truth the half scoffing half earnest and wholly bewildered state of this oriental scientist's mind is clearly indicated between the lines of his letter to his old master his description of lazarus whom he meets by chance and of the state of mind of one who having seen the glories of immortality must live again in the midst of the jumble of trivial and stupendous things which constitute our life forms one of the most original and suggestive poems in our literature my last duchess is a short but very keen analysis of the soul of a selfish man who reveals his character unconsciously by his words of praise concerning his dead wife's picture in the bishop orders his tomb we have another extraordinarily interesting revelation of the mind of a vain and worldly man this time a churchman whose words tell you far more than he dreams about his own character apt fogler undoubtedly one of browning's finest poems is the study of a musician's soul muleke gives us the soul of an arab vain and proud of his fast horse which was never beaten in a race a rival steals the horse and rides away upon her back but used as she is to her master's touch she will not show her best pace to the stranger muleke rides up furiously but instead of striking the thief from his saddle he boasts about his peerless mare saying that if a certain spot on her neck were touched with the rein she could never be overtaken instantly the robber touches the spot and the mare answers with a burst of speed that makes pursuit hopeless muleke has lost his mare but he has kept his pride in the unbeaten one and is satisfied rabbi ben ezra which refuses analysis and which must be read entire to be appreciated is perhaps the most quoted of all browning's works and contains the best expression of his own faith in life both here and hereafter all these wonderful poems are again merely a suggestion they indicate simply the works to which one reader turns when he feels mentally vigorous enough to pick up browning another list of soul studies citing a toccata of galuppi's a grammarian's funeral fra le polippi sol cleon a death in the desert and soliloquy of the spanish cloister might in another's judgment be more interesting and suggestive pippa passes among browning's longer poems there are two at least which well deserve our study pippa passes aside from its rare poetical qualities is a study of unconscious influence the idea of the poem was suggested to browning while listening to a gypsy girl singing in the woods near his home but he transfers the scene of the action to a little mountain town of azolo in italy pippa is a little silk weaver who goes out in the morning to enjoy her one holiday of the whole year as she thinks of her own happiness she is vaguely wishing that she might share it and do some good then with her childish imagination she begins to weave a little romance in which she shares in the happiness of the four greatest and happiest people in azolo it never occurs to her that perhaps there is more of misery than of happiness in the four great ones of whom she dreams and so she goes on her way singing the years at the spring and days at the morn mornings at seven the hillsides dew pearled the larks on the wing the snails on the thorn god's in his heaven all's right with the world 
fate wills it that the words and music of her little songs should come to the ears of four different groups of people at the moment when they are facing the greatest crises of their lives and turn the scale from evil to good but pippa knows nothing of this she enjoys her holiday and goes to bed still singing entirely ignorant of the good she has done in the world with one exception it is the most perfect of all browning's works at best it is not easy nor merely entertaining reading but it richly repays whatever hours we spend in studying it the ring and the book the ring and the book is browning's masterpiece it is an immense poem twice as long as paradise lost and longer by some two thousand lines than the iliad and before we begin the undoubted task of reading it we must understand that there is no interesting story or dramatic development to carry us along in the beginning we have an outline of the story such as it is a horrible story of count guido's murder of his beautiful young wife and browning tells us in detail just when and how he found a book containing the record of the crime and the trial there the story element ends and the symbolism of the book begins the title of the poem is explained by the habit of the old etruscan goldsmiths who in making one of their elaborately chased rings would mix the pure gold with an alloy in order to harden it when the ring was finished acid was poured upon it and the acid ate out the alloy leaving the beautiful design in pure gold browning purposes to follow the same plan with his literary material which consists simply of the evidence given at the trial of guido in rome in sixteen ninety eight he intends to mix a poet's fancy with the crude facts and create a beautiful and artistic work the result of browning's purpose is a series of monologues in which the same story is retold nine different times by the different actors in the drama the count the young wife the suspected priest the lawyers the pope who presides at the trial each tells the story and each unconsciously reveals the depths of his own nature in the recital the most interesting of the characters are guido the husband who changes from bold defiance to abject fear caponzaki the young priest who aids the wife in her flight from her brutal husband and is unjustly accused of false motives pompilia the young wife one of the noblest characters in literature fit in all respects to rank with shakespeare's great heroines and the pope a splendid figure the strongest of all browning's masculine characters when we have read the story as told by these four different actors we have the best of the poet's work and of the most original poem in our language browning and tennyson browning's place and message browning's place in our literature will be better appreciated by comparison with his friend tennyson whom we have just studied in one respect at least these poets are in perfect accord each finds in love the supreme purpose and meaning of life in other respects especially in their methods of approaching the truth the two men are the exact opposites tennyson is first the artist and then the teacher but with browning the message is always the important thing and he is careless too careless of the form in which it is expressed again tennyson is under the influence of the romantic revival and chooses his subjects daintily but all's fish that comes to browning's net he takes comely and ugly subjects with equal pleasure and aims to show that truth lies hidden in both the evil and the good this contrast is all the more striking when we remember that browning's essentially scientific attitude was taken by a man who refused to study science tennyson whose work is always artistic never studied art but was devoted to the sciences while browning whose work is seldom artistic in form thought that art was the most suitable subject for man's study browning's message 
the two poets differ even more widely in their respective messages tennyson's message reflects the growing order of the age and is summed up in the word law in his view the individual will must be suppressed the self must always be subordinate his resignation is at times almost oriental in its fatalism and occasionally it suggests schopenhauer in its mixture of fate and pessimism browning's message on the other hand is the triumph of the individual will over all obstacles the self is not subordinate but supreme there is nothing oriental nothing doubtful nothing pessimistic in the whole range of his poetry his is the voice of the anglo-saxon standing up in the face of all obstacles and saying i can and i will he is therefore far more radically english than is tennyson and it may be for this reason that he is the more studied and that while youth delights in tennyson manhood is better satisfied with browning because of his invincible will and optimism browning is at present regarded as the poet who has spoken the strongest word of faith to an age of doubt his energy his cheerful courage his faith in life and in the development that awaits us beyond the portals of death are like a bugle call to good living this sums up his present influence upon the minds of those who have learned to appreciate him of the future we can only say that both at home and abroad he seems to be gaining steadily in appreciation as the years go by end of section fifty three Section 54 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 continued. Minor Poets of the Victorian Age. Elizabeth Barrett. Among the minor poets of the past century, Elizabeth Barrett, Mrs. Browning, occupies perhaps the highest place in popular favor. She was born at Coxhoe Hall near Durham in 1806, but her childhood and early youth were spent in Herefordshire, among the Malvern Hills made famous by Piers Plowman in eighteen thirty five the barrett family moved to london where elizabeth gained a literary reputation by the publication of the seraphim and other poems eighteen thirty eight then illness and the shock caused by the tragic death of her brother in eighteen forty placed her frail life in danger and for six years she was confined to her own room the innate strength and beauty of her spirit here showed itself strongly in her daily study her poetry and especially in her interest in the social problems which sooner or later occupied all the victorian writers my mind to me a kingdom is might well have been written over the door of the room where this delicate invalid worked and suffered in loneliness and in silence in eighteen forty four miss barrett published her poems which though somewhat impulsive and overwrought met with remarkable public favor such poems as the cry of the children which voices the protest of humanity against child labor appealed tremendously to the readers of the age and this young woman's fame as a poet temporarily overshadowed that of tennyson and browning indeed as late as eighteen fifty when wordsworth died she was seriously considered for the position of poet laureate which was finally given to tennyson a reference to browning in lady geraldine's courtship is supposed to have first led the poet to write to miss barrett in eighteen forty five soon afterwards he visited the invalid they fell in love almost at first sight and the following year against the wishes of her father who was evidently a selfish old tyrant browning carried her off and married her the exquisite romance of their love is reflected in mrs browning's sonnets from the portuguese eighteen fifty this is a noble and inspiring book of love poems and stedman regards the opening sonnet i thought once how theocritus had sung as equal to any in our language 
for fifteen years the brownings lived an ideally happy life at pisa and at casa guidi florence sharing the same poetical ambitions and love was the greatest thing in the world how do i love thee let me count the ways i love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace i love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight i love thee freely as men strive for right i love thee purely as they turn from praise i love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith i love thee with a love i seemed to lose with my lost saints i love thee with the breath smiles tears of all my life and if god choose i shall but love thee better after death mrs browning entered with whole-souled enthusiasm into the aspirations of italy in its struggle against the tyranny of austria and her casa guidi windows eighteen fifty one is a combination of poetry and politics both it must be confessed a little too emotional in eighteen fifty six she published aurora Leigh, a novel in verse having for its hero a young social reformer and for its heroine a young woman poetical and enthusiastic who strongly suggests elizabeth barrett herself it emphasizes in verse precisely the same moral and social ideals which dickens and george eliot were proclaiming in all their novels her last two volumes were poems before congress eighteen sixty and last poems published after her death she died suddenly in eighteen sixty one and was buried in florence browning's famous line o lyric love half angel and half bird may well apply to her frail life and aerial spirit rossetti dante gabriel rossetti eighteen twenty eight eighteen eighty two the son of an exiled italian painter and scholar was distinguished both as a painter and as a poet he was a leader of the pre-raphaelite movement note this term which means simply italian painters before raphael is generally applied to an artistic movement in the middle of the nineteenth century the term was first used by a brotherhood of german artists who worked together in the convent of san isodoro in rome with the idea of restoring art to its medieval purity and simplicity the term now generally refers to a company of seven young men dante gabriel rossetti and his brother william william holman hunt john everett millay james collinson frederick george stevens and thomas woolner who formed the pre-raphaelite brotherhood in england in eighteen forty eight their official literary organ was called the germ in which much of the early work of morris and rossetti appeared they took for their models the early italian painters who they declared were simple sincere and religious their purpose was to encourage simplicity and naturalness in art and literature and one of their chief objects in the face of doubt and materialism was to express the wonder reverence and awe which characterizes medieval art in its return to the mysticism and symbolism of the medieval age this pre-raphaelitism suggests the contemporary oxford or tractarian movement in religion End of note and published in the first numbers of the germ his hand and soul a delicate prose study and his famous the blessed damoiselle beginning the blessed damoiselle leaned out from the gold bar of heaven her eyes were deeper than the depth of waters stilled at even she had three lilies in her hand and the stars in her hair were seven these two early works especially the blessed damoiselle with its simplicity and exquisite spiritual quality are characteristic of the ideals of the pre-raphaelites 
in eighteen sixty after a long engagement rossetti married elizabeth siddal a delicate beautiful english girl whom he has immortalized both in his pictures and in his poetry she died two years later and rossetti never entirely recovered from the shock at her burial he placed in her coffin the manuscripts of all his unpublished poems and only at the persistent demands of his friends did he allow them to be exhumed and printed in eighteen seventy the publication of his volume of love poems created a sensation in literary circles and rossetti was hailed as one of the greatest of living poets in eighteen eighty one he published his ballads and sonnets a remarkable volume containing among other poems the confession modeled after browning the ballad of sister helen founded on a medieval superstition the king's tragedy a masterpiece of dramatic narrative and the house of life a collection of one hundred and one sonnets reflecting the poet's love and loss this last collection deserves to rank with mrs browning's sonnets from the portuguese and with shakespeare's sonnets as one of the three great cycles of love poems in our language it has been well said that both rossetti and morris paint pictures as well in their poems as on their canvases and this pictorial quality of their verse is its chief characteristic morris william morris eighteen thirty four eighteen ninety six is a most interesting combination of literary man and artist in the latter capacity as architect designer and manufacturer of furniture carpets and wall paper and as founder of the kelmscott press for artistic printing and bookbinding he has laid us all under an immense debt of gratitude from boyhood he had steeped himself in the legends and ideals of the middle ages and his best literary work is wholly medieval in spirit the earthly paradise eighteen sixty eight eighteen seventy is generally regarded as his masterpiece this delightful collection of stories in verse tells of a roving band of vikings who are wrecked on the fabled island of atlantis and who discover there a superior race of men having the characteristics of ideal greeks the vikings remain for a year telling stories of their own northland and listening to the classic and oriental tales of their hosts morris's interest in icelandic literature is further shown by his sigurd the volsung an epic founded upon one of the old sagas and by his prose romances the house of the wolfings the story of the glittering plain and the roots of the mountains later in life he became deeply interested in socialism and two other romances the dream of john ball and news from nowhere are interesting as modern attempts at depicting an ideal society governed by the principles of moore's utopia swinburne algernon charles swinburne eighteen thirty seven nineteen o nine is chronologically the last of the victorian poets as an artist in technique having perfect command of all old english verse forms and a remarkable faculty for inventing new he seems at the present time to rank among the best in our literature indeed as stedman says before his advent we did not realize the full scope of english verse this refers to the melodious and constantly changing form rather than to the content of swinburne's poetry at the death of tennyson in eighteen ninety two he was undoubtedly the greatest living poet and only his liberal opinions his scorn of royalty and of conventions and the prejudice aroused by the pagan spirit of his early work prevented his appointment as poet laureate he has written a very large number of poems dramas and essays in literary criticism but we are still too near to judge of the permanence of his work or of his place in literature 
those who would read and estimate his work for themselves will do well to begin with a volume of selected poems especially those which show his love of the sea and his exquisite appreciation of child life his atalanta in caledon eighteen sixty four a beautiful lyric drama modeled on the greek tragedy is generally regarded as his masterpiece in all his work swinburne carries tennyson's love of melody to an extreme and often sacrifices sense to sound his poetry is always musical and like music appeals almost exclusively to the emotions we have chosen somewhat arbitrarily these four writers mrs browning d g rossetti morris and swinburne as representative of the minor poets of the age but there are many others who are worthy of study arthur hugh clough and matthew arnold note arnold was one of the best-known poets of the age but because he has exerted a deeper influence in our literature as a critic we have reserved him for special study among the essayists End of note who are often called the poets of skepticism but who in reality represent a reverent seeking for truth through reason and human experience frederick william faber the catholic mystic author of some exquisite hymns and the scholarly john keble author of the christian year our best-known book of devotional verse and among the women poets adelaide proctor jean ingelow and christina rossetti each of whom had a large admiring circle of readers it would be a hopeless task at the present time to inquire into the relative merits of all these minor poets we note only their careful workmanship and exquisite melody their wide range of thought and feeling their eager search for truth each in his own way and especially the note of freshness and vitality which they have given to english poetry End of section fifty four Section 55 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 continued. Part 2 The Novelists of the Victorian Age. Charles Dickens, 1812 1870. When we consider Dickens' life and work in comparison with that of the two great poets we have been studying, the contrast is startling while tennyson and browning were being educated for the life of literature and shielded most tenderly from the hardships of the world dickens a poor obscure and suffering child was helping to support a shiftless family by pasting labels on blacking bottles sleeping under a counter like a homeless cat and once a week timidly approaching the big prison where his father was confined for debt in eighteen thirty six his pickwick was published and life was changed as if a magician had waved his wand over him while the two great poets were slowly struggling for recognition dickens with plenty of money and too much fame was the acknowledged literary hero of england the idol of immense audiences which gathered to applaud him wherever he appeared and there is also this striking contrast between the novelist and the poets that while the whole tendency of the age was toward realism away from the extremes of the romanticists and from the oddities and absurdities of the early novel writers it was precisely by emphasizing oddities and absurdities by making caricatures rather than characters that dickens first achieved his popularity life in dickens early life we see a stern but unrecognized preparation for the work that he was to do never was there a better illustration of the fact that a boy's early hardship and suffering are sometimes only divine messengers disguised and that circumstances which seem only evil are often the source of a man's strength and of the influence which he is to wield in the world he was the second of eight poor children and was born at landport in eighteen twelve 
his father who is supposed to be the original of mr micawber was a clerk in a navy office he could never make both ends meet and after struggling with debts in his native town for many years moved to london when dickens was nine years old the debts still pursued him and after two years of grandiloquent misfortune he was thrown into the poor debtor's prison his wife the original of mrs micawber then set up the famous boarding establishment for young ladies but in dickens words no young ladies ever came the only visitors were creditors and they were quite ferocious in the picture of the micawber family with its tears and smiles and general shiftlessness we have a suggestion of dickens's own family life at eleven years of age the boy was taken out of school and went to work in the cellar of a blacking factory at this time he was in his own words a queer small boy who suffered as he worked and we can appreciate the boy and the suffering more when we find both reflected in the character of david copperfield it is a heart-rending picture this sensitive child working from dawn till dark for a few pennies and associating with tufts and waifs in his brief intervals of labor but we can see in it the sources of that intimate knowledge of the hearts of the poor and outcast which was soon to be reflected in literature and to startle all england by its appeal for sympathy a small legacy ended this wretchedness bringing the father from the prison and sending the boy to wellington house academy a worthless and brutal school evidently whose headmaster was in dickens's words a most ignorant fellow and a tyrant he learned little at this place being interested chiefly in stories and in acting out the heroic parts which appealed to his imagination but again his personal experience was of immense value and resulted in his famous picture of dotheboys hall in nicholas nickleby which helped largely to mitigate the evils of private schools in england wherever he went dickens was a marvelously keen observer with an active imagination which made stories out of incidents and characters that ordinary men would have hardly noticed moreover he was a born actor and was at one time the leading spirit of a band of amateurs who gave entertainments for charity all over england these three things his keen observation his active imagination and the actor's spirit which animated him furnish a key to his life and writings when only fifteen years old he left the school and again went to work this time as a clerk in a lawyer's office by night he studied shorthand in order to fit himself to be a reporter this in imitation of his father who was now engaged by a newspaper to report the speeches in parliament everything that dickens attempted seems to have been done with vigor and intensity and within two years we find him reporting important speeches and writing out his notes as the heavy coach lurched and rolled through the mud of country roads on its dark way to london town it was largely during this period that he gained his extraordinary knowledge of inns and stables and horsey persons which is reflected in his novels he also grew ambitious and began to write on his own account at the age of twenty-one he dropped his first little sketch stealthily with fear and trembling into a dark letter-box in a dark office up a dark court in fleet street the name of this first sketch was mr minns and his cousin and it appeared with other stories in his first book sketches by boz in eighteen thirty five one who reads these sketches now with their intimate knowledge of the hidden life of london can understand dickens's first newspaper success perfectly his best-known work pickwick was published serially in eighteen thirty six to eighteen thirty seven and dickens's fame and fortune were made never before had a novel appeared so full of vitality and merriment though crude in design a mere jumble of exaggerated characters and incidents 
it fairly bubbled over with the kind of humor in which the british public delights and it still remains after three quarters of a century one of our most care dispelling books the remainder of dickens life is largely a record of personal triumphs pickwick was followed rapidly by oliver twist nicholas nickleby old curiosity shop and by many other works which seem to indicate that there was no limit to the new author's invention of odd grotesque uproarious and sentimental characters in the intervals of his novel writing he attempted several times to edit a weekly paper but his power lay in other directions and with the exception of household words his journalistic ventures were not a marked success again the actor came to the surface and after managing a company of amateur actors successfully dickens began to give dramatic readings from his own works as he was already the most popular writer in the english language these readings were very successful crowds thronged to hear him and his journeys became a continuous ovation money poured into his pockets from his novels and from his readings and he bought for himself a home gadshill place which he had always desired and which is forever associated with his memory though he spent the greater part of his time and strength in travel at this period nothing is more characteristic of the man than the intense energy with which he turned from his lecturing to his novels and then for relaxation gave himself up to what he called the magic lantern of the london streets in eighteen forty two while still a young man dickens was invited to visit the united states and canada where his works were even better known than in england and where he was received as the guest of the nation and treated with every mark of honor and appreciation at this time america was to most europeans a kind of huge fairyland where money sprang out of the earth and life was happy as a long holiday dickens evidently shared this rosy view and his romantic expectations were naturally disappointed the crude unfinished look of the big country seems to have roused a strong prejudice in his mind which was not overcome at the time of his second visit twenty-five years later and which brought forth the harsh criticism of his american notes eighteen forty two and of martin chuzzlewit eighteen forty three to eighteen forty four these two unkind books struck a false note and dickens began to lose something of his great popularity in addition he had spent money beyond his income his domestic life which had been at first very happy became more and more irritating until he separated from his wife in eighteen fifty eight to get inspiration which seemed for a time to have failed he journeyed to italy but was disappointed then he turned back to the london streets and in five years from eighteen forty eight to eighteen fifty three appeared dombey and son david copperfield and bleak house three remarkable novels which indicate that he had rediscovered his own power and genius later he resumed the public readings with their public triumph and applause which soon came to be a necessity to one who craved popularity as a hungry man craves bread these excitements exhausted dickens physically and spiritually and death was the inevitable result he died in eighteen seventy over his unfinished edwin drood and was buried in westminster abbey dickens work in view of his life a glance through even this unsatisfactory biography gives us certain illuminating suggestions in regard to all of dickens work first as a child poor and lonely longing for love and for society he laid the foundation for those heart-rending pictures of children which have moved so many readers to unaccustomed tears second as clerk in a lawyer's office and in the courts he gained his knowledge of an entirely different side of human life here he learned to understand both the enemies and the victims of society between whom the harsh laws of that day frequently made no distinction third as a reporter and afterwards as manager of various newspapers 
he learned the trick of racy writing and of knowing to a nicety what would suit the popular taste fourth as an actor always an actor in spirit he seized upon every dramatic possibility every tense situation every peculiarity of voice and gesture in the people whom he met and reproduced these things in his novels exaggerating them in the way that most pleased his audience when we turn from his outward training to his inner disposition we find two strongly marked elements the first is his excessive imagination which made good stories out of incidents that ordinarily pass unnoticed and which described the commonest things a street a shop a fog a lamp-post a stage-coach with a wealth of detail and of romantic suggestion that makes many of his descriptions like lyric poems the second element is his extreme sensibility which finds relief only in laughter and tears like shadow and sunshine these follow one another closely throughout all his books dickens and his public remembering these two things his training and disposition we can easily foresee the kind of novel he must produce he will be sentimental especially over children and outcasts he will excuse the individual in view of the faults of society he will be dramatic or melodramatic and his sensibility will keep him always close to the public studying its tastes and playing with its smiles and tears if pleasing the public be in itself an art then dickens is one of our greatest artists and it is well to remember that in pleasing his public there was nothing of the hypocrite or demagogue in his make-up he was essentially a part of the great drifting panoramic crowd that he loved his sympathetic soul made all their joys and griefs his own he fought against injustice he championed the weak against the strong he gave courage to the faint and hope to the weary in heart and in the love which the public gave him in return he found his best reward here is the secret of dickens unprecedented popular success and we may note here a very significant parallel with shakespeare the great difference in the genius and work of the two men does not change the fact that each won success largely because he studied and pleased his public general plan of dickens novels an interesting suggestion comes to us from a study of the conditions which led to dickens first three novels pickwick was written at the suggestion of an editor for serial publication each chapter was to be accompanied by a cartoon by seymour a comic artist of the day and the object was to amuse the public and incidentally to sell the paper the result was a series of characters and scenes and incidents which for vigor and boundless fun have never been equaled in our language thereafter no matter what he wrote dickens was labeled a humorist like a certain american writer of our own generation everything he said whether for a feast or a funeral was supposed to contain a laugh in a word he was the victim of his own book dickens was keen enough to understand his danger and his next novel oliver twist had the serious purpose of mitigating the evils under which the poor were suffering its hero was a poor child an unfortunate victim of society and in order to draw attention to the real need dickens exaggerated the woeful condition of the poor and filled his pages with sentiment which easily slipped over into sentimentality this also was a popular success and in his third novel nicholas nickleby and indeed in most of his remaining works dickens combined the principles of his first two books giving us mirth on the one hand injustice and suffering on the other mingling humor and pathos tears and laughter as we find them in life itself and in order to increase the lights and shadows in his scenes and to give greater dramatic effect to his narrative he introduced odious and loathsome characters and made vice more hateful by contrasting it with innocence and virtue his characters we find therefore in most of dickens novels three or four widely different types of character 
first the innocent little child like oliver joe paul tiny tim and little nell appealing powerfully to the child love in every human heart second the horrible or grotesque foil like skears fagin quilp uriah heep and bill sykes third the grandiloquent or broadly humorous fellow the fun maker like micawber and sam weller and fourth a tenderly or powerfully drawn figure like lady dedlock of bleak house and sidney carton of a tale of two cities which rise to the dignity of true characters we note also that most of dickens's novels belong decidedly to the class of purpose or problem novels thus bleak house attacks the law's delays little dorrit the injustice which persecutes poor debtors nicholas nickleby the abuses of charity schools and brutal schoolmasters and oliver twist the unnecessary degradation and suffering of the poor in english workhouses dickens's serious purpose was to make the novel the instrument of morality and justice and whatever we may think of the exaggeration of his characters it is certain that his stories did more to correct the general selfishness and injustice of society toward the poor than all the works of other literary men of his age combined the limitations of dickens any severe criticism of dickens as a novelist must seem at first glance unkind and unnecessary in almost every house he is a welcome guest a personal friend who has beguiled many an hour with his stories and who has furnished us much good laughter and a few good tears moreover he has always a cheery message he emphasizes the fact that this is an excellent world that some errors have crept into it due largely to thoughtlessness but that they can be easily remedied by a little human sympathy that is a most welcome creed to an age overburdened with social problems and to criticize our cheery companion seems as discourteous as to speak unkindly of a guest who has just left our home but we must consider dickens not merely as a friend but as a novelist and apply to his work the same standards of art which we apply to other writers and when we do this we are sometimes a little disappointed we must confess that his novels while they contain many realistic details seldom give the impression of reality his characters though we laugh or weep or shudder at them are sometimes only caricatures each one an exaggeration of some peculiarity which suggests ben jonson's every man in his humor it is dickens art to give his heroes sufficient reality to make them suggest certain types of men and women whom we know but in reading him we find ourselves often in the mental state of a man who is watching through a microscope the swarming life of a water drop here are lively bustling extraordinary creatures some beautiful some grotesque but all far apart from the life that we know in daily experience it is certainly not the reality of these characters but rather the genius of the author in managing them which interests us and holds our attention notwithstanding this criticism which we would gladly have omitted dickens is excellent reading and his novels will continue to be popular just so long as men enjoy a wholesome and absorbing story what to read aside from the reforms in schools and prisons and workhouses which dickens accomplished he has laid us all rich and poor alike under a debt of gratitude after the year eighteen forty three the one literary work which he never neglected was to furnish a christmas story for his readers and it is due in some measure to the help of these stories brimming over with good cheer that christmas has become in all english-speaking countries a season of gladness of gift-giving at home and of remembering those less fortunate than ourselves who are still members of a common brotherhood 
if we read nothing else of dickens once a year at christmas time we should remember him and renew our youth by reading one of his holiday stories the cricket on the hearth the chimes and above all the unrivalled christmas carol the latter especially will be read and loved for as long as men are moved by the spirit of christmas tale of two cities of the novels david copperfield is regarded by many as dickens masterpiece it is well to begin with this novel not simply for unusual interest of the story but also for the glimpse it gives us of the author's own boyhood and family for pure fun and hilarity pickwick will always be a favorite but for artistic finish and for the portrayal of one great character sidney carton nothing else that dickens wrote is comparable to a tale of two cities here is an absorbing story with a carefully constructed plot and the action moves swiftly to its thrilling inevitable conclusion usually dickens introduces several pathetic or grotesque or laughable characters besides the main actors and records various unnecessary dramatic episodes for their own sake but in a tale of two cities everything has its place in the development of the main story there are as usual many characters sidney carton the outcast who lays down his life for the happiness of one whom he loves charles darnay an exiled young french noble dr manette who has been recalled to life from a frightful imprisonment and his gentle daughter lucy the heroine jarvis lorry a lovable old-fashioned clerk in the big banking-house the terrible madame de farge knitting calmly at the door of her wine-shop and recording with the ferocity of a tiger licking its chops the names of all those who are marked for vengeance and a dozen others each well drawn who play minor parts in the tragedy the scene is laid in london and paris at the time of the french revolution and though careless of historical details dickens reproduces the spirit of the reign of terror so well that a tale of two cities is an excellent supplement to the history of the period it is written in dickens usual picturesque style and reveals his usual imaginative outlook on life and his fondness for fine sentiments and dramatic episodes indeed all his qualities are here shown not brilliantly or garishly as in other novels but subdued and softened like a shaded light for artistic effect those who are interested in dickens growth and methods can hardly do better than to read in succession his first three novels pickwick oliver twist and nicholas nickleby which as we have indicated show clearly how he passed from fun to serious purpose and which furnish in combination the general plan of all his later works for the rest we can only indicate those which in our personal judgment seem best worth reading bleak house dombey and son our mutual friend and old curiosity shop but we are not yet far enough away from the first popular success of these works to determine their permanent value and influence End of section fifty five